Hello and welcome to this first video about Alteryx Designer. So what is Alteryx? Alteryx is an ETL tool. ETL means Extraction, Transformation and Load, which simply means data pre-processing, data cleaning. And it offers a lot of powerful data transformation options, which we simply can leverage by dragging and dropping. Okay, It's really, really easy and you'll see this in the next couple of videos. But in this video, we're going to dive into the interface. So when you first open Alteryx, that is probably what you see, okay? And Alteryx is actually designed that it has different kinds of panes, which is at first on this right, uh, left side here is the workflow configuration, as you can see here, this is this pane. And this pane actually changes whenever we use a different kind of tile in Alteryx. The tiles are actually those little icons you can see that up there, and these are the ones you will drag on here on the canvas. The canvas here, which is this window here, is actually where we built our workflow. Okay, This is where the data transformation, the workflow creation happens. And uh, as soon as we have finished our workflow, we can simply use our run button, as you can see here, or also click Control R to run our workflow. We also have a results window, which is this down here, which shows us then a preview of the data after we have basically executed our workflow. Okay, And uh, up here, as you can see here, these are different kinds of ribbons we have. Like here, the in and out ribbon, when it comes to importing and outputting data of Alteryx, data preparation, joining, and so on. So these different kinds of ribbons offer different kind of tiles, as you can see here. And each of this tile offers us a way to transform, shape, or clean our data. So you can configure this window here simply by clicking on this plus icon here. So this plus icon allows you to configure the tool palette, as you can see here. So for instance, if I say I don't want to see this join, which I currently have here open, this ribbon anymore, I can simply deselect it here, and then I can simply click OK. And as soon as I do this, as you can see here, the join ribbon here is gone. So if I want to get it back, simply click on the plus symbol here, and simply tick this join again, and then click OK, and you'll see it's back, right? So this is a way how you can configure all these different kinds of um, ribbons here, because probably you don't need all of them, so you can really uh, adjust exactly what you want to show here, okay? What else can you do? Well, you can see here we have a favorites window with or ribbon. This favorites here simply means um, if you find specific tiles, so like here, for instance, under data preparation, and I say, for instance, here, the tile, this little here, this tile is really important for me, I can simply right click on it and I say add to favorites. And as soon as I do this, I click on it, you can see now it has this yellow star. And if I go back to my favorites now here, you'll see that the tile itself is also available here in the favorite section now. Okay, if I want to deselect it, then I can simply uh, right click here and say remove from favorites, right like that. Okay, so that would also be an option. And now if I simply tick on in out, Click on favorite again, you'll see that the tile is gone. Okay, so this simply allows you to simply put the tiles you really often use simply to the favorites so you find them immediately. What you also could do, of course, is you could also go to the search up here and simply search for a tile. So if you don't find it under all these different kinds of ribbons, simply search for it. So for instance, I could say I want to use the select tool. So select, select here, and you'll notice that I use this interchangeably. I say either tile or tool. It's for me the same, okay? So if I want to search for the select tile or tool, I can simply search select, and uh, here it is, and I can simply drag and drop it and place it here, right? Like that. And that's all I need to do. And so you can also see, as soon as I do this, this window here changes. So the configuration window is always dependable on what kind of tile or tool we use. So that if I click on the canvas again, you'll see that now I get the workflow configuration again. Okay, I can adjust this. And you see this little red exclamation mark because it's not um, configured now, it has no income connection. So let me remove that for now. So what I want to do is, for instance, I'd like to show you if I want to input data, I can simply drag and drop it and place this tool like here. And that's exactly how this workflow will work. You simply choose the specific tile you see up there, and you simply drag it and drop it on the canvas. Like, right? For instance, here I got an input tool now, and you see now I can configure that. I can connect to a file or database. Um, I will, won't do this, we will do this in the next video, but it simply means that this window here always changes depending on the specific tile or tool you use. So for instance, then I can use my select, I drag it on the canvas, and you'll see as soon as I drag it here, I got these little dotted lines. That simply means I can connect those two um, tiles. So this workflow has now an input tool where I need to specify the data, and this data then gets pushed into the select tool, and then I can do a selection. For instance, I can choose which kind of columns do I want to keep, and which kind of columns do I want to get rid of, like that, for instance, right? So what you also could do, if I click on this connection here, and I simply click the, um, remove it um, here, so click, click delete button, and I place it somewhere on the screen like that, I can also, of course, use my mouse and simply drag and drop 
those tools like that, drop them to get, drag and drop them together, and create the connection like that. Okay, that's also possible. So that's totally up to you how you want to do it. Of course, if you drag it really, really close to a specific tool, which is already on the canvas, you see that these dotted lines appear automatically. Okay, just wanted to mention that. Okay, so what else do we have? Well, here, for instance, if I click on the canvas again, on the canvas itself, on the workflow configuration, we have the layout direction, which is currently horizontally. It simply means you can adjust, do you want to have your workflow horizontally, like that, from left to right, or do you want to have it vertically? So if I take this, for instance, and see, I want to put this vertically, click on this, you'll see that now the workflow is from top to bottom. And now you can create your workflow from top to bottom, right? It's also possible if you prefer, prefer this, this view. So let me actually go back, because we will use the horizontal one. I think this view is better for me, but as I said before, it's totally up to you. Then we also have annotations. Annotations are currently shown, that simply means each of those tools or tiles, you can take them and then you can say, can you go here under this little icon, annotation, and you can put annotations here. For instance, if you want to describe what you basically do in the tile, you'll see, for instance, you could put this, this is an annotation, annotation like that. And if I simply now click on the canvas back, you see that now I have this annotation here, okay? And the annotations canvas here, the workflow simply means, do I want to show this if I do this annotations, or do I want to hide it? So if I tick this and say, I want to hide them, you'll see that now they are gone, okay? That's also possible. And there's also show with tool names. If you take this one, and you see also the tool name, because this is, for instance, input, input data, this is a select tool, it's also possible, okay? So that's totally up to you. What do you want to show here for your visualizations or for these tiles or tools? And then the connection progress here show that simply means um, when you run the workflow. So if I click on the run button or press Control R to run my workflow, I can specify do I want to show a percentage number? Because um, this connection progress simply means during the run of the workflow, because your workflow can take only a few seconds, but it could also take longer depending on what kind of data you preprocess and how long your workflow and complex your workflow is. Then I can specify do I want to show a percentage number, which tells me exactly okay the workflow is for instance 60% complete, anything like that. Then also you have under workflow here, if you take this one, of course you can see what kind of version you currently use. Here we use 2020 1.5 and so on, and a few additional things about your engine itself. Um, also what kind of workflow it is here. Currently it's a workflow, but you can also create an analytical app as well as a macro, which is a more complex way to create things um, automatically in, uh, in Alteryx, but for now we, stand with, we go with a standard workflow okay, to create our workflows. Um, the runtime itself gives you a few additional informations which you can configure. However, most of the time you don't need this. Um, in case we do, then I'll tell you this back later on. Okay? Um, events itself also tells you about enabled events. Um, also not that possible or not that important here. And the meta info and so on. It also gives you a few additional information here, but which you can configure here, the workflow name for instance and so on. But also this is nothing we have to do now. Okay? So that's it actually for the introduction. So we know that we have our tiles or tools up there. We have different kinds of ribbons here where we can find exactly what kind of tool we or tile we use, we want to search for. In case we don't find it immediately, we can also use here the search um, bar. And uh, for the configuration of the tiles, we have here this uh, left window here, which it tells you tells us exactly if we tick one of the tiles, okay, now we can specify what you want to do here within this tile. Okay, what should this tile do in our workflow? And after we run the workflow, so click the run button or press Control R, we will see our output down there in the results window. Okay, so that's it for this first video. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome to this first video where we talk about how we get our data into Alteryx. There are various options and let's talk about them. So at first, of course, you need to open Alteryx and then you simply click on the first tab here, which is the in and out tab. And if you select this, then you can see different options here, which are available to us. So the first thing I'd like to show you is the text input. So what it does is if I drag it on the canvas or on the screen, like that, you'll see that now the configuration window has changed and now we can enter data here. So this is really for manually entering data in Alteryx. So I can simply say this, for instance, are series, series like that. And then I can simply, for my first series, I say this is, for instance, breaking bad. Here is a series. And then I do another one, which is, for instance, this is a game of thrones, of thrones like that, for instance. And if I like to add an additional, let's say additional column here, I click inside and say this is the amount, for instance, and then I can simply say, okay, 10 for Breaking Bad, and uh, then 20 for Game of Thrones, and so on. So simply some dummy data here, but you get the point, right? So you're simply entering the data, of course, you can click on a new column and add additional 
information if you want to do it. And all you need to do to get the data into all the rigs, you simply click the run button or you press the shortcut, of course, that works the same. And if I do that, you can see that here I got a little preview of my data. And you can see I got null entries in here as well. So why is that? So let's take a look back at our table. You can see that currently here, we get a line number three, right? So three currently is empty. And that is the reason why we currently have also those null entries here. So what you can do is, if something like that happens, you simply go in here, click on delete, and then you can specify what exactly you want to delete. Rows, columns, or header, in this case what I want to delete are the rows, so row number three. So I can simply click on delete rows, click on it, and you see now it's gone. And as long as your latest, or let's say the, the last entry is the star, then you're good to go and you're fine. And if you run it again, watch what happens with our, here, the data set. So I click on the run button, like that, and you see that now the empty line here, the third, third row is gone, and we only got the data which we manually entered here, okay? So that's how you can use this text input tool. Beside this, you can also use the text input tool with a copy paste option. So let me show you, let me actually drag this inside like that, okay? And again, I got the same configuration as before, but this time, instead of manually entering data here, I have, for instance, an Excel file. So I click on my product info here, and you can see I already specified the range here. So I can simply specify a range. I do this here, and then I simply control C to copy this range, and then I go back in here like that, and I select this, and then what I can do is I can simply then click inside and then I simply paste this inside, right? Like that, right? So copy paste. And of course you can make this field a little bigger so you can see the whole name here and here as well, but you get the point. It's pretty easy. Simply copy paste and paste it inside. And you also get the data manually here inside of Alteryx. Of course, one thing you need to mention here is that this data, of course, is static. So if the underlying Excel file now changes, then of course this data will not change in your workflow because you simply manually entered the data using this text input tool, okay? On the other hand, what you can also do is if you want to have the data from the underlying file, like a CSV file, an Excel file or whatever, then you would not use the text input tool, but instead you would go with the input data tool. So you can simply drag this inside like that, drag it inside. And again, you get a different kind of configuration window, which appearing here, and it first asks you, okay, connect to a file or a database. So let's do that. So I click on this little down arrow here, and you see that this window should appear here. And this window at first shows you your recent connections. As you can see here, currently I don't have connections. And in case you have some of them, you want to get rid of them, you can simply click on clear list here. And then of course those connections will also be gone, and you would see the same screen as I do here. So, but of course, if you have connections used in the past, then they would appear here. And that's pretty handy because if you want to use them again, you can simply select them here directly instead of going through the process and add them manually back again, right? So that's easier and then faster, of course. Um, of course, this only works if, as long as your data sources and files are still in the same folder, right? So if they, the folder has changed or the name of the file has changed, then of course you would probably get errors here, okay? Keep that in mind. Under saved, if I click on save here, you see that save connections in case you have them. Um, here you can see three of them for me, depending on what kind of save connections you have used and have saved in the past, you would see them appearing here. Also a quick shortcut to get this data uh, really fast back into Alteryx. Now, if you want to go with files, you can simply se select the file um, option here, and then you can see all supported files here. It's really a great overview here. You can see exactly what kind of files are supported, and you find the, the most used files, like CSV files are there, of course, included. Here are the Excel files, here are the CSV files, by the way, and so on. Zip files as well, SQLite, and so on. So you can see all the file extensions here, which um, in this case, Alteryx would treat as a file. So also Microsoft Access Database, for instance, this will also be treated as a file here with these extensions, right? Keep that in mind, you can see that here. And in order to connect to the data, all you need to do is you simply drag and drop the file then inside here. We we'll do this in a minute, but let's actually cover those other two options here as well. So in case you want to connect to a data source, so not so in a database, sorry, a database, not a file, not a file like an Excel file or anything you find here, then of course you would simply go to the data sources option here. Data sources, and then you can see frequently used data sources, of course, often used as Oracle databases or Microsoft SQL Server. Those, of course, you can find up there here directly. And you can simply click on Quick Connect to connect them or ODBC or OLEDBC view, a DB, if you need them. And other data sources you find there. So these are all the ones supported. Um, if you want to use any of them, you'll find that down there.
So if you click on Quick Connect here, for instance, if I'd uh, just like to show it to you, I click on Quick Connect, you see that this window appears now, and here you simply specify the connection name of the server as well as the host of the server, and then you can specify what kind of authentication it is. So if it's in your company, you probably are able to use window authentication, otherwise you would need a SQL Server authentication, so username and password to the database. And as soon as you've done this, you would click on the test here, simply check whether the connection is established. And if this connection is successful, then you can simply click on here and choose the default database if you want to use it, depending, of course, also um, to the access rights you have on the data source. But that's basically how it works. Pretty easy and simple concept. So let me actually close this one more time. Click on it again, go on here, and the window opens up again. And finally, of course, here the gallery. Well, the gallery itself, this is if you have an Alteryx gallery in your company. So a gallery simply means that, for instance, there are other people in your company who are creating workflows and um, data and want to share it with you. And you basically have then this gallery. And Alteryx is basically a product which Alteryx offers. And if you have the gallery inside the company, then you could connect to this data sources and what, what your friends and colleagues have created there. In this case, we don't have it, but you can see it. you could add a gallery in case you have one. So that's basically it. And let's go back to the files option here. So in our case, we can simply connect to a file here. And all you need to do is simply drag and drop the file inside, right? So select the file. So I can simply go in here and say, um, let's go to a folder here. Check this folder here. And here I have CSV files. Let me double click on this. And now let me simply select one of the files here. Let's go with the transactions April 2019 and drag and drop it inside like that. And you can see that now the file is selected. I got my preview here of the data. And of course, then I can simply click the run button or press the shortcut here to run the data and get it into Alteryx. And you can see down there, there's a little output window which shows me, shows me exactly what the data looks like, which is actually the same as here, right? So uh, that's that. And that's how easy it is to get the data into Alteryx. And by the way, if I select this one more time, and if I click on this button again, you see that now under recent data sources, now this data source, which is the CSV file, appears now because we have used it. And now it's saved here until I click on clear list to get rid of it, right? And I, but now I can select it anytime. So also, if I, let me show you this as well. So if I go under my input data and drag it one more time inside, and now if I click on this again, and now you can see here, I could use it here again. Simply click on it and I get exactly the same data here loaded. So much faster than simply at first go back to the specific folder path where you have saved it. Okay, let me actually remove this here. So what else? Uh, let me actually click on this one more time. Um, beside the files, you can see you can use drag and drop. Of course, you can also click on select file. So if you can click select file, then of course the window appears here and then you can navigate to the specific file. But of course, that's not as fast as uh, simply drag and drop it inside. And if you want to be even quicker, then simply click on here and click on here and basically click on here and then choose it. What you can also do is, by the way, let me actually go to the folder here and lose, use one of the transactions, for instance, transactions April 2019 again, simply drag and drop it inside like that. Okay, exactly the same way like here, but now you don't specify anything. You simply drag and drop the file inside. Of course, this only works for files that would not work for databases, right? But for files, that's actually the fastest way to get data into Alteryx. Okay, so that's it actually for getting the data into Alteryx using those file options. So basically the text input, we have covered this, as well as the input data here. And what else do we have? Well, also interesting could be, if you want to use it, the date time now, which is also an option, but it's pretty easy and self-explanatory, I think. All you need to do is you simply drag it inside, and then you specify the date format, uh, what you want to have. We want to have it with time as well. In this case, I leave it the default one, but of course, if you choose another one, you could choose this as well. And then what you do is you simply, if I run this also, click on the run button here, or press the shortcut, and you see that as an output here, you get a specific uh, day, the weekday, as well as the, the month, as well as the year, right? So as an output. And you can use this then later in your workflow if you need it. That's pretty easy to get the specific date, date now, right? Date time now. And you can see here, depending on the date, fi date format you specify, of course, you can also get the time if you need it. So, and finally, what I like to cover here is the directory, which could also be useful. So if you drag the directory inside, you get information about the files inside the directory. Okay, so if I click on this, you can see that here's directory, which I need to specify. So I can simply click on this folder here and navigate where I want to go. Or in my case, I do it much easier. I simply go in here and I can simply copy this path, control C to copy it. I go inside here and simply control V to paste it and uh, works exactly the same way. And then you can see here is a file specification. And this specification is kind of wildcard search if you want to call it this way, because it allows us to specify, okay, what kind of data do we want to load, right? And also, 
So also the file extensions, which is the thing, the star behind the dot. So for instance, if you only search for Excel files, you would simply go in here and say XLSX files, for instance, if you only search for XLSX files, right? So you can adjust here the file format here as well. In my case, I leave the star. And then you can also tick this if you want to go through all the subdirectories in this folder. In our case, that's not, that's not relevant because we do not have any subfolders in here. But if you want to include subfolders and also search CSV files in the subfolders, or all kinds of files in the subfolders, you can simply tick this. Okay, now for now, if we leave the configuration as a default one and run it, let's actually click on the Run button here and take a look and you can see that is the output we get. So basically we get all the files, including this Pokemon file and all our transactions for the years, as well as then the creation time, the last access time and so on. So additional information here as well as directory and so on. So all these um, information are now available and we can use this. But uh, interesting for us is also if you do not want to load all the files, for instance here, I use the Pokemon file and also drag this in the transaction file as well. But in our case, let's say I don't want to actually load this Pokemon file, I only want to load the transaction files. Then this is where this comes into place. And in our case, all these files are CSV files, so text files basically, but all the transaction files end with 19, okay? And the Pokemon file does not end with 19 for the dot. So we can simply use as a wildcard search here, simply search all the files which end with 19, then there's a dot and then the file extension, okay? So that could be an option. And if you do it this way, watch what happens because then if you run this again, click on the run button or the press the shortcut, you'll see that now the Pokemon will be gone because the Pokemon itself is not ending with 19, it's ending with an N, okay? So let's actually try that. You click on the run button here and you see, let's actually take a look at the, uh, let's say 19, oh, I missed the star, sorry for that. Of course it's star because it's anything before ending then with 19, then the dot and then any file extension. Let's run it again and take a look and you see that now we only have all the transactions, okay? So the Pokemon file itself is gone because we search for anything, then a 19, then a dot, and then any kind of file extension. And this is only true for all the transactions, but it's not true for the Pokemon file, okay? So that is that, basically. These are the main things which you need when you want to import data. So it is, again, the text input file, which allows us to use manual text input, or we simply copy-paste data, which we have in an Excel file, or a, she a CSV file, anything like that. Or we can use the input data tool, which allows us to connect to any kind of text files, but also any kind of databases if we need them, right? And of course, we can also use the date time now, if you need the date time, the current date time, or the directory, if you need several folder, several here information about specific files in the directory, okay? So that's that for this video. So hopefully that was clear. In case you got any questions, of course, feel free to ask them. Otherwise, I hopefully see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to part two of getting data into Alteryx. And this time we're gonna dive into how we can basically connect to a SQL Server database and get the data from this database inside Alteryx, okay? So, so far we only briefly talked about that in theory, but let me actually show you how easy it is to do this in real life, so in practice, okay? So the first thing here, let me actually show you, is my instance here. So here I get my Microsoft SQL Server Studio. So I got a local instance here of that. And here it's called SQL Server Express. This is the host name of my database. Of course, in this, in your case, it would be different um, depending on, um, you would probably ask your IT department to get the specific host name and so on. But here in my case, it's SQL Server Express. And in inside here, in the SQL Server Management Studio, I have one database, which in this case is called Bike Stores, okay? And this is the database I want to connect to. All right, let's dive into that. So let me minimize that and let's actually go with Alteryx. So the first thing we need, we already know that, is we need the input data tool, right? So we can simply drag this inside like that and place it somewhere on the screen. And then we simply click on this little arrow here and then we specify, okay, under data sources this time, what kind of data source do we want to connect to? In this case, we want to connect to a Microsoft SQL Server database. So in this case uh, here, Microsoft SQL Server is already there. Otherwise, of course, if you need anything else, simply go down and choose the specific connection you need, okay? So let's actually go with the Quick Connect option here. Click on Quick Connect. And then you can see here, I got connection name here, a type, a host, and then authentication type, and so on. So let's actually first specific connection name here. So let me actually click on New here. Okay, the new one. And in my case, I already got a host name selected here. That's probably not the case for you. So in this case, it's also the wrong one. As you can see here, it's Daniel as SQL Server. In my case, it's, remember that, if I go back in here, it's called SQL Server Express, okay? So I need to paste this specific host name inside. So I can simply Control-C to copy it, Control-V to paste it, and I got my new host name inside here, okay? 
The next thing is that I need to specify what kind of authentication type I want. In my case, I'm going to go with Windows Authentication because that works here. And probably if you're using um, Alteryx in, a, in your company, then probably you would also be able to go with that. If you need a specific SQL Server Authentication with a specific username and password for a database, then of course simply tick this and enter those credentials here. But of, this would again go with your T department. Ask them what exactly do you need here. But most of the time you would probably go with Windows Authentication if you have access to the database. Then what you do, let me actually remove the database here because this white world importers is not available in this database. And then I can simply click on test. Okay, so let me click on test and you'll see that the connection was successful. So Alteryx connected with database and now you can simply specify here default database. If you tick this, what kind of database do you want? In our case, we had the spike stores. So you can simply click on bike stores here. Okay, that's fine. And now you can simply click, okay. And as soon as you do this, now you got this window here and here, this is for the SQL server, so the SQL experts here, because here you have the option to either write your own SQL editor, so in the SQL editor, your own SQL code to get data from the specific, in this case, database, or you can use stored procedures if you want to do this. You have a visual query builder that makes it easier, of course, if you're going to dive into the bikes, you can tick bikes here, and then you see, for instance, here production and sales, so you see different kind of tables inside this database, or you go with the tables option here. So a tables option here, for instance, I could specify a specific table I want to have. For instance, here in my sales, I simply choose a random one. So I simply go with, let's say, bike stores, production products. I can tick this here, and then I simply click OK. In this case, if I only want to import one specific table, I click OK here. All right, here we go. And then I can simply run this here. So I click on the Run button here, and let's wait. And now you can see this is the output here. And this is the data from the table pr products here. And this data is now loaded into Alteryx, and we can use this data in our workflow. Okay. So pretty easy to do, really nothing complicated. Just specify what exactly um, is your host name. That's important. And of course, you need to have the right access credentials, of course. So the authentication type also needs to match. And then you specify exactly what kind of database you want to connect to. And after that, um, specify the tables or write your own SQL query to get the data inside Autorix. And then you have the data inside and then you're good to go. Okay, so that's it for this video. Hopefully that was helpful. And as always, thanks so much for watching and I hopefully see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to part three of the in and output options we have. So um, what have we not covered so far? Well, two important things which we want to talk about here is at first the browse tool and the second one is the output data tool. Okay, let's actually first start with the browse tool. Now, let me actually go back to my first workflow. So these are basically all the inputs we have covered in the first video. And let me show you a little trick. So in case you need some of the data, the so inputs in another workflow, all you need to do is you simply click on this one here and control C to copy it, and then you go to the next workflow in here and control V to paste it. And by the way, in order how you can create a new workflow, you simply click on the plus button here, right? And you got a new workflow, pretty easy. Okay, so control V to control, control V to uh, copy, control C to control, copy, control V to paste it, basically gets you the data inside like that, okay? Also a neat little trick. Okay, so let's say we have now basically here cleaned our data and it's now in the right format, and now we want to basically take a look at it, what you can do is you can simply, if you run it, right, we have done this before, you can click on the select it here and you can click on the run button. And if you do that, of course, here down there in the output, you already got an output here, an exact of, of the data set. And you can see there are basically here 35,755 records. You can also see that currently you can see that are 9,343 records in this case. So it's only a partial result. It's not the full result. And also here in the preview settings, which you can see here, it only shows the first 100 records. Okay, that's what you get here. So even the data, of course, is complete inside Alteryx from the view perspective here and here you don't see the full data. And if you want to see and take a look at the full data, then you can use this browse tool. So you can simply go in here and you can connect it. Simply you can see the dots in case it's uh, the distance is too big. Of course, you can also use a mouse button and simply connect those two together. It's also possible. OK, so we got the connection here between those two. And now if you run this again, let me click the run button here. And now if you select here the browse tool, what you see is now 35,755 records are displayed. So not like if I select this output here again, you can see you got only a sample here, so almost 10,000 entries. But if you select the browse tool, you see the full data set. So you can see all the 35,755 records. And also here on the left side, you can see a little 
preview of additional informations of this data set. So how often is a specific region appearing? For instance, you can see here, I got a few statistics if you to, to analyze your, your data set more. So even there are other uh, tiles and tools in all directions, of course, there as well. But here, um, it also gives you a little preview of the data set. So also the product names, which is appearing pretty often, you can see Red Bull here, and that's a coincidence, it's not um, uh, deliberately done here, but this is the product which appears most often in this data set of energy drinks, okay? But it gives you additional information. That is what this browse tool is really useful and helpful to, okay? If you want to analyze it like that. Okay, so that is the browse tool. And then also the output data tool. And the output data tool is exactly what you might think it is, because let's face it, after you have prepared your data, after you've have, you have cleaned your data, you've joined the data, now you have a prepared final data set and you want to use this data set to visualize something, then in case you do not want to do the visualization in Alteryx, even though there are tools for that, so you can do reporting in Alteryx. You can see you got a reporting tab in here. But uh, from my personal experience, most of the time people would go with either Tableau or Power BI. So kind of these kind of uh, visualization tools, which are really, really great. And uh, basically they only do the data preparation in Alteryx, okay? So let's think about that. And we only prepare the data and let's say, this is an example, this is our prepared data. And now we want to save this data. So what we could do is we can simply then go with the output data tool and you can simply drag it inside like that. Of course, you can also connect it directly in this case to this one here. And then what you do is you can simply take a look at the configuration window here and you can see you want to write to a file or a database. In this case, yes, we want to write to a file. So we can simply go in here, then this window appears and you can see there, it's exactly from the structure the same way, recent, saved files, data sources and gallery. In our case, we want to save to a file. So on our local file drive uh, or shared drive, if you want to do that as well, it's also possible. Then you can simply specify files here and then you can specify, okay, what kind of data file um, do you want to save it to, right? In our case, you, you want to save it to a JSON file, to uh, here, Microsoft Access, uh, or Tableau Data Hyper, uh, Hyper Extract, as you can see here, also the older format, which is TDE, and so on. So these files here are available. In our case, let's say we want to save it to an um, Excel file, or let's say a CSV file, because it's currently a CSV file, so let's actually go with the, um, with the CSV file. Let me take a look where, here it is, okay. Then you can enter your specific file path and then you simply go in here and they can name it for instance this is let's say our final output final output and you can see the data type here is csv file okay that's fine and i click on save here and uh, of course now the file is not saved yet because we have not run the workflow please keep this in mind you can create it here you can specify where you want to save it but as long as you do not click the run button or press the shortcut the, the data is not saved right so if i go back in my folder here let's go back outside here um, that's basically Alteryx new here, and I can see there is no final output, but now if I click this run button here and wait, and now we are done, and if I go back to my folder here, let's take a look, and now I have my final output here created, right? So that's exactly the data which we have now saved into a CSV file here, okay? So please keep in mind, you need to run the workflow, okay? Because I've forgotten this in the past one time and then I uh, had not saved my data, okay? So that's it for this video. So these were the last two tools we want to cover in this in and out. And in the next couple of videos, we're gonna dive into more into the preparation tools, okay? So that's it, hopefully you enjoyed it. In case you got questions, of course, feel free to ask them. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to this video. Now, in the last couple of videos, we learned all about the in and out tools. So how we can get data into Alteryx and take a look at it, how we can get data out of Alteryx and also about the browse tool itself. So let's actually take a look at the preparation options we have under the preparation tab here, the second one. And the first one I'd like to show you is the select tool, this one here, because the select tool itself is really, really powerful and very often used. So let's actually dive into that and let's see what this can do for us. Okay, at first, of course, I don't have data, so I need some data. So I go to my folder here and I will use my transactions April 2019 again. And of course, you find this in the resource section to follow along. Or of course, you can use any other kind of file if you want to use your own files. That's perfectly fine as well. So I simply drag it inside. We know that this actually is the fastest way to get data into Alteryx in case you get a text file. So let's do that this way. And you can see I got my preview here. Got the first 100 records here and here around, in this case, 10,796 entries here. Okay, so these are the cells I can see here. So what I want to do now is I want to use the select tool. So what can this tool do for us? Let's actually find out. Let's actually drag and drop it here. And you can see if you drop it or drag it near this tool, the, the input tool, then of course it 
creates a connection, so the dotted line itself for us. In case it's not the case, you can also drag and drop it here. Then, of course, you need to create the connection yourself. But let's actually do it this way, okay? So I drag and drop it in here, and you see that now the configuration option has changed. Because here in the configuration option, I can see, okay, I got the various, uh, on an overview about the fields in our data set. So sales with this question mark before, then there's a sales area, product name, country, state, and so on. So this is, if I go back in here, these are exactly the column headers here, right? So we can see the column headers, which are now appearing in here, okay? These are all the columns we have, and also an unknown column here as well. And we can see the data type here, which in currently, currently here is all about strings. So even though, for instance, for let's take a look at the price paid, right? It's currently a string. Because why is that? Well, because we have a CSV file here. And a text file, by default, Alteryx treats all the columns as string fields, right? So in order to then um, convert, for instance, certain kinds of um, fields or columns here to numerical types, we could do this using the select tool, okay? So... Okay, that is one option how we can use it. So if you want to change here, specific data type here, for instance, currently you can see it's vstring here for all of them. If you want to change it, you can simply click on one, for instance, price paid, you can click on here, and then you can choose another data type. Like for instance, you can see here a preview of what exists. There's a Boolean, a byte, an integer, a 16, 32, 64, a float, a double, and so on. So depending what kind of, um, how accurate you need your, your your data or your numbers here. You could choose different kind of data sources, uh, data types, right? So integer, for instance, does not uh, contain decimal numbers and so on, okay? So simply choose the one. And most of the time, you'd, you would probably go with float or double if you have decimal numbers. That would work fine. Okay, so that's one option. How You could do this for each individual field. Um, so each field individually, you can simply check the field and then change the data type, for instance, like that, okay? Nothing has happened because we have not run the workflow. Even though, of course, the sales ID here is an integer, you can do that, but it wouldn't really make sense, so I will stick the back to string. But I'll simply show you how you can do it, okay? So that would be one option to do it this way. Simply select the field and so on. So what else can we do? Well, here we also have an option to rename the field. For instance, you can see here it's question mark. I don't like this question mark. I simply name it sales ID. So I can type in sales ID here, and then this is basically the rename field, okay? So now if we would run this workflow, let's actually check this, click the run button here, take a look at the output, and you can see that the output now here doesn't contain the question mark anymore. So it's gone because we have renamed the field. So whenever you have a data set like that uh, in here, and take a look at this one here, and then you want to rename specific fields, you can simply do it here. What you also can do, by the way, is here to add a description. So that could also be helpful, especially if someone else is then later considering your workflow and he or she does not know what this data is or where the data comes from, then of course you can also add some description here if you want to do that as well. Okay, it's also available in here. So besides this, um, you can simply order or reorder your columns. It's also available. So all you need to do is you simply select the field. For instance, let's say the sales area should be on the first, um, or should be the first column. So you can simply select this one here and go down one, or you select this one and go up. That would also be possible. So you can simply reorder your fields, move up and move down individually if you want to do that. Let's actually check this as well. Let's run that one more time. And now you can see that sales area is now the first column in our data set, okay? So pretty easy to do to reorder your columns. If you want to do that, you can do that here manually. Or if you want to rename your columns, you can also do it here and also change the data type here as well. Um, the select tool, as the name implies, also allows us to select what kind of columns we want to have. So you can see currently all of them are checked. But of course, I can simply uncheck some of them. For instance, I can say, I'd like to uncheck the product name, country, state, and so on. Basically, all you just want to see is basically, let's say, the price, as well as, in this case, the sales area, like those two, right? If you want to do that and run the workflow one more time, now you see you only got basically those two columns, like sales area and price, and all the other columns got filtered out. So it also allows you to filter the data, basically, the select tool, okay? Basically, by selecting specific kind of columns in here. A specific field here is this unknown field. So maybe you're wondering, what is this unknown field actually doing, and why is it here, and why is it checked? Well, best practice here is really, depending on, of course, what the result is you, you're looking for, but um, if you have data which often changes, and for instance, here I have transaction file, and let's say um, in the next iteration, the transaction file gets updated, and then there might be the case, we're not sure, but there might be the case that there are additional columns. So the Excel file itself, so the structure changes, or the CSV file in this case changes. So there are new columns in here, okay? So if you want to also use those columns and get it into Alteryx, you simply leave this unknown checked here. This unknown simply refers to columns which are currently not available, but the next time, basically you load the data, they will be automatically then loaded into your workflow. 
If you want to do that, then you leave this unknown unchecked. So basically, new columns will be automatically detected and will be used in the workflow. If you want to remove this, if you want to say, no matter what, how the data file changes, as long as the, the, um, the original columns remain, I don't care whether additional columns um, come to this data source, I want to only keep the original ones, then you would untick this one. And then would create your workflow, and then only the specific fields you have selected, only those fields would go into the, this data source. Okay? That is how you can use this unknown. So this unknown allows you to specify, do you want to also load in additional new columns in the future, which might appear, or do you only want to keep the columns you have selected here, and not want to load this new columns? That's basically what you can do by check and uncheck this unknown. Okay, so that is that. And of course, finally, if you want to, well, do something in bulk here, because so far all of this is simply manually, of course, you can go in here and, for instance, change the data up here, then go to the next one or move them up and down here. What you can also do is you can go to options here. So let's say I choose, let's actually um, go in here under options and say, for instance, for the select, let's say select all, you can select all, and now you've selected all of them. So it's kind of bulk operations if you want. So go to options here, and then for instance also let's actually maybe click three of them, hold control key and select all three columns here, and then go to options here for instance. Instead of doing it manually like that, you can also go to options here and say you want to move them for instance, and say you want to move them uh, to the top or the bottom, right? Let's say move them to the top like that, and now those fields are on top, okay? That's something you can do here as well. Um, what you also can do is you can go to options here and you can say you want to sort them. So again, instead of manually sort them, you can go to sort here. And then for instance, sort options allows you here to sort on original field name here, ascending, descending, sort on new field name, because remember, we have renamed here the sales ID, so the question mark is not available here anymore. Um, so you want to sort on the new field names, in this case, the sales ID, instead of the question mark sales ID, you can do that here as well. So um, simply go to move and yeah, uh, or sort here again and then or sort and field type so ascending and descending or revert to incoming field order and so on so different kinds of sort options you can play around with here sort original field name let's say descending here and now you can see i sorted this descending and here the question mark is uh, the last one here and it's not appearing on top because sales id here this one has no question mark and let's actually try that just to show you that it really works go to sort option here go to let's say sort on new field and also say descending here and now you can see that here the question mark with the sales is here now the second one not the last one because now the sales id is considered not the question mark sales id okay so that's how you can do uh, bulk operations in here what you can also do is you can add prefix to field names again let's say i like to uh, take this one this one and this one here and then go to options here and say i'd like to add prefix to field names like that and then you can specify the prefix let's say this is my pre simply as a prefix and then you click OK and you can see that now you have renamed all of them pre-quantity, pre-product and pre-price paid. Of course if you want to add a dash in here or an empty space then of course you need to specify this here as well. But this is actually for bulk operations, okay? If you want to do that. Clear all renames, clear highlighted renames and so on. So I'll click on this one again and I've got rid of those, okay? So that's what you can do in here. So basically bulk operations use those options which you have here. Um, here select all, select all, deselect all and so on. If you want to do it manually for each field then of course you can do it inside here as well. So a pretty, pretty powerful tool, the select tool, because it allows gives you very uh, a lot of options like uh, as I said before sorting, renaming, uh, changing the data type which is really really important in Alteryx uh, and so on. So a really powerful tool and now you know how to work with it and I just want to encourage you to play around with it, try it out and uh, as always, thanks a lot for watching, and I hopefully see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello, and welcome back to this video. Now, in the last video, we learned about the select tool and what we can do with it. For instance, renaming certain kind of columns, or adjusting the data type here, or s sorting, so reordering the columns, and so on. So all this is possible. So a pretty useful tool. Now, still, if you have a lot of columns, then it might be a little bit well cumbersome to really manually f and changing the data type of all of, for all of them. So, I mean, what you could do here is you can do still bulk operations, right? We covered that. So I can select the tool and then I can select, for instance, let's say the quantity here and the price. So I would have two of those and then I can go to options here and then can change field of type of highlighted fields. And then I can go in here and say, I would like to have them as, let's say, integers here, for instance. I could do that, right? But still, I might run into er issues here. For instance, price paid for here is not actually an integer. It is a float value. And even though there's another problem in here, but we'll cover this later on, that there's a comma and Alteryx treats decimal numbers with a dot so it's also something we need to adjust first but still let's go back to this select tool um, 
first things first. So the issue here really is that uh, if you have a lot of columns, let's say you have a really big data source and you have 100 columns, then it might be a little bit cumbersome, right? Onerous to do this, even if you have the option or we have the option here to ch change the data type of several fields together automatically using this tool. But what we could do instead is the following. So let me actually go in here. Let's actually change this maybe back. I'll select those two and change it back to string first. Okay, go to options here and go to change field here of the select ones and go back to V string here. So let's keep it this way. So what you can do instead is we could use another field. So in this case, I'd like to show you the auto field. The auto field field is pretty useful and something you might want to use at the beginning of your when you're importing data, especially if you if you're importing data from CSV files or text files, because you can see if you go back to the select tool that by default we covered this, Alteryx is treating all those columns as a string because it's a text file. So what you could do instead is you can simply use the order field here, drag and drop it inside your canvas, and then you connect those two ones. This is the first one here, like that. And in the order field itself, there is not really much to configure here. You all, all you need to do is you select the specific fields here, in this case, all those fields. Of course, you can untick some of them if you want to do that. But in my case, I'd like to actually use all the fields. And the auto field tool here is really taking a look at each, well, uh, column in your data source. And then it's uh, finding out what it thinks is the best kind of data type. And let's actually check that. Let me actually at first also use uh, another sort tool because otherwise we can't see the data type. Let's, let's do it like that. Uh, sorry, not sorting here, but what I meant was the select tool. Here we go. Drag it inside and let's actually run this. Okay. And we're done. And what you can see here, basically nothing to configure here, right? But we select all the columns. And at the beginning, if I take a look at this one here, the original output was that all of those are by default strings. But now if we take a look at what happened after we use the auto field tool here, if I click on this again, you'll see that now the sales ID is considered as an integer 32. Sales area is a string, product name is a string, a V string here, and, and Quantity again is an integer, that's totally fine. Order date is a date and price speed as a string. Why is that? That's the reason I already told you that. The issue here is that the price paid column currently, currently considers uh, has a comma as a um, decimal separator, which is not treated correctly by Alteryx. At first, we need to change the comma to a dot, okay, in order to make this correct. But still, it's really, really helpful because you can see that already um, that the field, uh, the auto field tool has detected a lot of fields correctly. and then of course we can use again uh, something like uh, the select tool and if we want to change something manually of course we can do this later on but at first if you import string data I would highly recommend and would consider it as best practice to use this auto field here to then simply check or let's say figure out from Alteryx side itself what is basically the data type and then you can use the select tool and do manual adjustments in case you have to do that. Also please note that you can also see that the size has changed, right? So 4, 17, and so on. Considering the original size, if I click on this one again, it will all these strings with 254. So also, if you have a big data source, Alteryx also here adjusts the size and makes all the columns smaller, which might also be uh, better considering the performance aspect, okay? So that's it, actually, for this field. Again, hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you can use this in your own flows. I would encourage you to try it. Otherwise, I hopefully see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to the next video. Now this time we're gonna dive into another really really powerful preparation tool which is the so-called data cleansing tool and you also find it under preparation and here data cleansing. But before we do this and use this tool we of course need to have some data. So you can either go to the in and output tool and use some here in this case the here the input data here if you like to do that or if you like to do it like me I'm simply a little bit lazy I would call it more efficient if you <laughs> say it this way and simply drag and drop the messy data inside and you find this also in the resource section now of course we get asked it's an excel file so what exactly do we want to import in this case I only have one table it's this called tabella one so I only have this one so I can either select this one or I could also select a range of cells if I like to do that but in my case it's formatted as a table so I simply use the table itself okay so then you click OK, all right, here we go, and we got a little preview of our data. And of course you can run this, just in case you want to see it down there as well, in the output here, so results output, you run it, and you can see this is the data we have. Okay, so this data looks uh, interesting, well, it looks messy, right? Because what, we can, what can we spot? Well, we spot immediately, and for instance, there is one column which only consists null entries, so it's completely missing, it's an empty column. We also spot the same for, in this case, the record number seven. So this row here also is completely empty. Okay. What else can we see? Well, 
what you might see also, of course, if you run it yourself, then on your screen as well, uh, here it might be a little bit small, but uh, see, for instance, the first name here also cons cons contains um, an exclamation mark or a question mark here, for instance, or here, for instance, call is uh, written in parentheses and there is an equal sign and so on, okay? So various different signs, which we do not want. We only want to have the name itself. And let's say the name number two, basically it's not uh, correctly named, but it could be also the and the normal name of the person, and here you can see the country. Let's take a look at the country. Well, the country itself, you can see one USA, two India, three Spain, and so on. So also the country also contains a number in here. There's also something we need to clean because we don't want to have the numbers here, right? Then the date itself looks fine, at least to me, for now. The age column here also con contains a Y character, so 34, Y for years, okay? That's fine, but we want to get rid of the Y. We only want to have the number, right? And the score itself, well, the score, as you can see here, well, there is a score, but the issue here is that it got a lot of spaces in here. For instance, great is G space, R space, E, and so on, or good, there's a space between the last O and the D, and so on. So a lot of spaces we want to get rid of. And the main point here, which I want to emphasize here at the beginning is, um, there are various ways in Alteryx how we can solve all these issues. And that's a great thing, because this makes the tool much more, much more flexible, of course. But why do we, or why should we use uh, our own formulas and do the heavy lifting ourselves if we can do Alteryx, uh, let Alteryx do the job? So and that's what I'm going to show you here. And all these things can be done or can be cleaned using, if we select it one more time, go to preparation here, this data cleansing tool, okay? So let's drag it on the canvas and let's see what it can, does for, it can do for us. Okay, here it is. So here's the configuration. You can see it has changed. And now what we can do is at first here, you can tick remove null data. And here you can specify, do you refer to rows or columns? So if I tick, for instance, the rows, let me tick this and let's take a look. Let us run that, click on the run button and let's take a look at the output. And what you can see is that the missing row, which we had here, Let's take a look at this output one more time. Here, the row number seven, right, which is completely empty. If we take the output, look at the output of the cleansing tool here, is completely gone, right? It's filled. That's great. So what else? Of course, the remo remove null columns works exactly the same way, but this time we're gonna rid get rid of this missing column here. So if we run this one more time, let's take a look at the output, and you can see that also now the missing here is gone, right? If if you take a look at the original, here's the missing, and take a look at the after the run here, it's also cleaned. Okay, great. So what else can we do? Well, then we have uh, various options, how we can deal with here, for instance, replace nulls and so on. That's also here filled, replace um, here, replace with blanks, considering string fields and replace with a null value, considering numerical fields, right? That's also something you can specify here. This is simply because if I go back in here, you can see that here, for instance, it's a string field here in this first, there's a null. And after running it, because those two options have had been selected here, you can also see that now um, this one is uh, here for the name, for instance, is uh, in this case empty, right? It's it's simply a blank in here. It's not a null anymore like we had um, here for the name number two. There, for instance, example, because this one got rid because we removed uh, row number seven. Okay. But this is basically um, what these two things can do for us. You can check this if you need it. Of course, you can also uncheck it. Now, the other ones here, these are special and we only want to have specific ones for specific columns. And that is why we can't do all of them in here, but we simply use several data cleansing tools um, to get rid of all the things we have here, all the issues. Now let's take a look at the first one. Well, the first issue, let's go with the first in here, right? Because here, for instance, we got the first column contains here Daenerys and then a que an exclamation mark and a question mark. And then here an exclamation mark, question mark, here the parenthesis and so on. Okay, so what are these characters? Well, these characters are so-called so punctuation characters. And that is why we can easily remove them by simply tick this punctuation option here. So you can see currently all of them are selected, uh, but in my case, I'd like to actually take none of them and let only take a look at the first here. So I tick first and then I say, here, leading and trading white space is always selected. I mean, that's totally fine because if you have them, you want to get rid of them probably most of the time. But then I simply tick on punctuation here as well, tick it, and then you can click on the run button here. And let's see at the output, and you can see that now Daenerys, John, Carl, and so on. So all the names are now correct, and there are no uh, additional punctuation symbols anymore. There's no equal sign, no parenthesis, no question mark, exclamation mark, and so on. So we got rid of all of them. And pretty easy by simply checking this box here. Okay, so what else can we do? Well, let's take a look. Well, the second one currently, okay, so far works fine for us. I mean, we got a name here which contains a null. Uh, let me take this here. Um, okay, that's, that's a null, but um, that's fine. 
for now, but the country, the country will be the next. Well, the country contains numbers in here, okay? So take a look at remove unwanted characters, and there is a numbers option. Okay, great. So because I don't want to tick now here the country and then tick the numbers here, because then I would use, I mean, even if it's possible in here, uh, probably because there are no numbers in this first column, but most of the time, um, just in order, if you want to make specific uh, cleaning options for specific columns, you sim would simply use the next um, here data cleansing tool here, right? And simply you can drag this behind and then go with the next here and say, for instance, now for the country, if I untick everything and go with the country here, and now for the country, I want to simply remove the, in this case, the, the numbers. So you take numbers here and then you click the run button and take a look at the output and now you can see that for instance here country USA, India, Spain and so on. So all these countries don't have this uh, leading number anymore. It's not one USA, two India and so on, but it simply got rid of the numbers, right? Pretty easy to do. As I said before, if you can do all or several transformations in the same data cleansing tool, of course you should do that, but considering performance aspects, just in case you're wondering, it makes no difference really if you run two of them or almost no difference, at least from my personal experience. Okay, so um, that is that. And what else do we have? Well, we have this H here, and for the H, for instance, here, we got this Y, right? And it's a letter, and we want to remove these letters, and those letters in this column. And this, for instance, you can't do both of them. You can't say in the country column, and then check here the H, and say you want to get rid of the numbers and the letters, because then you would also remove the letters from the country column, right? And that's not what you want, uh, because then there would not be US USA, there would be nothing, like a blank. Okay, so then let's actually check that out. Data cleansing, and of course, let me drag this behind like that. And I'll say, in this case, I want to go with the H here. Simply tick on H and say, for the H, I want to remove here, in this case, the letters, the Y character, right? So I can run this and click on the run button here or press the shortcut. And you'll see that now for the H here, it's simply a number. Even though it's still converted as a string properly because it's now on the left side, but you know, probably know already how we do it. We can simply use select tool, for instance, and then change the data type for the specific column. But finally here for this data cleansing tool, I'd like to show you what we can do in this column here. So this great, good, okay, and so on. And just by, by the way, this is completely made up. This is random da data, okay? I don't know how, how old those characters are and the score also is simply, simply an example data set, okay? So um, for the score itself, what we can do is we can use another, let's go with the data cleansing one more time. You can drag this behind and let me show it to you. So untick all of them, select none, and then I will go with the score. And for the score column, I want to really remove all white space characters, right? And that is why I simply take this all white space here, tick it, and then you can click the run button or press a shortcut. And now you can see that there's great, good, okay, bad, and so on. So all these, if you take a look at the before, there were those, those spaces here in between, everywhere, right? But now after running this, we simply got rid of them. Pretty easy. So all these transformations here could be done by a simple tick of the checkbox. And of course, finally, just modifying case, in case you're wondering, what can this do for us? Well, you can say for the score, for instance, because we already have converted this, let's also go in here, click on modify case, and then you can simply specify, do you want to convert everything to lowercase, uppercase, or title case? Title case simply means that the first character of the word is always in well capitalized. Otherwise, in this case, let's go with the uppercase here, for instance, that, so we can see it better. And now if we run this one more time, you'll see that now the spaces are gone, but now also words are uppercase, okay? Also something you can specify here. So that's really, really cool and powerful tool, at least from my point of view. So all these transformations can be done within this tool. So there's no additional work for us. Of course, we can do it also using formulas tools and other kind of tools in Alteryx, but why doing bothering, why bothering, bothering sorry, um, because it simply takes too much time. And this is really, really fast and easy, right? So just a few simple clicks. So that is the data cleansing tool. So hopefully that was you were able to follow. In case you got questions, of course, you might uh, free to ask them. Otherwise, can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to the next video and this time we're gonna dive into the filter tool which is available to us and here you can see I'm using simply the workflow which we have um, covered in the last video. Now this time simply I'm using this filter tool. Again you'll find it under preparation tab here. Go to filter. You can also see by default it's here. It's under favorites as well because it's a really often used tool and it's really easy to use. So I can simply drag it and maybe drop it on the end of our workflow and then here's the filter tool and you can see that the configuration has changed again. Now the filter tool itself gives us two options, basic filter as well as custom filter. So what is the difference? Well, the basic filter is pretty easy. It's simply based on one specific column. So you can select the column first, 
In this case, you can see these are the columns in our data set. And I can say, for instance, for let's say the ID here, and I say that the ID here, because this is um, in this case a numerical field, and that is why you can see those options here. And here I could say that, for instance, it's greater than a certain value. Um, just in case you can see that, for instance, first here is not a numerical value anymore. So if I tick on first, you'll see that now you see different kinds of options here concerning this um, here the comparison operator which you can which you can use here equals does not equal comes before and so on or contains because text can contain a specific um, well value of course right so for instance first and let's say it contains here and then you can specify a D here for instance and you got this here and if you run this you click on the run button and you have two outputs here which is a T and the F the T stands for true the F stands for false so T and take a look here first first for instance the first name the nearest contains a D Edart also contains a D, so it only contains, right? It's not starts with a D. We simply say contains. So Edart has a D, and Sheldon also has a D. And if we take a look at the false entries, for instance, John of course does not has or does not contain the letter D, and so on, right? Pretty easy to do like that. So if that's what you want to do, you can do this based on the, in this case, the first, uh, first name of this of the column here itself. So. Of course, you can choose other columns, but the main point here, uh, which I wanted to address, is if you select a different column, depending on what kind of data type it is, you get different options in here. As you have seen that, for instance, for a num number, there are various other options, like number here is an equal sign and so on, right? So different kinds of options. And of course, you can also see this highlighted because I can't check if the ID is a D, because the ID is a number data type and D is a string, right? So that's not possible. But let me actually show you the first again. That was the filter we had applied. And if you take a look, a closer look at this custom filter, you can say by default, even if it's not selected, it it's, has been written under the hood, if you want to call it this way. Because basically you do the basic filtering here, but Autorix is writing this filter as a formula down here. You don't have to do anything here, but you can see how the formula works. So if you tick on custom filter here, you can see that this currently is a formula, first is equal to, and then here's a D, and D simply means, in this case it's not equal to, let me actually go back in here and say contains, we had contains, right? So we simply tick contains again, first contains D, and now if I go to custom filter, you can see that contains first D. So there's a formula in Alteryx which is contains, and the contains needs the column. Columns are always referenced in brackets here in Alteryx, and then you simply type in here the D. The D is simply a string, and that is why you need to put it in quotes. Double quotes or single quotes should both work. Okay, but this is the formula basically under the hood, which has been written by Alteryx if you do this basic filtering up here. So it doesn't matter if you use the basic filter like that, or you take un custom filter here, like this one, and then you run the workflow. Let us run this, just to show it to you. I run the workflow, and you see we get the same output. So Daenerys, Eddard, and Sheldon, the only three names which contain this D, right? So it's totally up to us um, whether we want to use this custom filter or do the basic filter. The great thing here, if you start with the basic filter, of course, and say, for instance, I like to go with ID, and say that the ID should be, in this case, let's say, greater than 400, okay? So we filter all the IDs which are less than 400 out. These are false, and all IDs which, which are greater than 400 are true. So if you do it this way, um, and run the workflow here like that. Now, of course, the result should show us only IDs which are greater than 400, and for the false, of course, we got the IDs which are less than 400, exactly what we expect. But again, you'll see that if you tick the custom filter here, simply that would be the code. Again, the column itself is always referenced in those brackets, and then you do the operator here, and then the number 400, okay? So there's also a way how you can learn the formulas. What, what else can we do? Well, we have this fx and this x here. Those two are the most important down there in the custom filter. So if you want to do advanced custom filters, you can write them in here, and Alteryx is helping you doing this. You don't have to remember all the formulas. Of course, if you do them, or if you know all the formulas, you can use them directly. But if you don't know them, you can tick this fx symbol here. This fx symbol simply contains all the formulas which are available to us in Alteryx. And you can simply tick then this here to see conditional, and then there are examples. If C, then T, else F, and if. For instance, for if condition, right? Or this one here for several if conditions, and so on, right? So you can, or a switch here, and so on. So you simply tick here what exactly you're searching for, a financial formula, take the financial, and take a look at the financial options here, and so on, okay? And you get exactly the formula itself. And if you need to use one of them, all you need to do is simply go in here, for instance, I can then, uh, click on it, right, and then you can see it's correct. It's already in here, right? And now I simply need to replace the C, uh, the T, and the F. These are simply double data. But the, um, the if itself, the then, else, and end if, this is simply the if formula itself, the core of the if formula, okay? Let me actually remove this one more time. And uh, 
What else can we do? Well, in this case, we could say, okay, we would like to have the ID greater than 400. And let's say, because the output itself, let's take a look at the output one more time. This is actually the false. Let's take a look at the true output. Here's a true output. And we can do an additional filtering. And let's say the score, for instance, we got two scores of great. Let's say the score should be great, right? So what we could do is simply go in here, and then we simply go in to the formula editor one more time and then you can go to the where is it the operators here and there for instance is this and operator the and operator is a boolean and simply contains those two ampersand signs so you can simply click on it and you can see now they are inside currently you can see the formula is not uh, done so if you hover over it you get a little warning issue here or an error issue so what you can do here is then use the next in this case the score column so i have two options now i can either choose the brackets like that and you can see that Alterx is already giving me different kinds of options here, which I can use. These are just um, down the engines here. These are just variables inside of Alterx, but you don't need to use them right now. The, the blue ones here are simply the fields in our data set, right? So ID, the columns, the first, name, two, country, and so on. So here you could refer to the score, simply tick on score, and then you can simply check this. Uh, like equals, and then say in quotes, again, it must be great, right? So let's say great here because currently it's all in capital letters, like that. You put it in quotes, and here use double quotes. Again, you can also use sing single quotes for that. You can see that there are no issues. If you hover over the formula, Alteric is not complaining, so obviously the formula is correct, um, so that's fine. And by the way, the other thing which we have not used so far is this X. This X is symbol uh, it simply means that you have seen that if you use um, open bracket, you get here all the columns basically which are available. What you can also do is you can simply click on this X here. If you click on the X, you can see that there are the existing columns. And then you can also click on here and say I'd like to have the country column. Click on country column and you can see now the country columns also inside here. Again, the formula is already done here, so currently it's here uh, showing an error. But that's also a way how you get the, the column itself in this formula bar. Okay, so either use this click on X and select a specific column, or you simply use an open bracket and then Alteryx is already uh, proposing all the columns which are in the data set currently available to you. Okay, so that is that. Okay, so we do the filtering and the result should only be that we get Daenerys back because she's great, at least to this score here, and Sheldon Cooper because he's also great. Okay, so let's do that. Let's run this workflow, click on the run button here, and let's take a look at the output. And you can see that the true output is always selected at first. We can see we got only two results because those are the only ones here um, which have a score, in this case the ID above 400 and a score, which is great, okay? And the other ones are now in the false category. So also a great thing here with the true and false filter is, for instance, that that's not available in all tools, but in Alteryx, the, it also gives us the false results. So in just in case you want to work with the false results later on, or want to use this in, a, in another workflow, then you still have them uh, available to you, okay? So even if you filter for the true values, the false values do not get lost by this filtering, okay? Also one important thing to highlight here. So that's it actually for this filter. Again, um, I would highly uh, encourage you to explain, uh, explore, sorry, all these different kinds of options, uh, formulas which are available here because there are really a ton of formulas here and I'm certain that you'll find everything you need in here, okay? But this is really um, something you have to explore for yourself. Okay, so that's it for this video. Hopefully it was understandable so far and yeah, hopefully you can use this in your own workflows. As always, thanks so much for watching and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to the next video and this time we're going to dive into the next data preparation tool. So if I tick on data preparation here, I can see the next one would be the formula tool, which is a really, really powerful tool because here we can write all the formulas which we want to apply on specific columns in Alteryx. Now at first we need to have some data and considering here I have a blank canvas, so let's actually go and import some data. And I'm using here my transactions file again, transactions April 2019. So I can simply drag this in and of course, as always, use your own files if you want to follow along. That also would work, of course, right? You don't have to use the same file as I do, but of course, feel free to use it. You'll find it in the resource section. So here's the transactions April 19.csv. Uh, okay, so far so good. So it obviously looks fine and the CSV file has, well, recognized the data correctly. And always remember, let's take a look at this uh, select tool here, just a second. And you can see that by default, because it's a CSV file, the data type is a string here. I just wanted to highlight this because we'll have issues here just in a moment and we need to fix this. Okay, so let's actually get rid of the select tool here. And here we got the data and to get it in order, we can simply click the run button and we get a preview here of 9,443 rows of the total 35,755 rows or records in this data set. Okay, 
So what can I do now? Well, let's take a look at the formula tool, right? So for the formula tool itself, if I go in here to the formula tool, I can drag this inside and like that, and now the connection is established. So far, so good. Now, the formula tool, considering the configuration, looks like that. So we need to specify an output column and we also get a data preview after we have entered a formula here and we can also specify what kind of data type we have here. And also, as we have seen before, in the filter tool, there's an fx as, o as well as an x here. If you hover over it, you get exactly, okay, what's inside there. So here are the formulas or the functions and here basically are the columns and constants. So what can we do? Well, let's take a look here. For instance, if I take a look at this data set, I have my sales area here. And the sales area here always contains the name region. So region central or region north two, region and so on. Region south probably and so on. So always region. Let's say I wanna get rid of this region here. How can I do this? Well, there are several, several options, but one option here in the formula tool, for instance, could be that we can simply say, okay, we would simply click on this functions tool here, and you can see that there are different kinds of functions again, the same functions as you've seen before. The great thing here in the formula tool is you have this search bar here. So you can simply search for a specific function. And if you want to get rid of the region, let's think about it logically. Well, I want to replace a value, right? So let's actually search for replace. Replace here, and there they're all different kinds of options for replacing. So also, if you want to use regex, so regular expressions, in case you know them, you can use them here as well. But in this case, we can simply do a simple replace here. So the replace here, if you hover over it, returns string after replacing each occurrence of the target with the replacement. Also here, at least from my point of view, a very good description of Alteryx, how to use this function. So you can simply tick it, replace, click on it, and you can see that now you get replace. And of course you need to enter something for those variables here. So for the string, for the target, for the replacement. And for the string, that's basically one of the columns, which is the region column, right? So you can either use the bracket here, or you can simply click on this X because currently string is highlighted, and you can simply say, I want to go with the sales area, not region, sorry, sales area is it. So click on sales area here, and you can see it's replaced now. Pretty easy, right? The next one, you could do exactly the same. You could highlight this for the target in refer to a specific column. In this case, I don't want to use a column here. I want to use a string value, right? So I'm searching for a specific value, which is the target. I'm searching for region. So I put it in quotes, region. Okay, like that. And whenever you put a string in quotes, it should have this real green color in, in Alteryx, okay? And finally, of course, the replacement. So I want to get rid of region, but what exactly want to put here? Well, I want to replace it with nothing, right? So I want to simply get rid of um, it, and so I can simply use two, um, well, parentheses, uh, here, uh, sorry, no parentheses, two quotes here, right? So without any kind of spaces. Simply put two quotes without anything inside. It means that, please take a look at the sales error column, and for each row in this column, when you find the word region, replace it with nothing. That's basically what we're telling here, right? And then these two things are currently grayed out. Why is that? Because we get a data preview here, but we have not selected any kind of column here, right? That's the next thing. Because here you can simply click on this and now you can say, what exactly you want to do? Do you want to add an additional column? S or if you want to override the um, existing column, like the sales area, you can also take this one here. If you do it this way, then this simply means that now we are overwriting the sales area column and simply removing the region. If you want to add a new column, you go and add new column here and you can name this column, right? So let's say here we use a new column and say let's this is region clean, okay? Region clean or let's say sales area clean, was it right? So sales area clean, like that for instance, right? You can name this whatever you like. And here you can specify what kind of data type it is here inside and also the size. Okay, I'll leave it now for default, which is this V-string, but of course you can really adjust this exactly to your needs. And you'll see that if we run this, so I'll click on the run button here, and let's take a look at the output here. You can see that now we got one additional column here, which is the sales area clean, and now central instead of region central, or north two instead of north two, uh, region north two here, north two here, okay? That works. But you can already see that we got a little issue here. It's simply highlighting that the cell has leading spaces. So what does this mean? Well, remember we had region here and then a space and then central. And by simply removing region here, we now have a space and then central, right? That is why we have leading spaces here or a space and then north two. So we want also want to get rid of those spaces. Of course, we can also do it here in the replace function, but we could also, of course, use something we already know. And that is why, in this case, I'd like to use something we already know from the last videos, because I just want to give you really the feeling that what you do basically is you combine different kinds of tools here in Alteryx to get the result, right? So, of course, we could do it in the, in the here in this replace function here as well, but in this case, I'd like to go with the data cleansing tool, simply use it, put it here, and say here, 
Okay, we want to go with, let's say, none here, because we only need the last one, which in this case is not the state here, but the sales area clean. And let's say we want to get rid of leading and trading white spaces, exactly what we need. Okay, so far so good. We can run this here. And now if you take a look at the output here, if you click it, you also see it down there, there are no issues anymore, right? So if you click on the formula tool one more time, you can see there are uh, this, well, the Altex is telling us there are leading spaces here. So, but uh, here, if we use this, simply the data cleansing tool and run it, um, the spaces are gone, okay? So everything is fine for us. Okay, so that is one thing we can do. Then if we now use the select tool, at the beginning of the video, maybe you remember, I said that we got issues here, right? Considering um, if you use the select tool. And what we can do is, uh, here I have my price paid, right? The price paid currently is a string value. Well, let's say, instead of a string, I'd like to have this actually as a double, right? Because the price, if I take a look at the price one more time, it basically tells me, for instance, this is one dollar, euro, yen, whatever kind of currency we have here, and then there's a comma. So one comma one simply means one dollar and ten cents, for instance, or anything like that. Okay, but the issue here is the following. The decimal separator in this data set of especially is a, or is, is a comma, and Alteryx is only considering dots as a legit, um, well, um, uh, comma separator, right? Decimal separator. So what I need to do is I click on here and say, okay, I can try that. And I run this here and you'll see that here I got a lot of conversion errors here, or at least warnings here, right? Your conversion errors itself. Um, simply means that comma is not able so um, to be converted correctly. So Alteryx is not able to convert one comma one to one dot one. So that's why we need to do some well, additional formulas here, for instance. So we can simply go in the option here again, and we can either use another formula tool, or you can simply click on the plus icon here. So if you click on this plus icon here within the formula tool, you have the option then to choose the next formula here, okay? So that simply means that Alteryx is first doing this formula, and after fin having, having finished this formula, it goes to the next here and do, does the next formula. That's how it, that works. So it's basically um, like um, from the top to the bottom. That's how you can do it. Um, here, just let me also tell you, tell you this here. Here I'm doing now the next, well, formula within the same formula tool because I want to show you that you can do it. Best practice oftentimes is not to create all the formulas in one and the same formula tool. The reason simply is if someone else is now is then checking your workflow or if your workflow runs into errors within the formula tool, it's much easier to debug if you have the formulas, well, only one formula per formula tool. So you know exactly, okay, this is the issue, right? Um, if you have all the formulas and you might have a lot of formulas in the same tool, it might much easier, it might much harder to debug this, okay? That's just a um, best practice, at least, something I can give you here. Okay, so, but here, just to show you that you could do now the next column here, you can select column here, and you will see that you also have available the sales area clean. That is why I say, if you create a new column here, the new column will also be available then here in the next formula, okay? That's something you need to keep in mind, so you can basically build on what you've done before. But here, what we like to do is we want to replace something, so we can actually do the same as we have done here. So we can go back to the functions here, and let's say for replace, replace here, like that, and let's say, in this case, it's actually, um, Basically, it's a char, so we could also use the replace char instead of the normal replace function. And the string itself is, again, a column. So if I go in here, the columns, and say it's basically the price paid, which is currently still a string, and what I'm doing is I'm searching for a comma in here, like that, and I want to replace it with another char, which is a dot, right? So I can remove the set here and simply put in a dot in here, like that. Okay? So replace the char of price paid here, uh, the comma, it will basically replace the comma with a dot here. And then I can select the column, and in this case, I simply want to override the column, so I simply tick on price paid again, like that, okay? And also, you can see that if you override an existing column like this here, you can't change the data type here within the formula tool. If you create a new column, as we've done here up, up there, you can change the data type, like that. Okay, here you can't do it, but of course, later on, if you simply then use select tool, you can, you will be able to change the data type. It's just um, that Alteryx, the way it Alteryx works. So, okay, so far so good. And now um, we have done this, and here, basically we did the double here, and we got those conversion errors, right? But now let's do this one more time. Let's run this here, and you'll see we are done. And basically here, if I take a look at the output, now we don't get any issues anymore, right? So we got simply a one, and you can see also the dots in here. And now the price paid column is now a double here, right? So we converted the column after, of course, we removed or basically replaced the comma with a dot, because if you have decimal numbers with a dot, then Alteryx is able to work with it, okay? So that's how we can use basically this main 
um, function or tool here which we wanted to take a look at, which is the formula tool. Okay, so you can create several formulas in the same tool. They can build on each other, so everything you've done before could be used in the next formula, like this one here, right? I could refer to the sales error clean, and if I created another one like this one, I could refer to the price paid here, and for instance, right, if I want to do that. So, um, but as again, I just want to mention that that oftentimes don't use the same formula tool for too many formulas. Simply use a few of them um, after each other, right? So simply drag them the next formula tool like that, drag it inside, and use this as the next one. Okay, so that is that. All right, so that's everything I can tell you to the formula tool. Again, there are a lot of different kinds of functions in here, and I would highly suggest simply search for it. And with this search bar, it really it's really helpful, and you'll certainly find what you look for. Okay, so that's everything I'm going to tell you for this video. As always, thanks a lot for your attention, and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello, and welcome back to the next video. And this time, we're going to dive into the generate rows preparation tool which is available to us and we can see how we can use it. Okay, but first we need some data as always. So I go to my folder here and I have a data set which is called gain, okay? So I drag it inside, you'll find it in the resource section to follow along. Now you can select the sheet, in this case I'm referring to the table, and I click OK, and I got a little preview here, right? And if I run this, I also get the preview here in my output window. So I got here different kinds of games, Super Mario, GTA, The Witcher, Fortnite, and I got a start date and an end date, okay? So simply a small little data set, but it helps us to better understand what this generate rows uh, option or tool actually can do for us. So if we drag the generate rows inside and connect it to the input, like that, let's actually connect those two, like that, um, then you see that by default it already gets a configuration in here. So it would create a new field. We can also update the existing field or create a new field. The new field needs a name, in this case row count by default. It's an integer, the size is 4. And the initial expression is 1, and the conditional expression is as long as the row count is less than 10, it wants to create additional rows. Okay, it's called generate rows. This is exactly what it does. It generates new rows in the data set. And here for this new column row, simply 1 and row less than 10, we get a loop expression here. So the row count plus 1. So basically it starts with 1, it checks is the row count less than 10, that's true because it's 1 at the beginning. Okay, and then it runs the loop. Then it checks here, okay, row count plus one, okay, it adds. Then next loop iteration, it simply has a two in here, so two is still less or equal to ten, and then it goes again to the loop and so on. So it's simply a loop until the ten is reached. So basically what this does by default in the loop is simply creating each of the data entries we have here ten times. So you can simply go in here, click on the run button, and you'll see that now you get here Super Mario 10 times, the same entry in the data set, then GTA 10 times, and then The Witcher 10 times, and finally here Fortnite 10 times, okay? So now we got 40 entries instead of only 4 entries in the data set. And you can see that the date, the start date, and the end date are completely the same, so nothing has changed in the original data set. The only thing which has changed is that you get a row count here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So exactly what is specified in the loop here, right? So row count less than 10. And of course, if you would change this number here to, let's say, 100, then of course you would get the same data entry 100 times. So 100 rows with the same data entry. So if that's something you need, then this generate row well, tool is the right thing to use here for you. But it can do much more than that. So let me actually show you another or more interesting example. Let's go with 10 here again if we run it the next time. So that's fine. Okay, so you can basically duplicate the rows, which we have in the data set, how often we want to do it, by the default well, conditional expression which is set here for us. But we can also do something else. And that is why I chose this data set here, because this data set has a start date and an end date. And of course those dates are completely random, but the interesting thing here is that we got a start date, which in this case, for instance, the 7th of uh, July here, and the end is the 11th of July. And what we want to do is we want to create data entries, but based on the start and the end date here. For instance, here the difference between those two dates, right, 11 minus 7, is only 4, so we want to have 4 entries in here, and so on. Okay, the difference here is then 7 minus 5, and so on. So this basically should give us how many date entries we want to create here, okay? So let's do that. Okay, so we will do the same using the generate rows one more time. Let me actually drag it inside like that. But now, we, of course, we need to first combine those two, like this one here, and then we need to change the configuration here. So we want to still create a new field. Again, you see that when you update the existing field, you can choose specific fields here in the data set. In our case, we want to simply go in here and let it create a new field. But we name this field, for instance, this will be our date here. Then we can specify the data type. It's important because here we have a date, so we want to have this as a date field. So go with the date here. So select date here, okay? 
All right, so we got a date field, a new field, which gets created. And then we have an initial expression here. And this initial, initial expression is simply the start date. So we want to start with the start date here. Okay, so that's actually, you can simply click the three dots here, and then you can refer to variables, functions, or saved expressions. In this case, you can go with variables, and you can simply say we want to start with the start, right? So at first, let me actually remove what's inside here, and then actually double click on the start, and you can see that's inside here, right? Click OK, and you see that now the start is replaced. Of course, you could also go in here and use the bracket sim syntax, which we already know, bracket, and then put in a start here like that, start. That would also work, okay? So here, I'm using the three dots. I put in the start here as our initial expression for this column, and then our condition is simply that the start should be less or equal to the end date, okay? So we can simply click the three dots here, and again, here's the expression. We can remove what's already, already inside, and then we simply say we want to have the start, and we say the start is, in this case, less or equal to the end. Double click on end, and we got the expression. Of course, you can also write it directly in the box if you want. So click OK. And we got the condition here set as well. And uh, just by the way, sorry, not the start. I made a mistake here. We want to make sure that the date which we create, right? So we refer to the date column. So put in date here, okay? So we start with start value here, but we want to make sure that the date value which we have here is less or equal to the end because the date value will be the one which we update. Remember, at the beginning we had the row count here and the row count was updated here. So we have the date here and we will update the date. So we can go here in the loop expression and again, you can click the three dots, or if you know the syntax in advanced, because you have a lot of experience with Alteryx, then of course you can write it directly in here if you want. But you can also click on the three dots, and I'll do that here, and you see exactly the same window here, which uh, contains the variables which are available, the existing fields as well as constants, and new fields, proper new fields, and here the functions which you can also use. In our case, we want to go with the date functions, so let's take a look, date time functions, and there's a date time add function. So this date time add function needs three arguments, dt, i and u. dt means the specific date or the column which we, which we refer to. So let me actually first remove what we have inside here, like that, and then double click on this date time add here, double click, and you see that now we need to specify a date here. Well, the date itself is, if you go to variable, you can click on start, or you can enter it with the brackets manually if you want. So in this case, I say this date time add, um, oh, sorry, dates, I, can, you, I can't use this field, I'm sorry. Go, you can go to new field here and you can double click on date. That's what you want to do, right? So click on the new field, double click on date, or write the bracket state yourself. Then what you want to do is you want to add a value to this date and let's say we want to add one day, okay? Because we want to still, um, well, have a loop and each loop only would go forward one day. And then we need to specify what this one represents because we say we want to add dates, in this case only one day, but to each day date, right? But the day is not specified. So what kind of, well, date interval do we want to, want to add to this day? And that is where we put in, in quotes here, days. Okay, Alteryx is recognizing this as days. So that simply means we want to use the daytime add function and add one day to our, con uh, con well, to the date field we currently have, right? Good. So if you click OK, like that, you'll see that now the loop expression is done. And that's basically it, what we do, right? So we create a new field here, which is the date field. The first expression for the date field is always the starting date. Then we set as a condition that as long as the date field is less or equal to the end date, we want to add one day. So basically we start with the starting date. The start date is less than or equal to the end date, that's fine. So we add one day. So basically we start here with the 7th of July in 2020. Check whether this is less or equal to 11th of July. That is true. So we have this entry. And then we simply add one day. And we check again, is the 8th of July, is this less or equal to 11th of July? Yes, it is. And we go to the next loop. Until we reach the 11th of July, that's still true, because we said less or equal to. But then for the 12th of July, that's false, and then this loop for Super Mario basically ends. That's how that works. And if we, let us run this now, let's take a look at the code. And you can see that, take a look at the output here. That is basically what we get. So we start on the 7th of July, and because we had the end of 11th of July, we can see we got now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 entries here, right? So starting with the 7th, then the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th. So depending on when, whether you set less or equal to, or less than, end, and so on, of course you get different kinds of entries here, but um, the main idea really is that now this is not uh, 10 times the same value for each of the entries we have, but we simply check what is the date difference between the start date and the end date, and based on this date difference, in days, we, con we create the rows. So for instance, for Super Mario, again, we got five entries now. For GTA, for instance, we only got three entries because we start in the fifth. 
the 6 and the 7, so we got only 3 days in here in between. Then for Witcher, we start on the 1st and we end on the 7th, so there are a few more, so from 9 to 15 here. And then for Fort Fortnite, again, it's a different kind of number in here, depending on what kind of start date and end date we have. But that would be one way how you can also create new rows, of course, of the same values, but um, it would not always be, for instance, the same number, like number 10, which we have done by default in here with this one here, right? There would be differences here for the date field. And of course, it would also work for numerical fields. So if you don't have dates here, but you have, for instance, some amount here, and then there's another amount, and as long as the amount is less or equal to this amount, you would want to do this um, looping and create additional rows. Uh, you can also do it like that, right? It's totally up to you. Just make sure that if you do that, create the field and also make sure that you choose the right data type in here and then you create your loop, okay? So that's it for this uh, generate rows um, tool which is available to us. Well, if you use additional data, additional rows, you can do easily create them with that. So hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully you understood what we did here. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, yes guys. Hello and welcome back to the next video and this time we're going to talk about imputation and what it can do for us. Now let me actually first make the screen a little bigger, so let me actually drag this a little bit down. Okay, and now we need to have some data. So I go to my folder here and I have here missing sales numbers and you can use this as well to follow along from the resource section. I can drag this inside and I can see, okay, I got a table. Again, I'm using the table itself, so I don't need to specify any kind of selected range here. I click OK and my data is there. You can see that already here and of course if I run it just to see it also in the output down there let me actually make it maybe a little bit bigger okay like that and you can see that I got my product here which is energy drink in this case and I got sales numbers for 2019 2020 and 2021 and I can also see by this little yellow bars that there are uh, null values so basically missing data here and also got a percentage number by alterix how many well rows in this specific column are empty or null in this case so okay we need to fix this and in order to fix this, we have the so-called imputation tool as one option. So I can drag this inside and you can see like that, the dots connect the tools. And then I can see a preview in here of the configuration of this imputation tool. An imputation tool allows it at first specify, okay, what are the fields I should impute? Okay, that's what it asks us. And here we can say, okay, we want to impute basically all the columns. Why is that? Because if we take a look at the data itself, we can see that in all columns, there are null values, so missing values basically, so we simply leave all of them checked in here, right? So fields to impute, all of those three, okay. And then we can simply specify, okay, considering the incoming values to replace, what exactly should Alteryx replace for us? By default, it selects null as the replace value, or the value which should be replaced, and then it replaces the value with either the average, the median, the mode, or a specific value, which we specify. So let's say we go with null, and use a specified value, let's simply try that and simply put in a value which is not already in here, let's say 11111, okay, like that, or five ones, like that. So we can see exactly what we get as an output. So, and we, if we run this now, you can see that now all the missing values now contains this uh, 11,111, right? So instead of the nulls, if you go back in here, they're simply filled now with the number, right? So that would be one option how we can use it. Of course, we can also say instead of this value here, the user specified, I can simply use the average here, which makes probably more sense. So for especially if you have a time series and you would like to say, okay, here are my sales numbers, but for a specific month, I don't have the data yet because the other department has not provided the data and I want to simply use Im or impute the values. It simply means by using, for instance, the average of all the data in the columns I have, right? So if you use average here and you click the run button here, Basically, you get those outputs here. You can see that you also got decimal numbers in here. And there's 520, for instance, for this first column here is simply the average of all the numbers you have here already in the column, right? So it's column specific. So the average here also, you can see the same value in those two is simply the average based on the numbers which are available in sales 2020, okay? So that's what you can also do, use this average. The median also could work, especially if you have, for instance, outliers in your data set, then you probably would often use the median value to remove this outlier. The median is simply um, then um, a, be a better, a better um, indication for the true value here, right? Um, median is basically the value which is exactly in the middle if you sort the values, right? And the mode as a, another option here would be simply the, the value which appears most often, okay? That would be then the replacement. So that's the difference basically between average, the median, and the mode. And also, of course, you can set uh, here a user specified value that simply means which you have seen before 11,111 or any kind of value which you're going to use. So, beside that, of course, we could also say 
we don't want to remove or replace the null values, we want to replace user specific values. So if you take this one here, then we would have to check what values are there. For instance, let's say there's 390 here at the bottom for sales 2021. So we can simply say, okay, we go the imputation here, we say the user specified value is 390, that's the value we want to replace, 390, and then say we simply want to replace this with, let's say, a user specific value here again, and let's say the value will be, in this case, 99999, or five nines, right? All right, so I click on run, and you'll see that the output now here still contains the null values because we don't have replaced them now, but you here we have replaced this 390 with this 99,999, 9, uh, okay? So that's how you can replace specific individual entries in your whole data set. Of course, depending on what kind of columns you have checked here, okay? So that will be another option. You can't do both in this together, so you have to select either the nulls or the user specific values, but that's not a problem at all, But because you can use that several times. You can drag that inside and then replace the null values in the next imputation tool, okay? It also works. And finally, what you basically want to know is what are these two options here. So let's actually first go back with the null here and say we want to replace it with the average. So leave this configuration here checked. And then we have those two options here. So so far, if we run this one more time, you see that basically we overwrite the columns which are already there, right? So basically we fill exactly those columns where null entries have been before. But what we also could do is we can simply say we include imputed values indicator or the output imputed values as separate field. So at first the indicator itself, if we take this one and click on the run button, then we still replace the values in the original columns, but we get an indi indicator, so three indicator columns with the one if the value has been replaced, right? So here, for instance, we got two ones in sales 2021 here for those two values, and why is that? Well, the reason is because if we go back to original data set, those two entries were basically filled, okay? So you got basically the same matrix, so the same three columns here as here, but now you get a one for all the columns in the original columns which have been filled. This is the indicator which you can use here. And the other option, if you untick this one more time, you can also say you want to have the output imputed values as a separate field. If you take this and click the run button, then you'll see that you still got the missing or the null values in the original data set, but you get now imputed values, so three new columns, which contains not only the original data, but also the field value in here, right? So if you don't want to override your existing columns, you want to have three new columns, then you can simply take this bo uh, box here, and then you get three new columns, okay? So that's it, actually. That's all about the imputation tool in depth. The hopefully, that was all clear and understandable, and hopefully you can use this tool now in your workflows. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello, and welcome back to the next video. And this time, we're going to dive into the next preparation tool, which is this multi-field binning. And just in combination, because it is not too much to explain here, we will also use the saw tool here, just to show how the saw tool works. Okay, so let's dive into that. The first thing, as always, we need some data. So I go to my folder here, and here I have something prepared, which is the sales rep, which is also available in a resource section. So I simply drag it inside, like that, okay, and I can see the sheet name here is sales rep, and it's the only sheet in this Excel file, that's fine. I click on okay, all right, and I can see my data here. And let's actually run this so we can also see it in the output window down there, okay. So basically, we can see we got 18 records here, and we got a sales rep as well as the sales number in here. Then there's the Gary and John Snow, and so on. So probably names you have never heard before in your life. Okay, <laughs> so we got the data inside, and now we want to use this multi-field binning tool. So what can this do for us? Well, let's actually find out. Let's drag that inside and connect it, okay, like that. And you'll see that now here in the configuration window, I can only see one field here, or basically one column, which is sales here. So why is that? You can already see that only numeric fields are shown. So the reason for this, of course, is that the binning itself is only available for numerical columns, because we can't, can't bin string values, for instance. Okay, Autorix would not know how to bin those. But numerical fields, we, we, on columns, we can't bin those, right? We could put them into bins, because we know exactly, for instance, all the values between 0 and 100, and so on. So this is a, uh, are in bucket 1, values from 200 to 300 in bucket 2, and so on. So that's basically binning, right? So, and considering the binning options, we have two options here, which is equal records, as well as equal intervals. So let's first go with the equal records. And well, let's say the equal records, let's set those to 3, for instance, right? So we can do that, and we can click the Run button here, 
and we can see there is an issue here because we have not ticked this here. Of course, we need to tick it first. Tick it and then say free tiles here, that's fine. And you can tick the run button one more time and you see that now we got an output here. And if you tick this here, you get a sales number here. So sales tile for the individual sales rep. And you can see one, three, two and so on. And of course, they're currently not sorted, but of course we have the option to sort them. And here we can use the sort tool here, drag it inside like that and say for the sort configuration here, let's say what kind of column do we want to sort on? Well, in this case, we go with the sales tile number, which we have created and say ascending, that's totally fine for us now. Of course, if you use additional columns here, for now we don't do this, but you can tick those here as well. So we can click the run button here and let's take a look at the output here. The output, you can already see it. Of course, you could also use um, the browse tool here, right, if you want to use it, but for us now, and I use this the whole time, I simply take a look at the output here down there. So you can see that now they are sorted. I start with one, then two, and then three. And what you also can see is, and that is why it shows here as an instance, it shows three tiles. Why is that? That was just an example because we got 18 records here. So those 18 records are now well put into three different kinds of tiles. So we got one, two, and three, and they are equally, eh? because here's equal records. So that means that if I take a look at the output here, I got numbers from one to six. So the first six are in bucket number one from seven to, uh, in this case, uh, where is it, 12 here? Now the next ones, right, the next six are in bucket number two, and the last six are in bucket number three. So basically we got exactly equal records here. Because we got 18 records in total, we said we want to have three tiles, that we got six records per tile, okay? One, two, and three. What if we have something like, let's say, we increase the tile number to four, right? So 18 divided by four is not possible, right? It would be 16, and then there would be a rest of two. So how can we deal with that? Well, Alteryx is dealing with that under the hood. If we run it, you'll see that we don't get any error messages, even though you, we can't divide 18 by four. But now, even though we selected equal records, of course, we don't have the same amount of records in each of those, those tiles. So for instance, you can see number one goes from one to five. So only five values, not six. Then we got number two in here, which starts here in uh, six to, let's say here, to nine. So for instance, in number two, there are only four records. In number one, there are five records, for instance. Then we got tile number three. And of course, we could, because we said if we said want to have four tiles, then there's also a fourth tile, which also contains only four numbers here, right? So tile number two and tile number four only contains four numbers. Tile number one and three contain five numbers. So that's how we get to the 18 records. So we do not lose any records here, but the number, even though we set it to equal, um, those tiles, they, they of course can't be equal exactly. And how does Alteryx do this? Well, basically it takes a look at the sales numbers and then decides what kind of, um, well, what kind of re employees should go then to additional employees, which are basically two additional employees. How should they, or sales rep, how should they go to the specific tiles? Okay, that's how that works. Um, what else, what else can we do? Well, we could also do this multi-binning here. So like that, go to data preparation and say, we want to do it here again, multi-field binning, drag it inside and do it a different way. Connect it one more time. Then we select the sales again. And this time we don't use the equal records. So instead we go to equal intervals. And here again, it works exactly the same way. You can simply specify the tile number. And let's say equal intervals, and let's say two for instance, because it's the most basic one and easy to explain. So if we set it to two, and then you can run this, and you see that you get the output here. So let's take a look at it here. You can see it says numbers here, two and one, because we only select two. And let's actually do the sort one more time. Let's go with the sorting option here. And this time, let's say we want to sort again, first on the tile number ascending. And let's say we want to have a second sort, which is the sales rep and then ascending. That's also fine. And we click on run and take a look at the output here. And if you take this here, you'll see that basically this is the output we have. So basically we have the set tile numbers, which are sorted from one, two, one and two, because we only have two here. And then we also have here, you can see that the sales rep is also sorted. So it started with A, then C and so on within the tile, of course, right? So here's B then for the second tile and so on. Because we first sorted by tile and then we sorted by sales rep. And just to make sure that this also works, if we go in here, back in here and say descending, so sales rep descending and click on run button, then for each tile, within each tile, so the first one, the second one, now for instance, Raj Kutrapali is here, the first entry, right? And Amy is now the last one in tile number one. Okay, so that's basically how the sorting works. And well, now we set it to here, the tile option here, or the binning option to equal intervals, that simply means because we only set two intervals, what is Alteryx doing actually? Well, it's taking a look, it basically, Alteryx takes a look at the sales column here, 
and says, okay, what's the minimum value in the sales column, and what is the maximum value in the sales column, okay? And it basically has now this interval, so from the minimum value to the maximum value, and then it decides, okay, how many tiles do you want? In this case, we want to have two, so it basically divides it uh, by two, so exactly the, the m value in the mi middle, so basically the difference divided by two, this is the value in the middle, and there I will split between the two tiles. That's how that works, okay? So that's it actually for this multi-binning. So in just in case you need some grouping here for the tiles, for instance, you can use those tiles option here based on numerical fields. Keep this in mind, that only works on numerical fields. And the sorting itself, I think it's pretty explanatory and easy to do. You can simply specify what kind of columns do you wanna have, and then you sort depending uh, on those specific columns. And you can use several columns if you want, and you can also arrange those columns using those two arrows. So if you want to sort for another column first, of course you can do this here, simply by clicking on the the two arrows. Okay, so that's it actually for this video and for the multi-field binning as well as for the sorting tool. Just in case you got questions, of course, feel free to ask them. Otherwise, can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to the next video. And this time we're gonna dive into the multi-field formula tool. So let's do that. At first, we need some data as always. So here we use the product info and I drag this inside and you can see I have my sheet. In this case, the sheet is not named, so it's simply called tabella one. In this case, I click okay, and I already get here a preview of the data set, all right? So let me actually also run it, so we can see it here in the preview window, output window here. We can see that here we have to deal with issues here, but we will deal, we'll deal with those later. That's not the point here. The main point here is the other columns, which are currently have in here. And uh, here we want to apply this multi-field formula tool. So what is this? Well, let's think about that. We already know that we have the formula tool, like this one, right? So we can drag it inside, and for instance, if I connect my data to this tool, like this one here, I can go in here, and then I can select a specific column, like for instance, the country, the product name, the product category, the list price product, cost per unit, and so on. So all the columns which are available, and if I, for instance, go with the country, then I can go in here and write my formula. We already know that, we have covered that, right? Okay, but what if I like to apply a specific formula on several columns? So for instance, I would like to cr make my country, um, I don't know, make my country uppercase, for instance, right? Even though I know there's also the data cleansing option to do that, but um, still, let's think about a simple example here. So we want to convert the country to uppercase, but we also want to then convert the product name to uppercase and then the product category to uppercase and so on. So if you want to do that, so the same formula applying to multiple columns, of course, you could do that here. You can do it for the first one, then you click on a plus symbol, or use an additional formula tool and do this for the next one, and so on. But of this, this of course would be cumbersome and would take a lot of time. So why not do it together in only one tool? And that is exactly what this multi, in this case, multi-field formula tool can do for us. So it simply selects the specific fields, so we can select it by data type. In this case, currently it's selected numeric, but of course we could go, for instance, to text. So if you select text, for instance, then you can see we got country, product name, product category, and then dynamic or unknown fields, right? And you already know what this means. So whenever you find dynamic or unknown fields in one of the um, configuration options in the tool, then simply means if you check this, then the same formula logic which you specify here will also be applied on new columns if in case the data set will change. If that's not the case, you simply leave this unticked. But I would, if that's possible, I would actually well, recommend that you tick this dynamic unknown fields. The reason is that uh, then you make sure that probably your workflow will not run into errors, okay? That's just um, from my experience. I just wanted to tell it to you. Okay, so let's actually do this. We go with the text value here, and we say we have country, we have product name, and product category. And let's say we want to apply it to all of them, So let's set, uh, as well as the dynamic. Let's say all here, okay? And then we can specify, do we want to create new columns, or do we want to override existing fields? So at first, let's actually take a look at the data. So I ticked country as well, because here it doesn't matter, but the main idea here is, for instance, we have Rockstar Energy, for instance, and here we have energy drinks, right? Or we have Monster Energy and also energy drinks. Now let's say we want to replace the energy with a name Boost, for instance, like, now they are not called energy drinks, they are called Boost drinks, and then it would be Rockstar Boost Zero Sugar and so on, right? Just an example. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, we simply go back in the tool and say here, what we want to do is we want to, let's actually first start with copy output to new fields. Let's keep this new. Of course, you can use another prefix or suffix, you also suffix here if you want to do that, but let's actually keep this like that. 
and say here, okay, what we want to do is we use an expression here. And the expression will be applied on what? And this is what we can specify also here. You see that the original field names are there available for us, but there's also this option current field. So what is that? The current field here is actually exactly the field, the specific column, or in this case, the yeah specific row then for each individual row in all the columns, which we currently take a look at. So the current field means we want to apply the formula not on a specific row, like for instance the country, which we have to find in the normal formula tool, for instance. So, but we want to apply the formula on the current field. The current field is always each individual field in the selected columns we have, right? So that's the current field. Okay. And what exactly we want to do? Well, we want to evaluate an expression, and we can either write it um, if we know it exactly already, or we go to the function options here and then simply search for a specific function. So, for instance, let's say we use a string function, and let's use a simple one which we already know. In this case, let's say we want to use the replace. So let's say replace string target. So double click on that because my example was with the boost here and say the string here is now not, if we go back to the variables, not one of the original fields, but it is the current field because we want to make sure that we will apply the formula on all the columns we have to se selected up there. So we simply say the string it will be the current field like that. Then the target here is simply energy because we're searching for energy, energy like that. And the replacement will be simply, let's say boost, right? So we don't call them energy drinks, we call them boost drinks now, boost like that. And you see, that's it. And that's all we need to do, okay? And now if we run this, we click on the run button or press the shortcut to run it, the workflow, you'll see that now we have two new columns here with the pref prefix new here. And now it's called Rockstar Boost Zero Sugar. The original was Rockstar Z Energy Zero Sugar and Energy Drinks as a product category. And now it's called Rockstar Boost Zero Sugar and Boost Drinks as a category. You see that the country itself has nothing has changed, right? So the nulls have been replaced with, in this case, blanks. But the countries itself, because they don't contain the name energy, we could include them in a multi formula tool. They still would be or evaluated as the same country here because they don't. Uh, they're not called, for instance, Austria Energy, right? In case the energy would apply, would well be part of this name, then of course it will also be replaced. But the main point here is that we can apply the same formula logic which we have created down there to multiple columns at once in just one simple tool like that. And if we, for instance, say we want, don't want to have new columns, we want to override existing columns, then we would untick this one here, and then you'll see if we run the workflow again that the, those three columns here would disappear. And if I click on run one more time, you'll see that now we have basically simply replaced the boost here, a boost strings here in the original columns. Okay, that's the only difference here if you take this or not. Okay, so that is that. And now let's also apply this to numerical fields here. For instance, we say we have a list price and the product cost. It works exactly the same way, but let's actually do this just to really, well, do it one more time just to train it a little bit how that works. So again, we go with the multi field formula, we drag it inside like that. And if the connection is not recognized automatically, we simply connect those tools. And now we have the multi formula tool. And now we can simply say, okay, this time we're going to go with numerical fields. By default, we have those two. But of course, I also select the dynamic because in, just in case they are in the next uh, file, when the file gets updated, there's a new numerical column. I also want to apply the same formula logic on this column. So I simply take this uh, dynamic on our field. Okay. Then I untick this one because I want to override existing fields. And then I can simply say, okay, what I want to do? Well, let's make it simple. I'm going with my current field option here again. I double click on the current field and say I want to simply add one. Okay, that simply means let's say we got a list price in here. Here we got one and here got uh, 75 as product costs. But let's say the list, list price has been risen and also the product costs has been risen. That's uh, basically what we want to do is uh, have been risen. Uh, basically, what we want to do is we want to simply add one to each individual cell as well in the list price per unit column as well as in the production cost per unit column. So prices have been risen, but also the costs have been risen. Okay, so that's the idea. And we can do this um, like that. Okay, untick this. Okay, here we go. And you can click the run button here. And you'll see that now, if you take a look, of course, at the output, you need to select it first, you'll see that here the list price is now two instead of one and the product cost and price, the production cost per unit here has also been risen with one, right? So if you take a look at this one here, this minus here, 0 0.75 and if you take this one here you get 1.75 okay so of course as i said before i know i haven't used the browse tool now too often of course you can also run this in the browse tool then you see the same output in here but you see that uh, basically all the records and additional information here okay but i don't want to see those because i would like to still uh, be here uh simply select the output it's totally fine for me because then i can simply also show uh, still the the configuration option here okay
but if you want to use a browse tool feel free to do it just as a hint here okay so that's it basically for this multi-field formula tool just remember if you want to apply it to uh, several columns always refer in your expression here to the current field but basically considering the functions all the functions are available okay and also you can select specific data type fields here so apply to all numerical columns or all text columns and so on and then you simply can still make adjustments if you don't want to include all numeric fields you can untick some of those here as well okay and just in case um, um, well you're searching for numeric fields and some of those are currently already uh, still string columns you already know what you do then you simply go to the preparation here and simply say okay at first I use select tool and change the specific data type to the right data type okay so um, that is that and uh, yeah that's it actually for the multi-field formula tool again you could also do the same or get the same results using a normal formula tool but if you have a certain um, well mathematical or other kind of operation and you want to apply it to um, several columns at once then this tool is a great help because it saves a lot of time okay so that's basically it all right so thanks a lot for your attention and as always hopefully see you in the next video until then best guys Hello and welcome back to the next video and this time we're gonna dive into the multi-row formula tool. So what is that? Well, if you remember at the beginning of the last video I told you uh, when we took a look at the data set here that there's a huge issue here, which is this one. And this is really, really common, especially if you import Excel files and you work with Excel files. Then oftentimes you have something like that. You have a country and because all those data belong to the same country, then the country is not repeating but instead there are simply no values in the Excel file, right? And then there's the next country, in, the, in our case a country, but it could be everything, and then there are next, well, in this case, products who belong to the specific country. But what we actually want to have is we want to have, well, the country name here completely down there, right? So because all those product names here, all those energy drinks in this case, belong to the country Austria, so we want to have Austria in all those, well, currently null columns in here or our cells right so how can we fill those and this is basically the main purpose of this multi-row formula tool at least for my personal experience and how I use it so you can simply drag this inside like that and let's actually connect this maybe directly to this original one like that okay and you can already see the configuration here and you have two options here you can either update an existing field or you can create a new field so this is often time a configuration option which a lot of tools provide so do you really want to override an existing column or do you want to create a new column in our case I would like to actually override so I would update an existing field because what I want to do is I want to take a look at my country column and within the country column if you go back in here within the country column I want to fill the value down right so basically I have Austria here and here I have nulls so please fill Austria down from there until the end right and then there's Belgium okay then it starts with Belgium so please fill Belgium down until Denmark starts and so on so that is the idea okay so let's go back to the configuration here of this multi row formula tool and then we have basically the option to update existing field we already checked that and then we say the number of rows in this case leave it to one I'm gonna tell you exactly what you can do it if you take it to two and so on just in a minute and the values for rows that don't exist you can leave it to zero or empty you could also put in null or set values for closest values row but the default here most of the time we use the default here because I said yeah seldomly actually change anything here what I do instead is I use those options here the variables down there and the expressions down there and by the way you can also see there's a group by option so let's say you have a data set where a same column is repeating multiple times you can at first group your data and then based on those grouped data you can also apply this multi row formula tool if you want but in our case we can use the default configuration so we don't need to group by anything you can also see that's optional instead let's take a look back at the data okay so the data looks like that so I have my country here and the missing values in here so alright let's go into the multi um, row formula tool and let's take a look at the variables which we have well we have row minus one row plus zero which is here called the active row and we have the row plus one and also we have the constants which are always available in here but we don't use them okay so and then if you go to functions here of course we can see all the functions again and also saved expressions just in case you have them in this case what I like to do is like to do the following please so in plain English if I go back to my my data in here take a look in plain English please if there's a null entry take the value from the prior cell in this case Austria and fill it otherwise if there is a value for instance here Belgium there's a new value then please use the value which is already inside 
So oh, what we want is we want always take within each cell, take a look if there's a value. If there's a value, then keep this value. Otherwise, use the value from the cell before. Okay, that is the logic which we want to apply. And if we go back to the tool here, we say okay, the row zero is always the active row. That's fine. And the row minus one, as you can see here, this is basically the prior row or the prior cell. And the row plus one is the cell which com comes after the active cell. Okay. So that is the idea. And if you click on the plus symbol, you see exactly the here the specific columns in here. So row minus one country would be when whenever we are in a specific cell. So let's actually go in here. If I am cell number two, then the row minus one country would be the cell number one. There's Austria here, and the row plus when I'm still in row number two would be the third cell in here. That is the idea behind what this basically means. This row minus one and row plus one, which is the active row and the plus one, uh, zero and plus one. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to take using an if condition from the functions here. We want to check something, right? So conditional is fine. Conditional and there's an if. If C, then T else F. Exactly what we need. So you can simply double click on it and you can see that is basically what we have. So we check a certain, in this case, column. In our case, it's the country column. And we check whether the specific cell is empty. If that's the case, give us the value from the prior cell. If that is not the case, then give us the cell value. Okay, so the next thing is that we need to check something within the C condition. And the checking can take place with, if we go back in here and take a look, what would we have? Well, we have operators, spatial, specialized string, and test. And that's exactly what we need, because we need to test something. We need to test whether the current row is empty or not, or is null, right? So in this case, empty works. So there's an is empty here. So we could go to the C here for the expression, and we simply can double click on here. And you see now we have this formula is empty inside. And let me actually remove the V or also go to the variables back again and simply go to the row plus one active row and go to country. Please make sure you don't go to row number minus one because you want to check always the current row or current cell you're in. That is why you simply check here for the plus zero to the active row. You double click on country and say here we check if the current row, the current cell in this case country is empty, then what do we want to have? Well, we want to have the, the value of the prior row, right? So for t here, we simply go to row minus one, take this, and say we want to have the value from the prior country column. Of course, you could also refer to another column. So you could also say if the current row or cell in the country is empty, I would like to have then the value from the prior row from product name, even though it does not make sense here, but you could use it. In this case, I would like to have the prior value from the country, so from the same row. And else, so if that not is not the case, so if the country is not empty, so there is a value, then I would like to have this value. So then I go for the F, go back to let me make it smaller again, go row number one, so the act, or zero, the active row, and simply select country, like that. And that is basically our formula. So we check each cell if the cell value is empty. So if that's the case, then give us the value from the prior row. If that is not the case, give us a country. Okay. So that is the logic behind that. And of course, it will also work with the row plus one. Of course, you see exactly the same, right? It would be simply the next row, basically, or the next cell value for each of the specific um, columns we have. And uh, I told you that I also promised you what this number of rows means, because we can unt uh, make this bigger. So if you take this to two, watch what happens. You see currently it's row minus one, active row, and row plus one. But if you increase this like that, you'll see that now you also get row minus two and row plus two. So you get additional options. So instead of using the value from the prior row, you can use the value two rows or two cells before if you want to do that. So you can increase the number of rows here if you like to do that. In our case, that's not necessary, but you could do it. Um, so that is the formula. And let's actually evaluate this formula. Um, let's go in here. And field is not contained in the record. Let's see. Yeah, because we update an existing field. But of course, we need to set the field. And we need to have country in here. Okay, So like that. And you see the configuration is done. And now if you click the Run button, click on the Run here, the option. And if you take a look at this output now, you'll see that now the country is filled, right? So we got Austria, 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 and so on, until the 11th column, which starts with Belgium, which is exactly the case, because here we can see that it starts with Belgium at the 11th um, entry in this country column. And then, of course, we fill this down with Belgium, which we do in this output here, like that. And this allows us then to fill those missing values um, in our data set. And that's something I personally run really often into when I when it comes to Excel files, because that's the way the Excel files are structured. Then there are a lot of um, empty values and missing values. And if you want to fill those down, which we do here, it's pretty easy to do with this multi um, 
a multi-row formula tool. Okay, so that's how that works. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you. Hopefully that was clear. Hopefully that helps you. And I just want to encourage you to try it out yourself. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to this video. Now this time we're going to dive into four additional data preparation tools. Why four? Well, I think all those four tools are more or less self-explanatory and we can deal with them pretty fast. So I think it's best to combine them in one video. So of course, before we do anything here, we need some data. So I can simply go to my folder here and this time I'm using this transactions April 2019 file again. So let me drag this inside like that. And then we already get a preview here. Of course, let's actually run this maybe so we can also see down in the output section here. And here that is our data. That's what the data looks like. Okay, so far so good. So let's actually explore those four reparation tools. The first thing is let's go with the record ID. It's pretty easy to do. All you need to do is you simply drag it inside like that. And then you see you can give it a name, record ID. Of course, you can change this if you like. And also give it a starting value and also data type is int and then the position where you want to place it. You want to place it at the first column or you want to put it last in your data set. So let's actually stick to the first column here. And if you run this, you see that basically the output has now one additional column here, which is the record ID starting from the row number one, because that's basically the starting value here. And it simply goes down until the end, right? So until this 35,755. Of course, not all of them are displayed here because we don't use the browse tool, but basically you get one additional column with an index, right? One, two, three, and so on, depending on where you want to start. That's basically all this, uh, this preparation tool here does. So pretty easy to do, but in case you need it, you can use it. Okay, let me actually drag this maybe a little bit here. So the next thing is then the random sample, which is available here. So you can drag this inside like that, for instance, also connect it. And this random sample, for considering the configuration is also pretty well small, or it's not really much to configure here. You can simply say, okay, I got here almost 36,000 entries, and I simply want to take a, a sample of them. So I can simply say, okay, random and records. So let's say I want to have 1,000 records, and I can simply select it here. Or you say, I want to have it as a percentage number, I want to have 10% of the total data set, then you simply stick here to 10%. And then you also can tick this if you would like to have a deterministic output seed. Deterministic simply means if you tick this and have a seed, then each time you run basically this workflow, you will get the same results, okay? Otherwise, if you don't have this det deterministic output set, then basically the, the randomness behind this algorithm changes and you might get different outputs. So if you want to have always the same outputs, you simply tick this and set a seed here. That's the main point of this option here. So let's say 10% of the records, that's fine. And if you run this, let's click the run button here and take a look, and this is our output, right? So let me take this here, and here we got 3,576 records, so exactly 10% of those almost um, 35,000 and so on records, right? Exactly the records here. And you can use them to then play around and do any kind of uh, the transformations here. Okay, so that's that. So that's how you can get a random sample. So the next tool I'd like to show you is basically the sample tool. So there are, beside the random sample, there's also a sample tool, which gives us a little bit more option to configure. So let me drag this inside here like that. And you see, considering the configuration options here, let me actually first con connect it, those two here. You see that here we can specify what kind of sample do we want to have. So for instance, we'd like to have the first n rows. So n is specified here. If you say, I would like to have the first three rows in my data set, and you run this, click on the run button here, you'll see that basically we got three entries, right? That's uh, the first three entries, like all from Austria, Carinthia, Salzburg, and Styria. And if we go back to original data set, they are starting with Austria, and these are the first three entries, okay? So pretty easy to configure here in the, in this case, the sample tool. So the last end record simply means then we would like to have the last end re of records of our data set. Of course, if you tick this, you can specify the end exactly the way you want it. The skip first and rows, that also simply means I would like to have, let's say, I would like to see my data set, but I would start importing the data or want to have the data starting from row number three. So if you run this, for instance, and take a look at the output, now you can see you always still got almost 36,000 records. But of course, it starts now with Tyrol here from Austria. And if you take a look back at the original data set, basically Tyrol is the fourth one. So we skip the first entries, the first three entries, right? That's basically it, why I skip the first n rows or one of every n rows exactly 
kind of similar, right? Well, one of every 10 rows, if you specify 10 here, then you would get one entry of each 10 rows. So always take, for instance, the first value, then the next nine, get rid of them, and then takes the, the, the 11 value, and then get rid of the next nine, and so on. So basically, that's what you can specify here. Um, any chance to complete each row? Again, it's kind of a also a way of sampling the data itself. Or the first n percent of rows, that's actually kind of similar to the random sample we had here, right? But of course, now it's specified or based on the first records, right? It's not, you don't need a random seed here, which what we need here, for instance, to get always the same result. It simply starts with the first n records of, all right? So first starts with the first year. So these are the default options you have here. So pretty easy to configure. Now, you might ask, what is this group by column? Because it's also, again, there, optional. Well, you could first group by the, the specific data set and then do the same. For instance, I could say, okay, I'd like to have the first n records. I would like to have the first three records. That's also fine. But let's say, because I got different sales areas here, right? Let's actually say I would like to first group by the sales area. So I got all the data entries for reach under region central or for region north two and so on. And then for each of the sales area. So for each group of sales areas, I would like to have then the top, then three values, the first three values. You can specify that. Then you simply say, I want to first group by the sales area. And then for each group, give me three values. If you do it this way and run the workflow again, then you'll see that now you don't get only three entries, but you can see that you get a grouping. So basically for each sales area, you get three entries, right? Because we group by the sales area, now we get three entries for the region central, three for north one, three for north two, and so on. So exactly three values because we specified three here, and we group by the sales area. And of course, you can also group by multiple columns. I could also tick on country here as well, and so on. So basically, this is what this grouping does. So at first, that simply means first group the data, and then based on my groupings, take the first three, in our case, records and give it to me, right? That's what you can specify here with the sample option. Okay, that's the sample. And then I'd like to finally show you here the unique tool, so you can drag this inside, and that simply means give, uh, give us unique values. And let me actually put that maybe here. Let's so drag this a little bit up, this a little bit up, and this a little bit like here. And of course, yes, we need to connect it. Let's actually connect those two fields, and let's actually make this maybe a little bit smaller, like that. And you'll see that here for the unique tool, you can simply specify what kind of columns do you want to check. If you want to check all the columns, then of course, only if a record in the data set is ex exactly identical, uh, so all the columns um, are exactly the same for two entries, then the second entry is marked as a duplicate, right? Otherwise, if only one entry is different, then it's not a duplicate. But in our case, let's do it uh, simpler, deselect all, and let's say I'd like to do this for, for instance, for some of the, let's say with the country this time. Select the country in here, and if we do this, like that, and run the workflow, we will see that our unique values, we get a list here of all the countries in our data set. So basically, these are all the countries, and I only got one entry for each co country. Because you see that we only take a look at the country, and as soon as we see the country column in the original data set a second time, which already is there the case in the second row, right? Because here we see Austria, and the uh, Austria again. So we only keep the Corinthian Austria, and we remove all the other Austrias. And then we can see Denmark, and Denmark starts with central Jutland, and that's why this entry is the only state which will be kept in the unique. So if you go to unique here, you see that, for instance, here for Austria, it's Carinthia, and for Denmark here, it's central Jutland, right? So exactly only the first entry will be kept, and the other ones will get shown in this duplicate output. Again, it's a great thing here, because Alteryx is not simply removing the duplicates, it still gives us the option to work with those. We can simply connect the workflow and continue with the duplicate values if you want, right? So that's how you can use this unique tool. So four, three powerful tools. Um, I think the, well, the record ID is the one which I seldom use because it's not too valuable, at least to me, but the other ones are really good, great tools. And now hopefully you know how to use them for your own workflows. Okay, so that's it for this video. As always, thanks so much for watching and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back. Now the last data preparation tool which we want to cover here is the tile tool, which is this one here. Now, before we can use it, as always, we need some data. And I've prepared something which is called, in this case, the tile sales rep. So you can either use this one or, of course, choose your own data as well to follow along. Now, if I drag this inside like that, you'll see that I have a sheet here which I can select. It's called tile sales rep. That's fine. I click OK and I get a preview here of my data, right? Which is this one here. OK, so far so good. Now, of course, I can also click the run button here just to take a look at it. And I also have it down there in my output window in here. Okay.
So I got a region here, I got a sales rep as well as the sales number in here. Now if I want to group them, basically putting them into bins or tiles, I can use the tile tool. We already covered this multi-field binning, but there's also this tile tool, which gives a lot of uh, additional options. So if I drag this inside like that, you'll see I can connect it. Let me actually put it maybe up there. And you can see that there are different kinds of tile methods. The smart tile, then also here, which kind of column do you want to create this tile on? In this case, there's only one column here select to select because it's the only numeric column. So this would only work, as you can see here, the numeric column in here, right? The sales here. Okay, that's fine. And then you can specify what you want to have. Let's say equal sum here, equal sum here as well for the tile. Then how many tiles do you want to have? Let's actually say I'd like to have uh, three tiles maybe. And then I have my sum column here, which is the sales. And I have a sort column here, which I also can, in this case, select. So if I want to sort on anything, I could select it here. You can see it's optional. You don't have to do it. And you can also group by a specific column if you want to do that as well. So let's actually do this, equal sum. Click on the run button here and take a look at the output, which is this one here. And what you get basically, or what we get, is a tile number as well as a tile sequence. So for instance here, this is the first tile. So the first group is all one in here. And this is the first of the first group, the second of the first group, third of the first group, and so on, right? So we've got each individual tile here uh, within the tile number itself. So these are the first ones, which are these ones. And then there's a second group here, which are the second ones, which are these ones here, for instance, for number six to, in this case, number 11, and then we got here number 12 to uh, number 18, right? So equal sum, basically we have three tiles here, and we basically uh, group them together. And for instance, what you could see here, considering the sales, there are, for instance, there is 9,000 and so on, right? And 8,000, and then for instance, there's 8,900 appearing here. So what kind of sorting is this equal sum? Well, the equal sum simply means that it tries, or Alteryx tries to sum the value so that the sales number in, in the sum is more or less equal in each of the three tiles, if you sum them up, right? So of course, that's not totally possible because probably there are differences, but Alteryx is trying its best to group them together so that each of the sum of the sales for each of the tiles is more or less equal to each other. That is what this equal sum means. So if you go to equal records, that simply means that we want to group by tiles, let's say in this case three tiles, or let's actually say four tiles maybe, because we already know we got 18 records here, and 18 of course is not dividable, um, well, dividable by four, in, so you get basically you can divide it 16 by four and you get two additional ones, so if you run this of course you could get the same result, so you get tile numbers in here, and you also see that for instance in the first, first tile we got five records, in the second we got four, in the third we got five, and the last one we got four again. And if you remember, maybe this is actually the same result which we get when you use the multi-field binning in the last video, right? Or one of the last videos. Okay, so that's basically equal records, also pretty easy to explain. Then we got smart tile, unique and manual. Now smart tile is simply, if you do it this way, you can see do not output name column, output name column, output verbose name column. Let's take output verbose name column here because we actually want to name those, okay? And you'll see what this means. Let's actually run this here and take a look. And you'll see, basically, we got a tile now for different kinds of sales reps here, considering their sales. And we got also the sequence, of course. And now we got the smart tile name, which we basically get because we tick this output verbose name column. And you can see these are above average, so 7 to 12,000. These are average in the, in the, in the second uh, tile, in the zero tile here. And this minus one here, for instance, this is in the below average. And then there's even one, which is this one for penny with this thousand sales, this is minus three. So this is extreme low, below 1,225. So basically what Alteryx do, uh, does here in the smart tile is simply it's analyzing the sales numbers and then it's calculating specific measures like the mean, the standard deviation and so on. So statistical measures and then based on those measures is knows exactly okay based on the sales number I can see here and the measures considering or calculating the whole column, I know exactly okay these values are above the average, um, these are the average, these are below average, and it's, it classifies those basically based on the sales, right? So that's what you can get here easily by the smart tile name. Pretty cool, at least from my point of view, and that's how you can do it. Uh, but that's what this smart tile can give us here. And if you go in here and say you would like to see unique values here, you can see unique values, and then you need to specify unique column here. Let's say here, for instance, I'm using the region as my unique column here, and then I can simply run this again, and you'll see basically here in the output here, you see basically you get the region east here as a tile number one, you get the region north as tile number two, south as tile number three, 
and so on. Right? So we only got those three regions. But basically, now because we said the unique column is region, now in unique values here, all those uh, region values are in the same um, same tile. Okay, that's how you can do if you tick the instance of specific column and use the unique a unique value here. And manual manual simply means that as you can see here, you enter cutoffs. So basically, you can see you've got sales. Uh, between 1,000 and 10,000. So if I say, for instance, my cutoffs are, let's say, 3,000 here, and the next cutoff will be, uh, let's say, 8,000, 8,000, like that. And the first, the third one, I don't need this. I only want to have two of them, like that. And now if I can run this, I click on the Run button, and you see that now we got basically three tiles, and based on the sales figure. For instance, this first one with 8,207 is above this threshold here. So basically, it's tile number three, and this one, 2,899, is below 3,000, so obviously it's tile number 1, and tile number 2 is everything between 3,000 and 8,000, okay? So that's how you can use this manual option if you want to do that. Simply enter then the data here in each new line in this case. Okay, and as I said before, you can also group first, which we have done, for instance, in one of the previous videos. You can simply group by a column first and then work on the grouped data. That's also possible using this tile. But that's basically the main function and how you can use those tiles. And I think that's pretty cool, cool because you can classify your data in certain buckets if you want. And uh, it gives a lot of options, as we've seen here. And uh, Smart Tile is one which I personally really like because you can also get the output here as a sort of name, basically. If you remember that, you click Output Verbose Name here. And when we did this and uh, ran this, we basically got also this kind of additional information here. I personally like that because it's kind of a grouping here. Very easy to do in all tricks. Okay, so that's it for this video. As always, thanks so much for watching and hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you can use it and hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to the next video. Now this time we're going to dive into the joining operations which are available here under the join tab. And we start with the union here. So what does the union do? Well, exactly what you would suppose it does. It simply combines data, right? So let's actually take a look at uh, the example data set I've brought for you, which is games join. So you can simply drag it inside if you want to use the same one, and then you can select a sheet. And you will notice if you tick this that there are several sheets inside, like games one, two, three, and also a ranking here. So let's actually start with game one number, uh, the game one here. Okay, click OK. And we got a little data set which contains, if we run this, a small little table which got uh, different kinds of games. Here the Witcher 3, Super Mario, GTA 6. And then there's a year of their appearance and also a genre. And just by the way, this is a little bit random data, so I don't know exactly if the year matches the game itself, right? There could be issues here. And if you want to simply, you could, of course, write this to me and tell me. Um, but this is just an example. So we got this data in here, and then we would also like to have the other uh, data in here. So what I do, as I can go in here, and then I would like to do use this another time in here, like that, just to show you the join, and let's now use the game number two, so the second sheet in here, right? And click OK here, and you'll see that there's another sheet here, which is this one here, okay? And let's do that one more time. Go with the additional, go to the folder here, and drag the games join one more time inside, like that. And then, of course, we choose here another sheet, like games number three. Click OK, and now we got games one, games two, and games three. And of course, you can also run this one here, and also run this one here, and you get basically the output here, right? So in the output table here. So we've got three tables in here, which is this one here, this one here, and uh, this one here. Now, one thing to notice here is you take a closer look at the table, and that is why I kept the table so small, so it's easier easier to understand, basically, at first at starting, right? So the first table here starts with the game, then there's a year column, and then there's a genre, okay? Then the next one here starts actually with the year, right? And um, then there's a title, which is not spelled correctly, so sorry for that. I would adjust this. Um, but there's a year, then there's a title, and then there's a genre, genre. So basically, now the columns are not in the same order as before, right? Like in this one. And then we have another table, which is this one, where we have year, genre, and game. So the names are the same, but uh, again, the columns are not sorted the same way. Uh, but still, Alteryx is still powerful enough to union them correctly. So if we drag the union tool now into here, our canvas, on the canvas, we can see that we at first need to connect data. So let's actually start with the first one here and drag this inside. And let's do the third one first. You'll see in a minute why. So if we connect those two, we know already that the first one here has game, year, and genre as their column headers. And the second one here has year, genre, and game. So the column headers are actually the same names. 
the, the order is different, but the names are the same. And that's something we can specify in the union tool. Here, for instance, by default, it sets auto configure by name. So as long as the column names are the same, this configuration of the union tool would simply then choose the specific columns based on their names, and as long as the name matches, no matter the order, the names will be unioned, right? So that's fine. So if we click on run here, we'll see as an output, of course we need to take it first, now, but now we see that we got our game names here, so Witcher 3, Super Mario, GTA 6, Zelda, Bioshock and Uncharted here, just as ex example games. And we see the year and the genre. So even though, and you see it starts here with the game, this order will be kept, and even though the order here is different, it still is able to configure out that correctly, right? And order this correctly. So that's what it does. And just by the way, if you want to start with the third here, you also have the option to change the output order. So you can simply tick this here, and then you see if you tick number two and put this upward, then you basically start with the second, so with this table, and then you choose this table. But what if we have something like that? Now we have the year, then the title and the genre. So basically now the columns are different, right? So that means that the union is not able now to use auto configure by name. But what we also have are different kinds of options. For instance, for instance auto configure by position or manually configure fields. So auto configure by position would simply mean that as long as the positions are the same, even if the column headers differ, it would simply make the right join, right? So, or union in this case, sorry, the union. Because here, for instance, if I take this one here, that does not work. Because you can see that the year is currently in the first column, right? And here, in this case, the year is not in the first column. So basically our output here, which is this one here, has the game in the first column. So that's not working for us, this uh, auto configure uh, by position. As well as auto configure by name doesn't work because we get a different name for, in this case, the game, right? So what we also have is the option to manually configure field names. So if you take this one, you basically see then, of course, let's actually connect this first, so union all three of them, like that, and now you can see we got those three here with column one, column two, and column three, and the column four in this case, because there's also a title column, and now we can simply then move them. For instance, you can say the title column is actually the game column. So I can put this like that, I move that like that, and then I say the year should be here, and then for the genre, it should be here, right, like that. And then you can see now, even though this this column here has a uh, column header as title, and these are games, and even though they are different considering the order, you can manually set them like that with the, those arrows here. And of course, you can also reset if you want to go back to original output. But that would be the case. And then of course, you can again check this here, set specific output order, or untick this. If you want to do, I stick with the default one, I go with the one on top here, and then I simply uh, put this here untick this and then I can simply uh, go in here, untick this one and you see it's configured correctly and now if you run this, click on the run button here, now if you take a look at the output here, you see that now we got all three records for each of the three tables, so in total nine records and they're also ordered correctly, so it's sorted correctly. So all the game names are now in column number one, all the years column number two and all the genres in column number three. So that's how you can use this union tool here. So it's pretty powerful because it not only allows basically to configure by name or position. So of course, if it's possible, then I would use those because it's much easier and less work. But if that's not possible and the names are different and the columns are different, you still have the option to use this manually configure fields, which is really, really cool and powerful. So that's it for the union tool. Hopefully that was understandable and hopefully you can use this in your own workflows. As always, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, best guy. Hello and welcome back. Now this time we're going to dive into the find and replace tool and I'm going to show you a little example how we can use it. So at first I need to find this tool, which is this one, and you can see I still got the workflow from the last video. So we will continue using this workflow. So I simply use the find and replace. I can then select it and I can drag it on the screen here and you see it has two inputs, which is this F and an R. The F simply search for find, so where should the tool look? in the find, so this is the finding input, and replace input simply gives the tool the replacement. And it basically works like a dictionary, you can think of it like a dictionary. So basically what we do is we use this as an input, so we drag this in the finding, and say basically we take a look at our current data set, the union data set, and here for instance we have this genre column, right, which is role play, jump and run, action and so on. And like so on, yes. And what we want to do is we want to use abbreviations. So instead of, for instance, role play, we simply want to have RP here. And instead of jump and run, we would simply say J and R. 
and action will be A, and finally adventure will be AD, right? Simply an abbreviation instead of the whole names here. And that's what we can do. And there are two options for this replace input. So either you have already a table, for instance an Excel table or a table from a SQL server or any other kind of database, and then you can use this one as an input, or you can do it like we do it here, simply manually by go to in and output here and simply say we would like to have a manual text input. Okay, so we can drag this inside like that. And then of course we can simply create our two columns here. Let's say we have our original column, say original, original, like that. And then we have another column, which is the abbreviation, abbreviation, like that. And then we can simply say, okay, our original values are action. And for action, we would like to have an A as an abbreviation. Then we had adventure, adventure, and adventure should be an AD. And then we had uh, role play, role play, like that. And then of course we go in here and say we would like to have an RP, RP. And then finally what we had jump and run. So let's say we had uh, jump and run. And I'm, this is on purpose. I write it in capital letters. And then I say I want to have this as G and R, right? Like that. So I have original column as well as abbreviation column. Okay, so far so good. And of course now we can use this as an input to the replace column in here, okay, like that. And now we can take this find the replace tool and of course we need to configure it. By default, it has already picked some fields, but we can make, need to make sure whether this is correct. So at first, we can specify how it should find data. So considering the data input from this union tool, okay, we want to find, but not in the game column, we want to refer to the genre column. So you can see here two columns here, and this find and replace tool works on, in this case, on uh, string values, so in text values, so you, that's why you don't find, for instance, a year here, right? Because here, for instance, you can see that we all the, also had this uh, the output here, we all the had, also had the year column, but here it only t picks up the, the game and the genre, right? If you tick on here, you can see, you can search for game or genre here. We're searching in the genre column, and within this column, we only search at the beginning of the field, any part of the field, or the entire field. In this case, we say any part of the field, right? So that's what we want to find. So please search for something, and then what is the find value? Well, the find value here comes from this second table, from the replace, and that is why I said at the beginning, it's you can think of it like a dictionary, because what we have here are two columns. We have a lookup column, which is our original, and we have a replacement column, which is the abbreviation. So if you go back to this one here, you say simply go to in our union, in this input, in the finding, search in the genre column, find, in this case, the original value, and please then replace it with the abbreviation, which is this one, right? In case Alteryx has not picked up this correctly, of course you simply need to specify the, the correct column you have. Or in this case, it already works exactly the way it is. And then we can simply say, okay, you replace multiple found items, also true. Um, just leave it checked as a default one. And let's actually take a look at the output, right? Let's click on the run button here and take a look. And you'll see that here we have replaced the values, right? So instead of role play, we have RP. Instead of action, we have A. And instead of AD, we have uh, adventure, we have AD. But the jump and run, of course, was not replaced. So why is that? Remember, that is why at the beginning, I wrote this in capital letters, just to show it to you. Now you see that by default, it has not been replaced, but we can, we can basically uh, force this. Because here we have the option to do a case insensitive find and also match whole words only. There's also something you might want to specify if you only want to replace the exact words and not only parts of those. But for in this, our case, the case sensitive, insensitive find is exactly what we need. So we can tick this here and then we can run our find and replace one more time. So if you click on the run button now, you see that for the output now, the jump and run has also been replaced. So even though it was in capital letters, Near here we do a case insensitive match or find, and because of that we also replace the jump and run to J and R because here we have capital letters, but in original data set we, do, we did not have them, right? The jump and run was uh, written in small letters. But that's how we can use this find and replace tool. So basically it's kind of a dictionary which you can use either by using manually enter data like we did here, if you have a small table that works, or if you have already a dictionary table or a replacement table in some data source like an Excel file or any kind of database, then of course you can use this as well. Works exactly the same way, okay? So that's it for this video and the find and replace. Hopefully that was helpful and hopefully as always you can use this in your own workflows. So thanks for your attention and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to this video and this time we're going to dive into the append tool and append fields it's called and here I have to warn you at the beginning it, because it's really really um, yeah careful to use if you use it because 
but basically does it, it gives us the Cartesian product. In case you don't know what the Cartesian product is, basically what you do is you join each record from the first data set to each record of the second data set. And this simply means if you have, for instance, two data sets with a thousand entries each, you would get an output of one million rows, 1000 times 1000. So that is why I say you have to be really careful when you use it, because this can explode your data set. Okay, so I'll give you a little example here. Let's actually use the games here. We have this first games, remember, from our last uh, workflows. So we can simply drag this inside. And just in case you're wondering, there's a T and an S. That simply means there's a target and a source. In this case, it doesn't matter which one you connect to which one. So I simply connect hits to the target and then a second one like this one to the source like that. Okay, and you can, as you can see here, we got here three entries, which is Witcher 3, Super Mario and GTA 6. And here we got uh, additional three entries, like in this case, uh, Red Dead Redemption, Mario Kart, and Call of Duty. And now if you do here the Cartesian product, so basically this uh, append fields, and run this, what we basically get here as an output are nine data entries, right? So we got nine fields, and you can see that The Witcher is now appearing three times, Super Mario is appearing three times, and GTA 6 is also appearing three times. Why is that? Because each entry so Red Dead Redemption, as well as Mario Kart, as well as Call of Duty. So all those three entries from the second data source are com connected to each entry of the first data source. So basically joining everything with everything, if you want to call it this way. And that's why you get nine entries. So three times three is equal to nine. Okay, And that is why I say you have to be really careful. Well, because let's think of you have a, a sales table with uh, 10 10,000 records and you have another table um, and you append those tables and another table has a thousand records and you have 10,000 times thousand entries. And so you have re really have to be careful using this tool. Just wanted to mention that. Um, when should you use it actually? This is not a good use case for that. A better use case would be the following. Let me actually remove this one here. And let's actually remove this completely and use it another time. Drag it one more time inside. But this time I'm using my games join one more time. So I go to my folder here and there's my games join. And I drag this inside like that. And here we also have another, which is this ranking here. The ranking table itself, if you click on OK or this ranking sheet and you run it, you'll see that this had only one entry here. And if you run this now, you'll see that the table, oh, sorry for that, that's simply because we have not connected anything. But if you click on this one here, you see that the output here is simply one entry, which is simply, in this case, simple cell, which contains the score, which is five stars. And if you say all the games are five stars, just an example, that's when you can use the pen tool pretty good. Because what you do is you simply go to the pen tool here, and then you simply say my target, for instance, is this first one here, and see the source is this one here. Again, it doesn't matter which you connect to which input here. And then you run the append tool, like run here. You'll see that now the output from this here is that you got five stars for each of those different games. Because in the second data set here, in the second, which you can connect to the append fields, you only have one entry. And that simply means as if you have this kind of combination, then this one entry gets appended to each row in the first data set. Okay? And that is the best use case, at least from my point and what I can think of for this append tool. So if you have one entry here, like for instance, you have, you have the sales numbers here in your first data set, and then you have the total sales figure in your second data set, and you want to join but, or combine this, the total sales number in a separate column to the first data set, then this would be a good use case for that. Okay? So that's how you can use it. So hopefully that helps. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you then in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello, and welcome back to this video. And this time we're going to cover the Make Group um, tool, which is available here under Join. And this is actually a tool which I personally don't use too often, but I'd like to show you what it can do for you, just in case you need this one day. So let me actually use an example here. And this example is this friends list here. So here we go. We import this. And here are the friends. And let's click OK. And probably you're disappointed because you can't find Ross and Rachel there. So just an insider joke. But um, of course, we got two different columns here, which is friend A and friend B. And in our data set here, if I run this, you'll see that we got, for instance, Daenerys Targaryen again. We got Jon Snow, Sheldon Cooper, and so on. So unfortunately, I can't make this a bigger on screen, but you need to follow along that you'll see the same values, hopefully, as I do here. So basically, what we have is we have a friend A and a friend B. And each of the friends A is connected to a friend B, right? For instance, Daenerys Targaryen's friend is Jon Snow. Now, th the point here is that the interesting thing is Jon Snow here as number five is also a friend of Tyrion Lannister. And the idea behind this make group tool here is that if Daenerys Targaryen is a friend of Jon Snow, 
and Jon Snow is a friend of Tyrion Lannister, then also Daenerys Targaryen is a friend of Tyrion Lannister. So that is how that works. So basically it's kind of, the May group really creates, let's say, friend groups, okay? Um, basically connecting those, all those who are connected in this case, right? So if I go back in here, so if a friend has a connection to a friend B, and this friend B has a connection to another friend C, then friend A and friend C are also connected. That is the idea behind that. And showing those connections, that is what this tool can do for you. So you simply specify the keys. It doesn't matter actually, in this case at least, which is first key and which is the second key, but you can run it. And if you click the run button here, you can take a look at the output here, you see that, let me click it one more time, you see that the output here, the Daenerys Targaryen now is friend to the Daenerys Targaryen itself, as to herself, then also to Jon Dorian, to Jon Snow, and to Tyrion Lannister. So why is that? So there are three different persons, Jon Dorian, Jon Snow, and Tyrion Lannister. And the reason is, if I go back in here, you can see that Daenerys Targaryen is friend of Jon Snow. Okay. Then she's friend of herself. Okay. Then Jon Snow is friend of Tyrion Lannister. So Daenerys is also friend of Tyrion Lannister. Okay. And then Tyrion Lannister is friend to Jon Dorian. And that is why Daenerys Targaryen is also friend to Jon Dorian. Because Daenerys Targaryen is friend of Jon Snow. Jon Snow is friend of, uh, of Tyrion Lannister. And Tyrion Lannister is friend of Jon Dorian. So that is why Daenerys Targaryen is also friend of Jon Dorian. So that's how this tool work, uh, works. And maybe you need to use this one day, or you ha already have a use case for it. I personally don't have a use case too often for that, but I just want to show you how you can use it. And hopefully that was clear. Also, the same is true here for the second group, which is all belonging to Added Stock here. So Added Stock is, in this case, associated to Added Stock. Also to Howard Wolowitz, Penny, Raj Kutrapali, and Sheldon Cooper. And again, the reason or the logic is exactly the same. If you take a look at this, so Eddard Stark is friend of Penny. Okay, then Penny is also friend of Raj, so Eddard is friend of Raj. Then Raj is friend of Howard, so Eddard is friend of Howard. And uh, did I miss someone? Yeah, Sheldon Cooper is friend of Penny. And because Eddard is friend of Penny, Eddard is also friend of Sheldon Cooper. So that's how that works. Okay, and this is basically then the output you get, and you can work with those outputs if you want, right? So how that that's the way it works. But this is it for the make group uh, tool in Alteryx. Okay, so that's that. As always, hopefully that helps, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back. Now let's do a quick dive into the fuzzy match tool, which is available also under the join tab here in Alteryx. So what we can do is we can simply choose one of the data sets, and here I have my fuzzy friends. So let's drag this inside fuzzy friends, and then select one of the sheets. In this case, we only have one sheet, so we can only select friends in here. So we take this. If you have a specific range, of course, you can select this here as well. So click OK, and here is our data. So we get a sales rep here, and in a second, we got the sales numbers in here. Okay. And what you might see, I can run this here, then you can also see down there, but you might see that the, the names actually repeating themselves, but they have a small differences in the spelling. For instance, here I got Tyrion Lannister with a double N and a Y, for instance, for Tyrion. Here, for instance, I have Tyrion Lannister with only one N, and then here, for instance, I have Tyrion Lannister with an I instead of a Y here written, right? Or I have, in this case, John Dorian with an H, and then I have John Dorian without an H. And these kinds of things. Or Penny here with one N and here with double N, okay? So I got spelling issues or differences. And I would like to find, actually, those inside my data set. And this is where this fuzzy match tool can help us. Because you can simply drag this inside and connect it, and then you get this configuration window here, and there are two modes here. There's a merge and purge mode. The purge is the default one. The merge wo mode would be interesting if you have a second data source. So basically, um, if you want to compare records from one data source to another data source, then you would simply tick this merge option here. Please keep in mind the following here. Uh, we can see that this tool only allows one input. So to use this merge here, so two basically two inputs or two data sources, you would first have to join them, or union them, sorry, not join, but union them together. So would, you would union your both data sources, and then you need an identif identifier column, which tells you here exactly, okay, based on this specific source ID field, I, um, Alteryx can then differ differentiate between those two data sources, even though they are both in the same data source, in the same input here, okay? Um, but that's maybe a little bit too much. At the beginning, the main idea is that if you have more or when you use more data sources than only one, you would have to first have to union them and also this union needs to have an identifier column which data source belong to which of those two. But back to the topic here, we simply use the purge mode because we want to comp 
pair all records and they are all coming from the same data source from this one here and then you can specify okay what exactly here's a record ID field uh, that's the sales rep okay um, if you have another one in this case we don't have this but actually go with the we don't have a record ID let's actually first input a record ID okay so before we do this we use one of the tools we already have so we go in here and then I'm gonna go with my record ID and a great thing here by the way we haven't done that so far you can see those two are currently connected but I can also go in here and drag this in between like that and now it's inside of those and I want to add a record ID that's fine let me actually maybe get rid of this one first and let's actually run this first like that okay and then let's actually combine them again like that okay and now I go in here and say this the record ID itself will be the record ID okay and then I need to specify here a matching field now the matching field here it will be the field name and here I simply select this is the sales rep right because we have sales rep where the spelling differentiates a little bit and then you can specify the match style the custom one could work but it depends on your data source right and what you what you want to compare if you compare for instance addresses you would go with the address here or if you compare names in our case we have names so we can use names here if you have phone numbers you want to compare and some of them for instance have this parentheses which you probably know or have spaces and other ones have don't have those spaces then you would go with the phone so if you select something specific here then alterx has it easier to really spot um, commonalities and find uh, fuzzy matching than records which belong together so that's why we go with the name here so go in name here and that's basically it and then under advanced options you also have the option then to add additional outputs here for instance an output match score that could be interesting and also let's go with the keys here okay that's totally fine you'll use those two just an example to just see what you get and now you can see it's configured correctly and now we can run it let's click on the run button here and we're done and you'll see from the output now we have basically here the record IDs here five and eight and also a match score between them and also a matching key so you can see record ID five matches to record ID eight here with a 100% score so let's go back in here I have five and eight so basically of the recording here the record five was John Snow and the record eight again was John Snow that's why the matching here is 100 and um, if you go back in here you see that for instance then we have 10 11 have a matching score of 97 so let's take a look at what 10 11 records are so if you go inside here you see the 10th was John Dorian without the H and the 11th was John Dorian with the H so here you can see aha uh -huh, well 97 score was here between those two because beside one character everything is the same and that is why here the matching gives you exactly those those options here again if you don't want to generate the keys you can untake this and let's take a look at the output here you run this and then of course the output looks a little bit different here right also if you don't like to have the records but see the values you can go um, let's take this one more time click on here and say for instance the record field ID should be here let's say uh, the names so the sales rep itself and if you run this now then you won't see the numbers but you would see the the real values in here right so if you go in here for instance you see that now you see connection John Dorian to John Dorian but also for instance John Snow to John Snow and John Dorian John Dorian here John uh, Snow John Snow so it's duplicating the values here but Tyrion Lannister with Tyrion Lannister has a matching of 93 and so on so here you can see Penny with Penny is 100% but Penny with Penny with only one N is 93 and so on and based on if you go back to the matching here based on the matching threshold which you can set here you can then adjust how many records do you really want to match so the lower the threshold the more values even though they have a lot of uh, different uh, or a lot of spelling mistakes or different characters they will still combine together so that's what you can steer basically by setting different kinds of matching thresholds here so um, I would encourage you if you need this play around with it actually I also don't use this tool too often but um, maybe it's helpful to you um, then you can use it otherwise if you are familiar with regular expressions that they could also work and do the same trick with what this tool can do for you okay but that's it actually for using this uh, this tool or take a look at this joining here the fuzzy match tool um, you can use it play around with it if you need to use it otherwise I hopefully see you in the next video until then best guys hello and welcome back to this video and this time we're gonna dive into the joining operations which are of course available also under the join tab and there are basically two of them the first thing is the normal join which is this join option here and the second one is the join multiple so what's the difference well let's actually first look at the join right so of course we can drag this inside and what you see is it accepts two input a left and a right that is what this L and R are representing and then it has three outputs 
L, J and R. So that means left join, right uh, inner join here and the right join. That are the options here. Okay. So let's actually first get some data in here and I will go with my, let's say the first one is in my CSV files. I'm using one of the transactions. So I can simply drag this inside like that. And then as a second input, I need some data about the products. So let's go in here and search for products. What do we have here? Uh, just a second. Uh, there it is, the product info clean. I call it this way. I can drag it inside and it's table one. That's fine. I click OK and also get a preview in here, which is simply here we have a country, we have a product name, we have a product category, a list price, and a few additional columns here. But interesting for us, in only one, which is product cost. But interesting to us is here the country as well as the product name. And in our transactions here, we also have, in this case, a country and we have a product name. So we have two matching criteria here, two columns, and we can join the data. So basically what we want is we have here in this input some data about the product, which is in this case the price for the product as well as the production cost. And we want to put those two columns and concatenate them or basically join them, in this case not concatenate, but join them here uh, to this column here. So we know exactly, okay, for each of our sales entries here, okay, how much here was the price paid, but what was actually the production cost and um, also in this case the second one, which was the list price, okay? We want to know that. So in order to combine those, we can simply connect those two here to the left input and this one, for instance, to the right input like that. And then of course we can here click on this join um, tool here and then we have the option here. Join by record position, that's not what we want. If you need this, you can tick this here, but here we would like to join by specific fields. And we say for the left here, we have here a product name and the right is also a product name. And you can see that Alteryx automatically picks this up even though product name is here capitalized, the name, and here we have a small n, but still, because the names are the same, Alteryx is recognizing that. In case Alteryx, Alteryx had recognized something wrong, you can simply go in here and choose another column if you want. But that's correct. And then we have a second join criteria because we also have here next to the product name, the country. So tick on country here, and you see country is already picked up automatically for us. So this is basically the joining criteria, those two columns here. And then you can see here from the input, these are the left ones and these are the right ones and we also have this unknown again. It's kind of similar to if you if something remembers you to this one, this interface is probably the select tool because select tool looks kind of similar because here in the join we also have the option to change the data type of columns here. As you can see here, I only need to tick it and choose a different data type and I can also give it an alias so I can rename a specific column. For instance, if I don't like to have this question mark here in my sales, I can go in here and say these are simply sales. Press enter and I'm done, right? And I also have the option, as you can see here, those fields we are joining on them, they're automatically renamed here to right country and right product name. But of course you can also untick this because you need it for the join, but afterwards, of course, you don't want to have the country twice. We already have the country in the first data source, so we don't need it a second time in the second data source. And also the product name is already included in the first data source, right? So that's why you can untick those fields. And you can also untick other fields if you don't need them anymore. But that's it, actually. And we are done with the configuration and now we can run this here and take a look at the output here and considering the left output here, we can see that we got output from the left. So basically, uh, let me explain it to you. It's also part of the case study. So in case you choose uh, to also opt in in the other um, course of Alteryx, which I have released in, on Udemy, which is uh, about uh, a case study of energy drinks, uh, then you would uh, recognize this data. But the main point here is the following. We have here a product name, which is in this case a Venom Energy Special Edition. And this product will not be in, or is not included in the transactions. So basically we have information about the product, but we don't have, or ex excuse me, sorry, the other way around. It is not available in the product data. So we have transactions here for Venom energy special, but it's not available in the product information. So if you take a closer look at that, you won't find this product name here. And that is why it's part of the left output, because it's part of the left table, so this input here, but it's not available in the right input. And that is why it's part of the left here. Then we have the join output, which is this one. You can tick it and you can see that these are 7,407 as split of in total 35,662. So these are the matching criteria. So here we have found matching criteria based on the product name and the country. So those two are the same in the transactions and they are also available in the product. And that is why this is a join output. And you can see in the join output, you have now two additional columns, which is a list price per unit as well as the production cost per unit. So those two columns come from the right side and are simply then, um, in this case, joined to this table here. That is why they're appearing here. Okay, And you have now both of them together in one data source. 
before. Before, you didn't have those two, as you can see here, but afterwards, you have two additional columns, which are these ones, which come from the second table. And the right is exactly the opposite. So this basically is contains information about a product, which in this case is called Rockstar Energy uh, Zero Sugar in Belgium, or Rockstar Green Apple here in Austria, and for the combination of country and product name. This combination is not available in transactions, okay? This combination here, at least in this specific file here, April 2019. And that is why those entries here, those six entries, are appearing here in the right output. Because based on the join criteria on those two columns, they are appearing in here, but they are not appearing in here, okay? And that is why this is the right output. Again, I think it's a great thing in Alteryx that the right and the left join are here also available for us. So just in case you want to work with them, you can use them. And just in case you are a little bit more advanced with joins or you know joins already, then if you want to have something like um, a left order join, that simply means all the records from the left table as well as the records which are matching, so inner join. What you would basically do is you would then have to m union them together, okay? To get the left and the inner join, you simply use a union tool and you combine those two together and then you have a left uh, order join. The same is true for the right order join. In case you don't know what I'm talking you about right now, it doesn't matter. It's not not that important. Okay? But that's it, basically, for this joining option here. So that's the joining. And then we also have this join multiple, because one thing which you probably noticed already, or just in case you did not, let's talk about that, you only have two inputs here. As you can see here, you only can connect two inputs to this join operation. That means if you have uh, then the next joining, so a third table you want to join, you would probably do the following. You would use a join tool again, and then you would use, for instance, if you want to work with the inner join, you use the inner join as your data source, and then you have another data source, a third one, and you connect this as the right input, and then you do the next join, okay? So you can basically use several joins after each other, that's possible, but what you can also do is you can use this join multiple tool here. The join multiple tool, if I drag this on the screen, you can see it has this uh, two arrows here, and two arrows always uh, symbolize that you can connect several outputs to it, okay? So let's try that. I have also a data source for that prepared, which is, uh, let's see, um, should be about games. Um, where is it? Let's show change date. There are join games, there it is. Okay, let me drag it inside, like that. And you can see, select a sheet. Okay, I'm going with games, I click OK. And basically, this is the first one. And what I will do then is, because I need it twice, two more times, I can either drag it two more times on the screen, or what I can also do is, I can go in here, Control C, Control V to copy, uh, and Control V to copy one more time, and now I have it three times. Uh, but so far, they all referring, of course, to the same sheet. Because if you take this here, you can see that table or query is in this case the games here. But I need to change this, so I go to the second one here, and say, for this now, I don't want to have the, the games sheet in this Excel file, I want to have another one. So I click on this, and you can see that with this window appears, which you're already familiar with, and now we can say, instead of the game sheet, I'd like to have the platform here. So click on platform, click OK. And then for the third one, click on this one and click on the three dots here and say this one, uh, not the game, not the platform, but the price. The price, okay? Click OK. And now you have them. And you can see if you click on those, get a preview, uh, they all have an ID, in this case a platform ID and a platform. And here, for instance, I have a game ID and a game. And for the last one here, I have a price ID and a price. And basically what I want to do is, what we would like to achieve here is the following. We want to combine the price with the platform with the game, okay? Again, it's a really simple table, I know that, but the main idea is really that the easier the table, the easier it is to explain and also to understand, right? At least that's my point of view. So we can simply then use this multiple join here and simply connect all of them. So drag this inside, and then we drag this inside, and then finally we drag this inside like that, okay? And then we click on it, and you can see that's what the configuration looks like. So it looks a little bit different, so that's the first thing. You can either now join by record position or again joined by specific fields. And most of the time, at least considering the join nodes, I would always use specific fields here because that's probably most of the time I've used because you have a unique identifier. In our case, we have an ID which we can match those. Now, the first input we have here, we can simply click on this, I have a game ID. And here in the second input, I have a platform ID. And finally, in the third here, I have another, which is the price ID. And based on the ID here, it's, I will join my data. And of course, if you have additional fields, you can then use the next field if you want. And also click on the minus if you want to remove one uh, again. So basically that's the only join field we have, but we have now three inputs here. Okay, that's fine. And here again, you can adjust here what exactly you want to have. 
um, the input itself here, what is the field name, you can rename it, you can change the data type, and so on. So all this is possible, and let's actually run this. Click on the run button here, click on run, and you'll see as an output here, now we get the game ID and all three games, we got the platforms, as well as the platform ID and the price ID and the price. And actually remove the IDs because we don't need them tr uh, three times, so we can click on site and say, don't show the platform ID and don't show the price ID. We only need the ID one time, that's fine, that's enough, and we join on the IDs up here, but we don't need it in the output. So we can run this one more time, and now we can see if we tick this, that now we only have the game ID left here, and then we have the game, the platform, and the price. And this allows us then to join our data based on a specific field. In this case, we have the ID here, which we use as a joining criteria. Also note that the output is different, right? So that's also one thing you have to consider. Um, here, this node allows us to com connect several, so more than two, um, input sources here, because the two arrows here. However, we only get the inner join as an output. So it's not as flexible as here, where we also have a right join as well as a left join. So basically here, we lose this data. We only keep the, the inner joins. So if you don't want to lose any data here, what you would do is exactly what we have talked about before. You would lose another join here, and use then the, not the left input, let me actually remove it, but you use the inner join here from this one and choose an, a third data source and connect it to the left one and then you would have again all three output criteria here, okay? So that's how you do it. So if you only need the inner join and you have several data sources, you can use this. If you need to have the left and the right joins, so basically the criteria which does not match, and you have several data sources, then you would use several of those normal joins, okay? So that's it. So hopefully that was understandable. Hopefully you enjoyed it as well. Always thank you for watching and I wish you all the best. See you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to this video. Now this time we're gonna dive into the parsing options which are available in Alteryx. And specifically we're gonna dive into the date time, the regex, as well as here the text to columns, so those three. The XML, maybe we'll take a look at this later because you won't use this too often, but maybe it might be hand helpful if you do web scraping. But for now, we're gonna cover those three because those are probably often used. So let's dive into that. Okay, at first we need some data and let me go inside here. I have this parsing file here. So let's actually put this into Alteryx like that and then we need to specify the sheet. Now, within the data source itself, we have three different sheets, which is date, games and regex. So the date will be an example for the date time, the games for the text to columns, and finally the regex example would be an example for the regex expression here, so for the parsing tool. Okay, let's start with the date here. So click on date, click OK, and here we are. So basically we got some string values here, and they are currently not dates. And we can simply check that if we go to the preparation option here, and go to, let's say, where is it? the select tool here and we can take it here and you can see that currently it's a string, okay? And if you try to, let's go in here and say I'd like to convert this to a date, like that, take on date here, and then we run it, we probably run into errors. As you can see here, this is not a valid date. So obviously we got here conversion errors, so that did not work. So if that is the case, if that happens to you, what should you do? As you can see here, we got null values as an output because it's not, Alteryx is not able by default to interpret this as a date with the underscores. So what you can do is you can simply remove this here and say instead of using the select tool directly you can go back to the parse tool and you can use date time. Now if you drag date time inside and connect those you see that you got various options here. At first you need to specify do you want to convert a date time to a string or do you want to convert a string to a date time. So basically string means text. And the second option is here suggested by default and that's exactly what we want to do. Because we have a string value and Alteryx has recognized that. It has recognized that the parsing here, the date, is currently a string. So I only can give you the option to convert the string to date. Okay, so then we need to select the, and this is the string field, so the column. In this case, we only have one, so we can only select dates here. And then we can specify here the new column name for the output. You can see here, this is then date time out. Of course, you can rename it if you like. In this case, I leave the default one here. Also specify your date time language. You can also specify it here, English or other kind of languages. There are various available here. And then you need to some, uh, specify exact matching. And this is something which is really, really helpful here. You can also use, by the way, using uh, the formula tool to do this. It works also it's exactly the same way because there's also a date formulas in, in there. But here I would uh, like actually do it in this tool because that's why it's for. Um, so what you do is you simply specify, instead of using one of the default ones, which are available by here, you can simply select one of them. But what you want to do instead, you want to go to custom. Because we have a custom format here. Remember, we have this underscores here. We have year, 
underscore, then month underscore, and then we have the day. So what we do here is we can simply go in here and say we have want to have the year. And in order to get the year, simply take a look at the examples up there. The year are four letters, four Ys, but they are all in small letters. So you simply go to specify here and simply type in four Ys. And uh, as soon as you do this, do that, you get an example here down there. Okay, the year okay is recognized. Then you put in an underscore because we have underscores in our date format. And then you say the month. You can also see that the month here, the two M's are capitalized. So simply type in two months here, months like that. And then finally an underscore again, and then you go with the day format. And again, the days are in small letters. You type in two Ds and then you get the format. So year underscore, month underscore, and then day, right? And as soon as you've done this, you can simply click the run button. And you see you're done. You see the date uh, time out. You can see it looks different. It lo has a dash in between. And if we take a look, just to make sure it worked, we go to the select option, we connect it, and we can see that here, the date time, here is a date format, right? So this is the date, so the new column, by the way. If I make this bigger, you can see that date time out is a date format, while the date is still a string format. But of course, we can simply remove it here with the select tool if we want. But this is the option, or this is what we can do, basically, with this, this configuration here, using the under the parse here, the date time. So if you have a string value, and you're not able to convert it directly into a date format, then use this date time option here, this date time parse tool. It's really helpful for that. You can specify exactly what kind of year, what kind of uh, structure your date uh, column has. So even if there are special special characters like this underscore or any other kind of characters, you can define it here. Or you use one of the default ones if those work for you. Okay, so that's basically it for the date um, time parsing tool. So the next time parsing tool, let's go with the text to columns. Probably most of you know this from Excel, for instance. So if you put this inside and we need this I, uh, this input again. So let me go to the folder here and let me actually drag this inside. But this time we don't use the date, we use the regex here, okay? Uh, sorry, the games, that's what I meant. Uh, click OK, and here's the connection. And okay, here we can see we got Super Mario, then a dash, then Nintendo, then dash, and then 2020, and then GTA 6, dash PS5, dash 2021, and Star Wars, dash Xbox, dash 2019, okay? So we got the values here, and we basically want to split those values based on the dash we have in between. Uh, pretty simple, and probably most of you are familiar with that. So what we could do is we can simply select it here, and then we can simply configure it. So we say, what is the column we want to split? Well, it's the name column, and it's actually the only column we have. Then what is the delimiter? In our case, it's basically not a comma, which is the default one. We have a dash, right? So simply type in a dash in here, and then you can basically select, do you want to split to columns? and how many columns do you want to have. So that's also an option here. So you can simply say, I only want to have, for instance, the first two columns, and then all the rest, even though there are several dashes after that, simply put this all in an extra column, right? You can do that if you want. In our case, we know exactly that there are two dashes in our example. So we can simply say, we want to have three columns here and simply split on the dash. So we got three output columns. And uh, then you have also the advanced, op advanced options here, where you can say you want to ignore delimiters in quotes, ignore the in single quotes, and so on. Just in case you need this when you split your text to columns, these are the options you can simply take, right? In our case, it's not necessary, but you can simply take them. And then let's actually click the Run button here and take a look. And at the output here, you can see down there, we got now Super Mario, Nintendo, and 2020, right? So we split them, all those names here, based on the dash, and now we have the game title in the first column, then we have the uh, with the platform in the second column, and then the year of the release in the third column. Again, it's just random values here, uh, but this would be one option to use this basically text to column tools. And uh, what's the great thing here, at least from my point of view, is that this is more flexible than, for instance, in Excel, because in Excel you can also do it like that, but what you can't do in Excel, at least not with only one tool, you could do it probably with transpose, anything like that, but you can't do it immediately with text to columns, is you can also click this. So instead of splitting to columns, you have the option, even if it's called text to columns, you can split into rows. So you can take this split into rows, then you don't have the option basically to select how many rows do you want or how many columns do you want, like three, and then all the rest in the third in the fourth column, for instance, because it simply splits the rows and gives you all the data. So if you take this one, and click on the run button, click on run, you'll see that now you only have one column here, and it simply has Super Mario, then the platform, and then the year. And then it starts with the next one, it has the game title, the platform, and the year. And then it starts with the third one, game title, platform, and year. Okay? So basically you split, instead of two columns, you split your data into one row, like that. 
and you also then have a different kind of output because you don't have the original column anymore and also you only have um, as I said one uh, column in here okay so that's how you use this text to columns pretty powerful because as I said before you have the option to either split into columns or rows and this is oftentimes very helpful okay um, and also mention I like to mention this one more time in case you need this because you have specific data and there are single quotes and so on and you don't want to split on those um, you have the option to simply take one of those advanced options okay finally the regex tool so let's dive into that um, just go in here and drag it inside I like that and then we also need some input and we use the second the same input as before but this time the final table in this Excel file so I drag this inside and this time I'll simply choose the regex here I click OK and now I have a, already a connection here and you can see I got different kinds of home pages in here and just by the way these are random values I simply come up with those I don't think they exist if they do um, I don't know but uh, it's not it's really just some uh, ideas I came up with alterix minus energydrinks.com uh, alterix is cool.com and cleaning data with alterix.com okay so these are the home pages and what we would like to do with uh, regex here is simply we want to extract the values in between so we want to get rid of this HTTPS double points slash slash www and dot and also the dot com at the end. We only want to have the names in here, right? So that would be one option how we can use this uh, this regex tool. And if you are really good with regex, you can do a lot of them. I just want to give you a brief introduction on how to use them. So if you click on it, you can see that you need to first specify a column. In our case, we only have one, so you can only select this one. But of course, if you have a table with a lot of columns, then you specify the exact column you want to use. Then you can enter a regular uh, reg regex here, uh, the regular expression, and you can also specify you want to have a case sen insensitive or sensitive, and then also the output method. The output method is imp interesting because here there are various output methods here, like replace, for instance, tokenize, parse, and match, and these other ones. So replace is pretty easy. Let's say we are searching for a regular, a regular expression. So in case you don't know one, I simply give you an example as the um, let's go with the backslash w. Backslash W simply means that any kind of um, char, any kind of word character, no digits, okay, only um, only text like ABC and so on, okay. That's what W uh, slash W stands for. And if you say you want to have a replacement here, you can simply type in any replacement text. So let's say, for instance, I'd like to uh, use here a zero, for instance, and okay, we are done. And you can see it's configured. And now if we run this and take a look at the output, you basically see that down there maybe it's small, I know, but if you try it yourself, you will realize it on your screen that basically here you replaced any kind of uh, character here with a number. So basically with number zero. So the HTTPS, um, then the also www and so on, and also .com, everything is replaced by zeros, as you can see here, right? The only thing not replaced are, for instance, the double points, the double slashes, and also the dashes, because these are not covered by the, um, what we had here in the configuration by this w, uh, backslash w, okay? These are only, um, well, basically uh, characters, so. Okay, so that's that, that's replace method. Then the next thing is the tokenize option, Tokenize option means um, how do you want to basically split the data? So, for instance, we could say um, our reg 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 uh, regular expression, sorry for that, is simply now, for instance, we search for, uh, let's say actually search for, uh, use it maybe also, keep it as a backslash w, and let's say one or more, so we can simply type in a plus in here as well, and then we say here with tokenize, we have the option to split to columns and we also specify the number of columns. And you'll see why th th this is important because now if we run this, click on the run button here and take a look at the output here, like that, you'll see that here we have split it, basically HTTPS, then there's a double point which is not covered by this w, um, backslash w plus. That is why then we split it in the next, then comes the www and then comes the homepage alterix or alterix school or cleaning data with alterix. But please notice that, for instance, Alteryx dash, the dash energy here, the dash is not covered by this backslash plus. That is why it's basically um, end ending here at Alteryx. And because we only set three here, that is why we only get three output columns here. If we specify, for instance, five and run it again, like that, then you'll see, if I take a look at this one again here, you'll see that now we get here additional columns like energy and drinks. And of, because there are no any further columns here for the uh, th second and the third one, you got null entries in here. But this would be a one way how to split this, for instance, right? And the .com is here still not included, as you can see here. Okay, so that would be an option how you can tokenize it. Tokenize based on the specific regular expression you enter here. Now, the next thing is the parse and the match. 
Now let's actually first cover the match here, because the match really means that is this regular expression here exactly as we specified here, does it match what we find in here? So let's actually do that. Let me actually run this here one more time, and you see I got false here, because this really searches exactly for this pattern. And the pattern here is not available, because we only also got HTTPS, double point, slash, slash, and so on. So if you want to really, you have really have to search for the exact pattern. Like, I'm gonna show you how what I mean. So basically, let's say we are searching for HTTPS, then a double point, then a slash, slash, and then we say we would like to have www dot, and now we're searching for um, here a group, so that's why I'm using the parenthesis. Then I open the brackets and I'm searching for, let's say, um, backslash w, then a plus, or so backslash w, or a dash to also cover the first entry here. And then I close this here, uh, like that, and I close my group here, and then I say dot com, for instance, like that. This matches, and of course I forgot something, I need to also put just a second here, a uh, plus, because I want to have one character or more, or one dash or more, and so on, right? So, to cover that. And now if we run this again, let's click on the run button here, you see that now we got true as an output, not false anymore, because this is the exact pattern which gets all the different kinds of home pages in here, right? If you would remove, just to show you, to you, if I remove the, the, the dash here, and I run this again, then basically I get two, um, well, two hits here for the second and the third one, but the fir first one is wrong because I got dashes inside and the backslash w is not covering the dashes. But let's say I'm using the dashes one more time like that, and I run this, and you'll see I got three times two. And now let's actually cover the last method. That is why I wanted to show you the match first, because the parse is really meaning that we want to parse something. Here you can specify the name of the output, wh what you want to parse. The expression is set based what we have specified here. You can enter a different name if you want, and also the data type, but the data type is string. The name for me is fine now, it's not that important. More important is what we get as an output. So if we run this, I click on the run button here one more time, and now you can see that as an output here, as a reg regex here, we get exactly the value in between. So we get exactly the group, like alterix minus energy minus strings, or alterix is cool here, or cleaning data with alterix here. So basically, we get exactly the values in between this HTTPS double point slash slash www dot and then also at the end the dot com. So that's, those gets removed. Of course you can also get this by using a replace uh, in the in the formula tool for instance, other kinds of option, options, but I just wanted to show you how this regex um, basically works. So if you're already familiar with regex, you can use this uh, pretty easy, like here. If not, you might want to try them because they're really, really powerful and really, really helpful, um, but it's not the only way to get the same result as we got here, okay? So that's it for these parsing tools. Hopefully that was interesting, hopefully you understood what we did. I just want to encourage you, try it out yourself, especially this converting dates is oftentimes really, really helpful, as well as this text to columns. Um, if you use this, for instance, into split into rows, because this is also something I really, really like, because it's not available by default in Excel, but here it is available by default, if you want to do it. And the regex tool, of course, is a really, really powerful tool, in case you are familiar with regex, of course. That's, of course, a, a requirement for that. Okay, so that's it for this video. Hopefully, you were able to, uh, you enjoyed the video. Hopefully, you were able to follow along. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to the next video. And now we're gonna dive into the transform options we have in Alteryx. And we start with the arrange here, as well as with the count records, so the first two in this video. So let's do that. At first, take a look at the data set. In this case, I've provided one, which is the streaming XLSX, and I dr drag it inside. And yes, I want to have the sheet, in this case, streaming services. Of course, you could also go in here, select the range if you need that, but in our case, we simply use the whole sheet and then you simply click OK. And by default, you can see a little preview here of the data. Again, it's a small data set, but it's much easier to understand what basically happens with the tools we have. So in the first column, we have the ID, we have a service one, as well as a service two, and we have a price one and price two, right? You can also run this, or click the run button, or press shortcut, and then you can see down there what the table looks like. So it's a little bit strange as a table, because you have two services, but they are not in the same column, right? And you also have two prices here, and also not in the same column. And this is where, basically, this A range option, or this tool, can help us. Because, let's drag this on the screen. What it does, basically, is it allows us to transpose or rearrange our rows and columns. That's basically what it does. I have to admit that I don't use it too often, but uh, let me show you what you could do if you need it. So let's actually combine those two, like that, 
And as soon as you do this, you get here the configuration window, and now you get key fields here, and you can have the option to add columns. And that's what you want to do here, what we want to do here. Basically, our goal is to put the service one as well as the service two in one column, and the price one and price two in a second column, right? So we have a clean data set basically with one column with all the services and one column with all the prices. That's the main idea here. And what we could do is we could here, let's actually untick this key field. I'm going to show you what it does in a minute. So at first you go to column here and you want to add a column. Notice that you can't add a row directly. You need first need to add a column. So go add column here, go to add, and then you have the option here. What do you want to call this column as a header? Let's say for the services, I simply want to name this services, services, like that. And then you can add a description here if you want. Let's actually do this, but later on we will remove this. But let's say, uh, yes, uh, description headers, description, okay. And then for the, basically the, the columns I want under this service column is service one and service two, because I want to combine those two, right? Okay, let's do that like that. Press okay, and you see that now you have the option to add a description. For instance, uh, this is uh, S1, and then the description here is S2, for instance. And then you also have the option now to add rows if you want. But what we want, we want to have a second column, right? Because we want to have all the services in one column and then all the prices in another column. So I will add another column here, click on column, go to add column here, go to add, and then you have the option to add another column header if you want. So um, in this case, let's call this prices, prices, like that. And then you also you are you can enable here description if you want to add one. Let's keep this description as well. And then you say I'd like to add the price one and price two. So those two columns here should belong now to the new column prices. And if you click OK now, you'll see that if we run this tool, click on Run here, you see that this is basically the output we get. Let me select it first. That's what you have. So you have a description like S1, S2, S1, S2, and so on. And here you got all the services in one column and all the prices in another column. And that is normally why I don't add a description, because this S1 and S2, okay, now I know what was actually the source. So basically this came from the first, so from our first column, right? And the Disney was the second column, Fun Funimation was the, again the first column, Hulu was the second column. If you take a look at the original data set, you see exactly what this means. But this is something, in case you need it, you can add a description. In case you don't need it or you don't want to see this, what you could do instead is you go back to the Arrange tool here and say, instead of here description, you can simply let me actually do it one more time. Let's go to a range here and drag it one more time inside and do it differently. Go in here and say, at first, I'd like to do the same one more time. So you go to column here. You say you want to add a column. In this case, you don't use, use a column header, like uh, in this case, service again, services. But this time, you don't add a new description. You simply go in here and say you want to add none. And you see that now these fields, you cannot enter any data anymore. And now you simply take the services like that. Okay, you click OK. And then you add another column, again, because you want to have a second column, not rows. And you simply say, I want to add this column. And then I simply say, this, these are prices, prices. You could also use rows, but then you would have basically the services and the rows in one column. And that's not what you want, right? So you want to have separate columns. So one column for the services and one column for the prices. That is why I simply take on column again here. And this time, say also no description. So I take this none, and I'll take simply the prices here. Double click like that, and I press OK. And now let's run this one more time on the run button and now you see the output here it looks a little bit different right so we don't have this column this additional column let me take, take this one more time description here which at least in my case doesn't mean anything it's not necessary of course we can use then the select tool to remove this column but why use it at all so simply if I, we only do it this without description we got our services in one column and the prices in another column and just by the way, I want to show you this also in here. If you take key fields, for instance, like if I take a look back at the original data set, I have here as an ID, for instance, like right? provider, price, rating, and so on as an ID. And if you would tick, for instance, here the ID field as a key field, then this column would remain. So basically, if we run this here, let's run this, you basically get this output here. So you get the ID column, which is now provider here, price and rating. The reason why it's like that is because the provider here was in the original data set, if I take this one more time, you see the provider was in the first, here in the first row, and their service was Netflix and Disney. And then price was in the second, and was Funimation and Hulu, and so on, right? So that is why if you take it like that, and keep this ID column, then the output is like that. Provider, provider, price, price, rating, rating. So that is why 
I normally, when I use this tool at all, I would not use key fields. I mean, depends on your data set, of course, but in this case, I would not use the key fields. Simply choose the columns you want, and you combine basically two columns into one column. You run your flow, and now you have a data set which is clean, which contains the services in one column and the prices in another column. So that is basically the arrange tool. For me, it was a little bit difficult to understand that at first. You can try it if you need it, but um, most of the time I do not use it. But maybe you need it. So that's why I wanted to show it to you. And the second tool is the count records. So the, this count records, I also show it in this video because it's really easy to use. All you need to do is you simply drag it on your screen, on the canvas here. And then you, what you could do is basically, you, as you can see here, there is no configuration at all. So all you need to do is you com connect a specific tool or node here, for instance this one or this one, let's do it this like that, with this uh, count records tool, and all it does is really it counts the records in your data set. So if you want to know, as you can see here, you've got six records in total, but if you only need the number, so six, and want to work with this number in, in this workflow, you can simply use the count records tool, you can run it basically, and then if you take a look, you'll simply get a count and a six. You can also get the same result using the summarize tool, which we will cover briefly in the next couple of videos. But um, the main idea is this count record simply counts the records in your data set. Okay, that's all what it does. So that's it actually for starting to, uh, well, diving into the transform tools. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you can use it. I, again, I encourage you to try it out yourself. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to the next part of the transform tools and this time we're going to dive into the cross tab as well as the transpose because they are kind of similar actually they are probably the opposite of each other so let's begin so at first we need some data as always so here i have two files which is energy drink sales and energy drink sales 2 so let's start with energy drink sales okay so let me drag this inside and by the way you find this in the resource section if you need it so Select the sheet. Yes, we want to have the sheet energy drink sales. You click OK, like that. And then you see basically we got a little issue here, as you can see here, because the first column here does not contain any data in this case, right? So basically it starts in row number two, and actually the first two columns in this Excel file do not contain data. And I can show this to you. So let me actually go inside here, and let me double click on that, like that. And you see basically here that we have also this column here. The great thing is that Alteryx has automatically removed this column for us, so that's fine. But we still got this empty line here, the second one, and then actually the headers start in row number three. That is why we need to select num row number three when we start importing our data. So let's actually close this, and let's see. So let's go back to Alteryx here and say instead of number two, it looks like here, but actually the first one was already dismissed by Alteryx. So we simply say in here in the configuration, start importing data on line number three. Okay, and what you could always do is you simply click refresh and take a look and here it looks like that is correct now. So we can run our workflow, click on run to import the data and now we can see, okay, that looks good. So we got a country column in here, we got our product, so USA, Rockstar Energy, Zero to Sugar, and then we got different kinds of numbers. So in this case, sales numbers from January to December for this year, right? And also then for another country, another product and so on. And this continues. So this is the data we have. Now, with the transpose tool, we can basically transpose our data because this table is really nice when humans like us are watching this, but for computer and for actually working with the data, it is not really efficient. The more efficient would be that we would have one date column with all the months in, one, in, in this column and all the values, as you can see here, which are currently here in this, this crops the tab format, should be in, in one column as well. So basically, from all these columns, these 12 columns with the months, we want to make two columns, one with the month name and one with the actual value for the product. So in order to do that, we can simply go to the transpose option here and simply drag this inside like that. And then you'll see that here, you basically have the option to select key columns, which are basically the columns you want to keep in the data set. And then you have data columns like that. Now, currently, what we basically have here is we have basically key columns here nothing selected by default but all in the data columns like that so that's basically not what you want because if we try to run this let's run that here like that you see basically what you get right so you get country product january february and so on so basically now you have all the headers which you had before in the column name and all the values in the column values that's not what you want instead what we want is if i go back to original data we want to keep our country and we also want to keep our product right and then we want to have 
uh, two additional columns, one with the month's names, so the date column, and one actually with the values. So that is why you go back to the uh, configuration window here of the transpose tool, and you simply say the key columns are the two columns you want to keep. In our data set, we want to keep the country, so tick country, as well as product. And you also see then when you tick product, then basically get re it's get re gets removed automatically from the data column. So tick this, like that, and you see it's gone here. So that's fine, that is exactly what we need. So we need here the key columns, which is country and product, and all the data columns, which contains basically all the years. In this case, all the months, right? Okay, and then you can run this workflow again, click on run, and now you see you got basically here the country, you got the product, and then we got the name, in this case, which is the date itself, and the value. This is exactly the way we want to have our data structured. And this is a structure where a lot of tools like Tableau, for instance, or, or Power BI can work with. Very good. So for those tools, this is the perfect structure you can create. Now, one more thing, of course, you like to do is you like to rename this probably because name is not really um, gives us no information. We want to have this as a date, for instance, and this as a sales figure. So sales, for instance. So this is something you can't do directly here in the transpose uh, tool, yeah. But what you could do, of course, and you already know that, you go back to preparation here, and then you could use the select tool. So drag select tool inside like that, and then you simply say, okay, country, which is a string. Okay, currently it's fine. Product is a string. It's also fine. Name is a string, and value is already recognized as a double. Okay, that's fine. Even though in our case it's an integer, but most of the time the sales numbers are probably double. So in this case, I leave this, but if you want to change it, you can easily change it here as well. What we want to do here is we simply want to rename those two fields. So you can go in here and say, this is actually the date. And then for the value, this is actually the sales number. So sales, okay, like that. And also I like this, like to keep this unknown checked, just in case in the future we get additional columns and we still want to keep them in the workflow here, then simply leave it checked. Okay, so that's that. And now if we run this, of course, let's click the run button or press the shortcut, you'll see that now we got the same table, but this time with the correct headers, like date here and sales here. And you also see the green bars here simply means that the data is correct. There are no missing entries in here, okay? So that's it actually for the transpose tool. Now, the second tool we want to analyze is then the opposite, which is basically the cross tab. So the cross tab tool, you can also drag this inside, but this time, before we use it, of course we need some data, we don't use the energy drink sales, which we had here. This time we're gonna do, deal with a different structure, a structure which is more likely like this one here. So the other way around works like that, and that's why I have prepared another thing, which is this energy drink sales number two. So you can drag this inside, and you already see, yes, I wanna select the sheet, click okay, that this structure is exactly the structure which we basically create as an output here. So that structure here, country, product, date, and sales, is actually equivalent to this structure, country, product, date, and sales, right? And if you want to turn this around again, so basically the opposite, as I said, from the transpose tool is this cross tab. So you can simply connect those two like that. And then in the cross tab configuration here, what you have is you have a group data by these values. So here you can select what you want to group by. These are basically the columns you want to keep again, right? And then you have the option to change column headers here and also the values you want to choose. So in this case, um, if you do not check anything, I'm gonna show you what this means, and change the column headers to say, the column headers would be, let's say, uh, date here for instance, and then the values are basically here, the sales, like that. Then you have different kinds of aggregation methods here, and you need to check one. So you could simply say, I'd like to see the sum here, and if you do it, untick this, you'll see that now the configuration works, and if you run this, click on the run button, you basically get only one row back. So if I click on this, you see that basically what you get is you get all the column headers here as the dates, so from the date column, but then the sum, simply the sum of, um, of the values, right? So of the sales numbers in total. And that's of course not what you want. So if that's what you want, of course that's what you get, but uh, here that's not what we want. We want to have the original structure like that again. So we have a country, a product, and then we have basically the headers as the dates here, and then all the values like that. So basically this kind of table, which is good if you present the data, for instance, to a management or something like that. So in order to do this, we simply take this one more time and say, we want to group by, and here you will put in basically the columns you want to keep. And these are the columns, in this case, the country and the product, right? So if you take those columns and change column headers from date, values to sales, that simply means, please give me each country and each product in combination, so what's available in here, and then give me another column, which is simply the, or put in basically another columns, which contains of the column date, and 
put the values sales inside. And then of course again you have different kinds of aggregation methods like give me the sum, give me the average, the count and so on. In our case it doesn't really matter because we have unique things here. So basically there are no aggregations. But of course the value here or the configuration always needs one. So the sum here we simply take the sum and then we simply put in, in this case click on the run button here like that and now we see the output now from this node here or from this tool is exactly the way we had it before, right? We have the country and the product because we group by those two and then we have as the column headers we specify the date column and as the values we used simply the sum of the sales and this is exactly the values we're getting here, okay? And that is basically the output. So that is why I put both of these tools in one video because I think they belong together, they are simply the opposite. So if you start with a data set which looks like that and you want to transform it in a data set which is much more um, or much better for tools like Tableau or Power BI and you want to work with and visualize your data then in those tools then you would go with the, here the transpose tool to get this kind of structure and if you want to have your data or have your data in this kind of structure and you want to basically create another more uh, readable friendly um, structure which you want to present to the management then you would basically go with the crosstab tool and you would get, go from this structure here which we have here to this structure here. Okay, so that's it actually for this video. Hopefully you were able to follow along and I just want to encourage you to try it out yourself and play around with it. It's really easy to do, just you have to do it a few times, but you really get into it if you do it. Okay, so thanks for this video and uh, as always, see you in the next one. Hello and welcome back to this video and this time we're gonna take a look at the running total here, which is basically the cumulative sum, which we can easily calculate in Alteryx using this tool here. And of course we need to have some data and this time I'm going to use another data which is this transaction April 2019 which is also part of my um, case study with Alteryx course. So let me drag this inside like that and you also already get a preview in here. Now what do we have? We could simply calculate here the running total of the quantity. That simply means that for the first row in our data set we got this 1427 then in the second row we simply got the sum of those two. In the third row we got the sum of those three and so on, right? until we reach the end of our data set to have the complete sum of all the quantities which have been ordered. So in order to do that we could try to use the running total but please here there's one thing you have to uh, I have to mention which is important. Remember that we have a CSV file here. Whenever you drag CSV or text files in Autorix, Autorix considers all the columns at first as a string. That might be changed in the past but right now it, that's the case. And you can easily spot this if you go to the preparation tool and use the select tool and drag them inside. You see that by default you have all string values here. And if you have string values, then of course you can't use the transform and simply hear the running total because you can't sum anything. Because currently the quantity here is still a string and you can't sum a text. We need to first convert it into a number. Keep this in mind. That's always important to know. Now we will use a tool, we could use the select tool as we here as well, but we will use something else, go to data preparation and we simply use the out of field, right? You already know that, you simply drag this inside like that and then you can simply run this and basically this already detects the right, um, in this case, data type for the quantity and you see that if you use the select tool, drag this inside, you'll see that already here, order date is now a date and quantity here is an integer. Remember the price paid is a string, that the reason is simply because it currently contains a comma and not a dot. You need to first replace the comma with a dot and then we could also convert the price paid into a number. Yeah? Okay. But in our case we want to re refer to the quantity so that's totally fine. This auto field here is enough for us. I can simply remove this select tool. I just wanted to show it to you what it, that we basically converted the data type correctly and now we can use the transform here. Under transform the running total. So let me drag this inside like that and now we can specify basically a group by column and then we can simply create the running total. Now, the configuration is pretty simple. Let's think about that. If we don't group by anything and simply tick for create the running total, in this case not the sales ID, so none, uh, but the quantity, so click quantity here, then when we run this running total tool, simply click the run button, basically what happens, and I'm gonna show it to you here, if you tick this of course, we got an additional column, which is this run tot tot uh, quantity column, and you see that it starts with 1,427, which is exactly the same amount as here with the quantity. But then the next one is 4,215, which is simply the sum of those two first of the first two uh, rows. And then we have 5,794, which is simply then the sum of the first three, and so on. And this basically goes down completely, right? Completely to the end of the data set. In this case, you can see here we only got a preview here of the data set, but in, uh, to almost 10,000 rows. But 
what it basically does is really it calculates the total amount of quantity and at the end it has simply the sum of the whole data set. Because, why is that? Because if you go back to the configuration here for the running total, we did not group by anything. So that is why if you don't tick anything here, you don't group the data, you basically get the running total of the complete data set. If you want to get the running total only for a specific part of the data set, then this group by comes in hand, handy. Because what you could do is you could simply specify either one or several columns you want to group by. For instance, let's say I would like to have my running total, so an accumulative sales, but I want this for instance for, let's say, for countries. So I can tick countries here and I can run this one more time. I run it and now you see it's sorted actually by country here because it creates the running total by country for this column here. So basically I can scroll down. I probably have to scroll down a little bit more. So let me make this a little bigger maybe like that. And let's scroll down, scroll down. It's still Austria and there's Belgium. Okay, so there's somehow Austria, it's still Austria, 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 and there is the break, right? So it runs until the end, the final data set of Austria, and you can see it has here the running total for complete Austria, but then with a new country, Belgium here in this case, we start with a quantity of 1,378, and we also start with the running total here, 1,378. And then again it runs, it, it calculates the cumulative sales until the end of Belgium is reached, and then it starts for the next country with, again, the first value of this country in a quantity, and so on. So this is how you can basically using this group by and you can basically create now um, the running total for a specific column, either for one, which we have done here, or of course you could also take several of them. For instance, I could also say I want to have the sales area and the country. Then simply means that for each combination of sales area and country, it will calculate the running total. And then if a new sales area country combination starts, or a new sales area, yeah, sales area co country combination, that's correct, starts, then basically it restarts the running total calculation. So that is basically a, a sub running total, if you want to call it this way, in your data set. That's how you can create it. Simply take the specific group by columns you want, could be one, could be several of them, and then you simply create the running total. Or if you want to have the running total for the complete data set, simply don't take anything in the group by and simply only take the specific column you want to create the running totals for. Right? And of course you could also tick several of them. In this case it does not make any sense, I just wanted to show you that this works. So if I, for instance, tick this as well, the sales ID, um, then click the running total like that, then you could also create a running total here for the sales ID as you can see here as well. Right? That would also uh, work, even though it's, uh, that does not make any sense. But if you, let's say you have uh, the quantity as well as the sales numbers in here, then you could do the running total for both of those columns in one tool, in one running total tool. Okay? That's just what's possible basically. Um, okay, renaming doesn't work here, but you already know if you want to rename something, you could easily use the select tool as the next tool. Okay, so that's it actually for this running total. I think that's pretty easy, but it's really, really powerful, and I often use it, and probably you will also often use it in the future. So that's it for this video. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, best guys. Hello, and welcome back. Now this time we're gonna dive into the Summarize tool. And please note that the Summarize tool has by default already a star, so it's a favorite tool. And why is that? The reason simply is because it's really, really powerful and you will use it a lot. You will probably use it a lot if you use Alteryx. And I also cover this tool and use it a lot in my case study course. So just in case you have also taken this course on Udemy, um, I'm sorry there will be a little bit of rep um, repetition here, but it's also part of course of this course because here we want to cover the nodes in Alteryx, the most important of course. And Summarize is definitely part of it. Okay, so let's actually at first get some data and I will use the same data set as in the last video. So I'm using my transactions April 19. So let's actually drag this inside and you see we've got the preview here again. Again, note, it's important, I know and I've told you this in the past, but I like to reiterate that because it's really, really important. By default here, it's a CSV file, so everything is text, so the numbers in the file, like the amount here, is not really helpful because currently it's text, so we can't aggregate on the quantity. So at first we need to convert this into a number. And here, again, I'm going to the preparation tool, there are several options to do it, but I like to use the auto field because it's really easy and it's a good practice to use it. And try that out. So we can run this, and we already know that it it basically converts the quantity into a numerical number. Um, we know this from the last video, and also it converts the order date, so that's totally fine. With the price paid, there's an issue, we already know that, because there's a comma inside, and basically it needs a dot in order to convert the decimal numbers correctly. But it shouldn't, that doesn't worry us now, or bother us now, because we can f focus on the quantity as well as the order date and other kinds of columns in here. So let's go back to transform here, or click on favorites here, and you can also see the summarized tool in here. Doesn't matter if you use it here, or go to transform and find it here. 
So I'm um, simply drag this inside like that, and then I can specify something. At first, I have all my fields as well as the data type here, so I can see basically, okay, quantity is an integer, order date is a date, that's fine, price paid is still a string, as I said before. So that's okay, and now basically all you need to do is you simply click on add here, and then you can specify what kind of what aggregation or yeah grouping do you want to do in here. So at first, of course, you need to select a specific column. So if I would like to see the total amount of my quantities which has been sold in my complete data set, I could simply take the quantity and go to add here and simply say I'd like to see the sum. If you take this like sum, then you can see you've got the field here, which is quantity, you've got an action, which is the summation of this field, and then you also got an output name in here, which you can change. This is, for instance, let's say this is the total quantity, quantity, like that, and press enter, that's fine. And now if you run this, click on the run button here, you see as an output only one number which is this, uh, I think it's 6 million, or 60 million, 60 million, 72,669. So basically, this is simply the total amount of this column, right? So if you would use the running total tool, or this running total tool, which we have covered in the last video, then basically the end of the complete data set would be exactly this number here, right? So that's what you get with the summarize tool, just in case you need it. What else can you do? Well, currently we only have one column here, which is the quantity. But let's say you would like to know, well, we have different kinds of countries here. And I would like to know what is the total quantity sold in each country, right? That could be one of the use cases you would like to figure out. So what you can simply do is you click on country, and because it's a string, you can't sum it, but you can go to add here, and you can simply, you can see it's grayed out, but you can either count it, so to know how many countries are in the data set, or that you probably refer to count as think, by the way, but, or you can group by. And that's exactly what we'll do. So you click on group by, and now you have a second column here. So basically you have the sum of the quantity and you have a group by country. And what I would like to do is I'd like to see my grouping in the first column of the output of the summarize tool. That is why I can simply go in here with this arrow, arrow here and simply tick it and now the group by country is the first column in the output of the summarize tool. So I simply say group by country and the output field name is country, that's totally fine because these, these are the countries, right? And then I have the quantity and the sum and total quantity. And now, if we run this, you won't get the total quantity of the data set, but what, what you get instead is you get now the total quantity grouped by country. So for each country, you get the total quantity. And let's see this. Let's click on Run button here. And now we can see we got a unique list of countries in the data set. So Austria, Belgium, Denmark, and so on. And we got the total quantity for each country combination, right? So that's what you get. And the sum of those total quantities, that would be exactly the number we have seen before, right? Okay, so let me also make this maybe a little bit bigger, so hopefully you can see this. Otherwise, of course, hopefully you'll follow along in your own Alteryx version, so then you see it on your screen better, probably, maybe uh, that in the video. Okay, so that is that. What else can we do? Well, if we go back to the Summarize tool, of course we can add several aggregations here. For instance, what else do we have? Well, we have here a product name, right? So let's figure out, okay, now we have the countries and we have the quantity. We know exactly, okay, in each country, this amount of quantity has been sold. But how many products actually have been sold in each country, right? Are there actually all the energy drinks, have all energy drinks been sold in each country or not? That's something we could figure out. So we could simply go to product name here, and then we go to add again, and then simply say, here, I'd like to see my count distinct. So please give me a unique list of products, so in this case of different kinds of energy drinks, which have been sold in the country, right? So if you take on count distinct here, you see that you got this one, and of course you got the name here. If you don't like the name, then you can simply say um, products, right? Call this products, products like that. Press enter, and then we got this, and if we run this, we get one additional column here. Let's click on the run button or press the shortcut, and now you can see we got the product amount here as well. So basically in Austria, the total quantity has been, which has been sold is 1,663,520, and we have in total sold nine different kinds of products. For instance, in other countries, like Belgium, there were only 8 products. In the United Kingdom, there were even 10 products, so the most amount of products sold, considering that. Right? So that's what you get. Basically, the Summarize tool is an aggregation tool. It allows us to group our data by specific, um, in this case, fields, like in this case, uh, here, the country. Could be several of them as well. Could also be, again, could be a country and then another combination. So for instance, I could say, I'd like to see country, and I also would like to group by the product name. So instead of count distincts, here I could go in here and say I would like to group by, right, like that. And also take this up there, and I will have the quantity for each country product combination. 
So let's run this. Click on Run button here. Now you see you got Austria and you got different kinds of products for Austria and then you got the total quantity. So the aggregation for each country and product, this has been sold considering the amount, right? And you can see it for each of the products here and then Belgium and you can see Belgium product combination and the total amount and so on. So depending on what you want to group by, simply select specific columns and then here the aggregation. And of course, rename the fields accordingly the way you want it. If you want to get rid of a specific field, for instance, let's say I don't like to see the product name here, click on it and click the minus button here. Minus and now you're gone. Okay. So on for dates, maybe one last thing here. So you can click on date here and again go to add here. And then beside those functions which are available here, also depending on the data type and the field you choose up there, you could also use different kinds of options like here, right? For instance, count blank concatenate, longest, and so on. So you might dive into those functions here as well. In our case, what I like to show you is simply the minimum. So I can take minimum here because this would simply give me, okay, for each country, in this case, or each country, the total amount of products which has been sold was this one. And what was the minimum order date? So basically the first order date in the data set for each country. That is basically what you can find out by simply use the min here. So let's call this maybe first order date, first, first order date like that okay and then you can simply click the run button or press the shortcut and now you see basically for each country um, that was the total amount and the first order date was in our case always the first of april so remember these are transactions from april and again each product has been sold on the first right but of course there might be some if you deal with your own data there might be some issues here uh, not issues but differences so for instance you have certain products and you will find exactly okay this product has not been sold the first 10 days for instance anything like that would also already be an insight right so that's what you can do with a summarize tool so this is a really really powerful tool i'd like to mention that i'd like to highlight this because i use it a lot in my, in my other course so if you want to dive in the case study feel free to do it um just a little bit of advertisement of course but um really it's it's a really powerful tool and you will probably use it a lot and that is why also it's start by default and uh, it's a great tool so please i would highly encourage you try it out yourself okay so that's it actually for this video as always thanks so much for watching and i can't wait to see you in the next one until then best guys Hello and welcome back to this video and the last option in the transform, the last tool is the weighted average and this is what we're going to dive into now. Now the weighted average does exactly what you would assume it does, it calculates a weighted average across a data set. And uh, I have prepared something you can use, uh, you can download this from the resource section, you can simply go in here and drag in the weights Excel file. Of course, as always, you can also go to the input and then use an input tool, but I think this is the faster way and that's why I like to do it this way. Now, you select a sheet here, and this is a rating sheet, that's fine. You also can select the range, you don't have to, because here we simply use the data itself, so it's already clean. So you can click OK, and you see that basically this is the output you get here. We got a series here, we got a rating, and a weight 1 and a weight 2. Now the series here is, for instance, Sopranos, Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, and Rick and Morty, and The Office. I simply use some random series here, doesn't matter which one. And then I simply added some ratings here. Again, these are not my ratings, are simply just demo data, okay? So, and then we have a weight 1, which is always number 1, and we have a weight 2, which is uh, simply a, a, thre a threshold, a fraction, right? Fraction of that. Um, okay, so we could also run this, of course, to take a look at this down there. We get exactly the same table, like the series, the rating, the weight, and the weight 1 and the weight 2. Remember, the weight 1 contains all 1s. So weight 1 simply means if this is our weight and everything is 1, then the weight is considered to be equal. So each user who rated here, so here we have, in this case, uh, six different users for Sopranos, and each of those users uh, has the same weight. Okay, So each rating has the same weight. That is why I put it a 1 in here. And if we say that certain users, like for instance this user number 2, is more important, he has a higher weight, as you can see here, with 0 0.4, then we could use this kind of weight, weighting, to calculate the weighting average. But let's dive into that. So we have our data set, and now of course we can simply drag the tool inside and connect it, like that. And now we can specify what is the value field and what is the weight field. Now the value is exactly what we want to basically create as an output, which is the rating, right? So we want to have a rating, but we want to weight this rating. And the weight field could be, in our case, weight number one or weight number two. If we say we keep on weight number one, so every rating in the data set is considered to be equal. So we can simply tick this, and then you can simply specify here the grouping fields, as well as the header, by the way. So let's leave it as weighted average. And if we untick nothing, so basically untick everything, click on none, um, instead of all, all you would select everything, none, 
you select nothing. So if you do this and click the run button like that, then you see as an output here you only get one value, which is this 3.3 and so on. Okay, and this is simply now the weighted average across the whole data set, right? Across all these movies in total, the whole average rating, and in this case with the weight number one, so all weight all ratings are considered to be equal. So that simply means that the weighted uh, rated average is in this case 3.3. .3. So let's actually change this maybe. Let's say instead of having everyone equal weight, let's say there are users who are more important who should have more weight. We tick on weight number two, and now if we run this, we will get a different number than 3.3. .3. Let's see. Let's click on the run button, and you see that now the output is 3.38. So it's a little bit higher, right? So there's definitely a difference in here. Okay. So that is basically what this weighted average can do for us. But so far, what we had is we simply calculated here the rating and then the, the weighted average across the whole data set. Of course, most of the time, that's not what you want. So let's take a look back at the data set. Here we have different kinds of series, right? And maybe we would like to know, okay, what was actually the average rating for a specific series, right? So for instance, the average rating of Sopranos or the average rating of Breaking Bad and so on. So that is where this grouping option comes into play. And this works equivalent to all the other nodes you, you find the grouping option. You always want to tick this if you want to keep this as, uh, that's an, uh, as a subset, basically. You want to create your calculation on. So in this case, let's tick the series object here and say we would like to see the rating, the weighted rating based on the weight number two. And if we run this now, we will get now different kinds of outputs because here we got the series and for each series we get the average rating in here. Like the average rating of Breaking Bad is 4.2, Game of Thrones 3.4 and so on, right? So different kinds of weighted averages now for different kinds of series. And by the way, this of course is again based on users who have more weight. So if you like to go with this again, but this time check weight number one. So every user has the same rate weighting, then simply there might be a difference between 4.2 for Breaking Bad, for instance. If we run this one more time, we will see that now Breaking Bad is only 4, okay? Because the one with the higher ratings now have uh, the same weight as those with the lower ratings, and that is why this obviously now has changed a little bit. And just by the way, in case you're wondering, if you hover over one of the cells, whenever you see this little red symbol here, it doesn't mat mean that there's an issue or an error. It simply warns you that here, for instance, if it calculates the rating correctly, it only shows, uh, in this case, six decimal places, right? And actually, there would be more. That's just uh, it's just um, well a warning, a little uh, notification here. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's not an issue, right? Okay, just want to mention that. All right, so that's it basically for this weighted average node. So I think it's also pretty easy to use, and just in case you need it, for instance, because you have some, some for instance, um, time series fields, and you want to cal calculate a weighted average on that, that also could be a use case for that node, okay, for this, to for this tool. So, okay, that's it for this video. As always, hopefully you enjoyed it, hopefully you can use this, and I hopefully see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello, and welcome back. Now we covered the in and out, the preparation, the join, the parse, and all the transform tools. And I think with this knowledge, you have a pretty decent understanding of Alteryx. And you can do a lot of different data cleaning and transformation steps. Now I'd like to give you a few additional tools in Alteryx and show it to you, which might be helpful to you. And the first two, actually in this video, are if you go to developer, like that, and just in case you don't see this tab, what you could always do is you click on the plus sign here, and then you simply search for a specific tab. For instance, in this case, I went to the developer tab. So if you scroll down, there's a developer, you can simply take it, right? Click OK. So again, I'm going to the developer tab, and there are two tools which I want to show you in this video. The first is the dynamic select, which is this one here, and the second is the dynamic rename. I think these tools might be helpful, so let's dive into them. At first, let's show you, let me show you the dynamic select. So what I do is I use a file, and I, will, I go back to my just in case there are the uh, course files here, and I'm going with the file transactions April 2019, which you already know, right? And let me first drag this inside, like that. And we know that this file, because it's a CSV file, now only considers data types as strings. So what I will do is I will go to preparation and I go to auto field, simply to detect the data types. Okay, here we go. And then we could already run that, like that. Okay, and then we already know that now Alteryx has detected certain data types for different kinds of columns. Okay, so now we could go to the developer tab one more time, and we could simply use the dynamic select tool. So what it does basically, it's pretty easy to explain, let me drag it inside, you'll see that you have the option to select fields by data types. Here, select field types, as you can see here, or select fi fields via formula. 
So in case you can create a formula here, like for instance, you would only contain the column headers which contains a certain word, like that, right? That could be, for instance, something you'd like to enter in the expression editor here. And again, you could refer to the different kinds of fields, which are here, and constants, which are here, and also to different kinds of functions, which are available in here, right? It's pretty, sim simply dive in if you need this. Besides this, what I would like to do is basically use the default one, select field by types, which gives you simply the option to search for, for instance, if you take numeric, you would only contain numeric fields or columns which contain numeric field types, or you go to string, you would only contain strings. If you go to spatial, in case you got spatial data, then you would only contain spatial objects in your data set. For instance, if I go to string here, I could simply then run this workflow, I click on the run button or press uh, yeah, press the run button or use the shortcut, and then you can see at the output here that it only contains uh, now these kinds of uh, columns here. And remember, price paid is formatted as a string, that is why it's appearing here as well. But for instance, uh, fields like uh, what we had before, the order amount here, the quantity here, in this case, which was transformed to a, no in this case, numeric data type, which was this one here, um, using this order field here, is simply now gone in the output, right? So basically, we removed any kind of numerical fields, for instance, or any other kind of spatial fields or other fields, which you didn't check here in the data type. So this makes sense if you have a huge data set. For instance, you have uh, 50 or 100 columns, and you don't want to select them manually, but you want to only keep certain data types, then this field is really helpful. Beside this, also the second option, select via formula, that also might make sense. For instance, if, as I said before, you only want to contain certain columns which contain a certain keyword, for instance, right? Then you could write this expression here if you want to do that. So that's why it's called dynamic select, okay? So this is the first one. And the second one, which I like to show you here, is the dynamic rename. It could also be useful to you, so let me show it to you. Let me actually drag this workflow maybe a little up like that. Um, parsing error, let's just see. Uh, empty expression, oh, because I selected expression here, okay. Let's go back in here, select field type, and they will say string here, for instance, and run this one more time, you see that the error is gone. Okay, so the second thing is the dynamic rename. And what I would like to show you an example, which I have here, again, it's two files here. It's at first this first one, games need headers, and I can drag this inside. And yes, select sheet is games, I click OK, and we got a preview here, right? And we can see that there's a game here, GTA 2021 and action, FIFA 2021 sports, and Cyberpunk uh, 2020, also an action game. We see that we import the data currently from the first row, that's true, but that's true here, but the first row contains data. I need to tick this here because basically uh, GTA 6 here is also part of the data, right? It's not the header. So I click refresh here and you can see that now we got F1, F2, F3 and so on. So basically we don't have any field headers. So if you have data like that, what you could do is you could use the dynamic rename field here. So you can drag this inside, but before we configure it here with the left and the right option here, what I need to do is I need to have a second data file. And I also prepared this, which are the headers here. I can drag this inside like that. And you'll see it's sheet number one, that's okay. Click on it and you see that here I have one column, only one column with headers, which is name, year and genre, which is exactly basically the headers of this data set. This is the game here, so the title, then this is a year and this is a genre, right? So basically what I would like to achieve is I would want to have this column as are my headers for this data set. And that is exactly what this dynamic rename allows us to do, do. So what you could do is you can connect the data you have to the left input, and then you can connect the headers you have to the right input, like that. And then you simply select it, just to configure it, and then you have various options. Either rename mode by formula, again, if you have this, then your right input here, here, the rename mode should not have any right input, right? So that means you don't, you're not allowed to have any right input if you have a rename mode formula. But what I'd like to show you is here, the second one, uh, which is, let me go scroll down, basically, where is it? Take field uh, names from the right input rows. That's exactly what we want to do here. You can see there are various other options, but this is the, the one which I when, uh, most often use, if I use this tool. So you can take this, and that's exactly the example we have here. And you see old field names from columns, use positional rename, that's totally fine. And new field names from column headers. Okay, we only have one column here in the second data source, that's why you can only select headers. But that is basically uh, the configuration. So you don't have to do anything here. You, uh, and you select the specific column which contains the headers for your data set. And then you can simply click on the run button here. Click on the run button or press the shortcut here. It also works. And if you run, then if you take a look at the output here, you can see that now I have name as my first column header, I have year as my second column header, and a genre as my third column header. So basically, these are exactly the three uh, well inputs from the right side, in this case from the headers uh, column, right? 
and now we use them as headers for this table right here. So if you use this tool, you can use it this way as I did, but make sure then that basically the amount of columns you have in the first data set should match or equal to the amount of row columns or rows in this case you have in, in the second data set if you want to use it like that. But this could be really helpful, especially if you're a large data set um, where you you'd miss the headers, you could do it like that. Instead of using the select tool, that would of course also be an option, and do it manually if you want to do that. But these are two tools here under this developer tab which might be helpful to you, so uh, just want to encourage you to try it out, and now you know how to use them, feel free to try them out as I said, and as always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then, best guys. Hello and welcome back to part two of the exploring the developer tools. Now here I have an example with an Excel file which contains data about hotels, as you can see here. We got five different tabs and we got data for hotels. And it looks like that, basically, so you can see the data starts actually in row number four. So up there we have some empty rows and then we have accommodation sales, food and beverage sales and so on. And again, some empty rows in between and then the volume KPIs at the end. And the main idea here is the following. We got five hotels and all hotels are structured equally, right? So the data structure is exactly the same. So data starts at row number four and then we have the same structure of, in this case, the PL items in here, right? And same is true for three, four and five. And the question is now, how do we get all this data combined into Alteryx? Easy. So let's dive into that. Let me actually go to Alteryx here and then I simply go to the folder here and here I have my hotels. You'll find this in the resource section. So let's actually dra drag that inside like that. And you'll see that normally we would select a sheet, right? But the issue here is we can't select all sheets combined here. We have to select hotel number one, hotel number two, three, and so on. And of course there are ways that we simply select first the sheets and then we try to combine them. Of course that would work. But why do that? There's a better way to do it. So what we do instead is we import only the list of sheet names. That is the key here. So take this one here instead of the default one and then click OK. And if you, you can already see what it does, it basically gives us exactly the names of the tabs of our Excel file. Hotel 1, Hotel 2, 3, 4, and 5. And of course you can run this and you will see the same down there. So we have the sheet names. Okay, so far so good. Now, what we need is, we need to go onto the developer tool, one, tool uh, tab here one more time, and then I search for dynamic input. That is the key here. So you can simply drag this inside like that. You can connect it. And you have basically here the following configuration window. What we first need to do is we need to give Alteryx a template so it no knows exactly, okay, what kind of template should I apply on each of those sheet names. So what you get here. So we go inside here and say, okay, the template itself is exactly the same file. So we can go to edit here and then you say, yes, I would open a new file here and go to files. And then of course you can go to Excel, Excel X and navigate to the folder or you simply, as you see here, you can select the file here and simply drag it inside. So I go in here and say I drag my hotels in this like that. Okay, copy the file inside and here you do not use this option which we used at the beginning. You select the normal sheet here and simply say okay as an example I can use sheet one. I only need one template and since all hot hotels here are structured exactly the same it shouldn't matter which of one we choose but we choose the default the first one. Okay, and then we click okay like that and then we have some configuration to do as you can see here there are nulls because remember our first row was actually row number four. So don't get tricked here because of the three, but the four was the fir first row of data. So you need to scroll down a little bit in the configuration window. Uh, I can make it bigger, yes I can, so like that. And you scroll down and you can see here, start data importing online. And here you simply type in a four instead of a one. And then you click refresh, click refresh. And now you can see these rows, these two columns here are empties, that's true. But here we have the dates, right? Exactly as we had in the Excel file as well. Okay, so that's fine. And of course we have got some additional issues like null entries in here, um, as you can see, and also if I scroll to the end, there's also null entry, but it's messy data, right? That's the normal day, daily work we have to deal with when we use Alteryx properly. So that's fine, click OK. And now we got our template. The template is fine as specified, and now Alteryx knows within this tool, okay, that is the template, and I should apply as, as this template on each of those tabs I get from this, this file here, uh, or each of the sheet names. And then we say we read a list of data sources. Here you have the field here, you can check this. And what we want to read is the sheet names, right? So the sheet names come from this source here. That is why we had to take sheet names instead of normal input, the data from the first tab, or the first Excel sheet, right? So we have the sheet names, okay, that's the field. And then we need to define an action. 
And this, of course, depends how you how you structure this workflow. But here, what we want to do is, as you can see here, we can append suffix, prepend, change the entire file path. But in our case, all we need to do is we need to change the file or table name, right? Because we change basically the file or table name in this case that we said, okay, for the first hotel, it would be hotel number one. For the second, it would be hotel number two, and so on. So we leave the change file or table name, that's fine. And here you could also use a SQL query, just in case you have a different kind of data source. But for now, that's fine. So that's basically the configuration here. And then we can simply run this, click on the Run button here, and you'll see that now the output here gives us exactly what we would expect. So it looks uh, still not clean, of course, but you see we start at accommodation sales here for the first, um, well, for the first hotel number one, which is this 45,327 and so on. And then we scroll down, and then we see basically here accommodation sales, and there's 116,186. And if I go back to the Excel file, you see that uh, here 45,000 and so on, but hotel number, oh, sorry, hotel number one, 45,000 and so on. But here hotel number two are these 116,871. Uh, 800, nee, 187, sorry. But you see that we basically, um, stack now all the data, so hotel number two, and then hotel number three, and so on, into one file. That is what this dynamic input tool allows us to do, here, like that. And then, of course, we need to do some cleaning here, like get rid of those empty rows, for instance, but that's pretty easy to do. So remember, we can go back to preparation, and you have various options, but the fastest way would be probably the data cleansing. So if you drag this inside, like that, and then you take a look at the configuration, you want to say, I want to remove rows, so null rows, and I want to remove null columns, tick those two, replace blank with zeros, or here replace zero numerical fields, that's also fine. Leading to spaces, I leave the default configuration. I simply tick those two options, okay? And then I can run this workflow, like that. And now you see, this is our final output here. So after the cleaning. Of course, they can do additional transformation steps, but you can see here where we started, basically, we had only one sheet, and then we simply had this output here with the null entries here, so still pretty messy. Let me make it a little bigger, so hopefully you can see it, or you follow along, then you would also see it. But still, we have a lot of null entries in here, and then we simply only run this data cleansing tool, and the output then simply looks like that. And looks that looks much better, at least to me, and I can work with this data. For instance, now I could use a transpose tool and transpose the data, so I get all my dates in one column and all the values in another column and so on. I can analyze then my hotel sales data in, again, a tool like Tableau, for instance, or Power BI or any other kind of tool. Okay, so that's it for this dynamic input. Hopefully that was helpful to you. I think that is a really great tool and it offers a lot of flexibility and options, so I would highly encourage you to try it out. Okay, so that's it for this video. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Until then, best guys. Hello, and welcome back to this video. And this time we're gonna dive into web scraping with Alteryx. So what I have is, I open this in my browser here. I have basically here an URL, which returns a JSON file. So in case you're familiar, there are certain, there are options to scrape data using APIs. An API is an application programming interface, and that basically means that we can send a request to this API, and this API returns data to us. And the data is normally structured in JSON format. And this JSON format is exactly what we get if we go to this API. This API, HTTPS, double point slash slash API dot exchange rates API dot IO slash latest is an API which is provided by the ECB, so the European Central, Central Bank. In case you want to use this for your own central banks or other kind of APIs which return JSON, you can also do this, of course. Probably all a central banks would actually provide this kind of API. You just need to find out the link. In this case, we're using this from the ECB. It's for free. And what you see basically is you can see different kinds of currencies here. So Canadian dollar, Hong Kong dollar, and so on. So all of them are available here. Um, and you can see the base currency here is the euro. So all these currencies are then compared to the euro. So that simply means that one euro in this case would be one dollar and 12 cents and or 12, 24 cents, right? Considering the United States dollar here compared to the euro. So the euro is the base currency. And we can simply scrape this data in Alteryx. So all we need is this URL. Control C to copy it, in this case, and then we go back to Alteryx. And here we can either use, if we go back to the in and output options, we can either use, of course, an input data tool, if you have this URL or the data or the homepage links, URLs you want to scrape in a file. If not, you can simply use the text input. In this case, we use the text input because we don't have it, but we can simply go inside here, then we type in here a header, so I double click on here and say, this will be my URL, for instance, and then I simply paste exactly the link here, right? This HTTPS API exchange rates dot API, or no, sorry, exchange rates API dot IO slash latest. Okay, so that is basically the URL. 
So that's it. Okay, we can run this and take a look, and we see we got only one uh, cell here, which is actually the URL itself. Okay, so then it simply means we go back to the developer tool, and now we can use the download tool. So simply drag this download tool inside, combine it here, and then you simply go in here and say, I'd like to use my URL. In this case, we only have one column. That's why you can't use any additional information here. You can simply use this only column you have, the URL, okay? In our case, at least. Then you take a look at the configuration, just in case you need to change something. Unicode UTF-8, this for us now is file, is okay, it's fine. You don't have to change it. In case you have to change it, you might try out different, uh, um, well, in this case, different encodings, but the UTF-8 is the normal or the default encoding, actually. And uh, then you could also go to headers and payload. These are additional things you might have to configure. So depending on what kind of website you scrape, of course, there might be uh, the, the option or the, the requirement that you put in headers here as well. Um, but in our case, that's not the case. We can simply st refer to the basic here. So let's go to basic here. And then what we do is we can simply go in here and we can run this. If I run this like that, so basically we get this kind of output. And hopefully you can see that. Otherwise, of course, feel free to follow along, of course. What you basically get is you get a URL itself, which is the column we already had. And then you get the downloaded data, which is in our case, JSON data, right? It's JSON data because you can see it has these curly brackets. That's always a sign that it's, that it's JSON data. And that's basically most often the data you get from an API if you request data. So, and you also can see the download headers. The download headers should give you the 200. 200 is a status code, which simply means that your request, in this case, uh, the, the request to the website was successful. If you get a 404 error, so 404, any other kind of higher number, that probably uh, means uh, that means that you actually receive an error. Yeah? So the, the web the scraping or the request was not, was not successful. Okay, but here it looks good. We got a 200 and okay, so the request was successful and we got the data back. And this data here, as you can see, the cat uh, and so on, is exactly the data which we have seen here. But here we have it in a nice clean format, and here we currently have it in Autorex here as, of course, this JSON file. But we can get this data in a clean, nice format. So how do we do that? Well, go back to the developer here, and under the developer you find the JSON parse tool, which is this one. So you can simply drag this inside, like that, and then we need to specify what is actually the JSON field. And the JSON field is the data itself, so the downloaded data here. Download data, as you can see here. This one here exactly contains the data we need. So we can use the JSON parse tool here, and then you can see output values into a single string field, output values into data type, type specific fields if you want to do that. In this case, I leave the default one. Let's take a look at that, and let's run this actually. Let's run the workflow and see that's what we get, right? So now you can see we got here the different kinds of names. So Canadian dollar, Hong Kong dollar should sound familiar to you and also here the value itself. So 1.5233, 8.6987, and so on. And these are exactly the numbers which we can see here as well, right? In this kind of structure. So now, all we need to do is, because we got the data already, we need to do some data cleaning, right? For instance, we don't need the first two columns anymore. The URL was only for sending the request, but now we got the data back, and the only two columns we need basically is this JSON name and the JSON value string. So what we could do here, the various options, of course, but here I'd like to go with the select tool, so direct select tool inside, and simply say, I don't need the URL anymore, also this download, I don't need it, what I need is a JSON name, which is basically my currency, and I also need the value itself. So let me make this a little bit bigger, like that, and then I rename this here directly, this is my currency, currency, for instance, and this, the second one, is basically the value, right, call it value, and also convert this into, from a string, into a double, right, because it's a double number, that's fine. So we have those two, and I'll leave this un unknown checked here, that's fine. And now if I run this here, let's take a look what the data looks like. And here we got field finished run with two field conversion errors, let's see. Why is that? Well, scroll down, you can see that here we got also base and date. So two additional fields here, which of course don't contain here a uh, number, so this is zero. Okay, let's take a look. The original data was like that, we have a euro in here. Okay, that is the reason, and here we had a date in here. Okay, so that's why it did not convert this into a float number. Okay, that's fine. Then do the following. Let's actually first do a filter, right? So instead of using select tool directly, let's actually remove this, get rid of it, and let's go to the filter option. So under preparation, we have the filter, right? So we can simply drag this inside, and we know that if we take a look at our data, that all our currencies contains rates. So rates.currency, right? So those two fields at the end do not. So what we could do is we can go inside and simply use a basic filter here. We select, in this case, our JSON name. 
the first one and say it should contain, so contains, and then we simply type in rates. Right? So if we do that, like that, and run this, click the run button here, okay, now we don't get any errors, and we can see that the true fields now only contain all the currencies, you can see, and the false fields, which we filtered out, contains this base euro as well as the date, which was in this case the 3rd of July in this case, right? Okay, so far so good. Okay, so I'll stick in here and keep the true values. And now we can convert those two things and rename them. So let's do it one more time. Go to select here, drag it inside to the true output here, and then we simply say we don't need the URL anymore, we don't need the download here. What we need is the name itself, which is the currency. So type in currency here, currency, and the second thing we need is here the data itself. So convert this to a double. Try that one more time. Let's see if we don't still got conversion errors. Let's call this uh, the, is basically the value. Value. Okay. So far so good. And now let's run it one more time. Run it. Let's see. And take a look. And here we don't get any errors now. And we got here the values. Now they are converted into doubles. Okay. And then finally, of course, what we could also do, because here at the currency, you can see we got rates.currency, and of course we only want to have the currencies here, not this rates. Dot. And there are, again, are various options to do that. We can use the formula tool, we already know how to do that. Or what you could also do is, for instance, you can go to the parse options and use here the, also the text to columns. So I can say in here, go in here, drag this inside and say for text to columns, I'd like to split here, actually the currency, that's fine. My delimiter is the dot, because remember, we got a rates dot and then the currency name. So use a dot here and say number of columns here are basically two. And then we click the run button here, click run. And let's see. And now we got the output here. And you can see we got the value here. We got here one, which are the rates, and the second one, which are actually our currency values here. So then I will use the select tool one more time. Go in here, go to the select option here, like that, drag it inside, and then we simply say this uh, first one, basically, let me actually take a look one more time. The first one we get rid of, the second one we need, right? Which is the currency name. So I can go inside here, uh, select the tool, and then I simply say the second one. This is actually the currency, so I can rename this as currency, currency name. I call it currency name here in this case. I get rid of the currency field at the beginning. I don't need this anymore. Uh, I don't need number one here. And I also want to put the currency at the first column, so I select it and put it up, right? Put it up at the top. And then the value would be the second one, but let's actually put this here, even though it doesn't matter because we filtered that out, we unticked it here. But now if we run this one more time, run it and see, take a look at the output, and here's our clean output. So we got the currency name here, we got all the different kinds of currencies, and the exchange rate towards the euro in my case here. Okay? And that's it actually for this download option using this download tool here from the in this case, this developer options as well as the JSON parse. So whenever you get send a GET request to an API, normally you should got, get back some um, JSON files or JSON um, data, which is this download data option here. And whenever you have JSON data, remember that contains these curly brackets, then you can use this JSON parse tool. And then of course you do some kind of additional transformations. In this case, we use the filter tool as well as the select tool and then the text to column tool. Um, but of course there are different ways to do that. You can also use a formula tool or other kind of ways to solve that, but that's what we did here. And then at the end we derived at this clean output here. And of course with this clean output we could work now. Let's say we have some sales data and of course we say we well, do sale, sell, selling around the world. And then of course now we can use this exchange table here and then convert the different kinds of currencies into our local currency, our native currency, and then um, well, calculate how much profit we have made, for instance, right? Okay, so that's it for this video. Hopefully that was helpful. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I can't wait to see you in the next video. Until then, best guys.